Eidetic memory, often called photographic memory, is the ability to precisely recall an image from memory after seeing it just once, without the use of memory aids. While eidetic memory and photographic memory are sometimes used interchangeably, they can be distinguished. Eidetic memory involves retaining an image for a few minutes after it's no longer visible, while photographic memory refers to recalling detailed text or numbers with high accuracy. Eidetic memory is primarily found in children, with a prevalence of 2 to 10% in children aged 6 to 12. However, it's rarely observed in adults. Language acquisition may influence this shift. In contrast, true photographic memory, the ability to recall information like text or numbers with precision, has never been definitively proven to exist. Skepticism surrounds the existence of eidetic memory. Scientific consensus is lacking, and some consider it a myth. Studies have raised questions about the accuracy and reconstructive nature of eidetic memory. Trained mnemonists can demonstrate extraordinary memory abilities, but these often rely on mnemonic techniques rather than true eidetic memory. Hyperthymesia, the ability to recall intricate details of personal experiences, is often confused with eidetic memory, but is distinct. It is not a sign of eidetic ability. Competitive memorizers at the World Memory Championships, the best in the world, do not claim to possess photographic memory. Notable cases of individuals with extraordinary memory are often labeled as having eidetic memory, but whether they rely on mnemonics or other memory-enhancing techniques remains inconclusive. There's a philosophical movement called transhumanism that's all about using technology to enhance human abilities and evolve beyond our current physical and mental limitations. The goal is to extend lifespans, boost intelligence, eliminate suffering, and ultimately transcend our human forms. Supporters are really optimistic about the potential, while critics see it as unnatural and worry about the risks. The ideas go way back, but the term itself was coined in the 1950s. Now there's organizations, conferences, even transhumanist political parties. The concepts show up in sci-fi novels and movies too. Some of the real-world technologies that relate are AI, robotics, genetic engineering, and even brain-computer interfaces. But there's still debate around if or when something like uploading your mind into a computer could ever really be possible. For now, it's mostly theoretical, though some experiments are already happening with implants and prosthetics. So, transhumanism is this futuristic vision of humanity enhanced through tech that's inspirational to some but raises ethical concerns for others. The jury's still out on whether it'll lead to a techno-utopia or down a dangerous path, but it's an intriguing concept either way. Genetic engineering lets scientists directly modify an organism's genes. The first genetically modified organisms in the 70s were bacteria engineered to be resistant to antibiotics. Since then, the technology has advanced rapidly. Nowadays, genetically modified crops have genes added to improve yield, nutrient value, or resistance to insects, diseases, herbicides, and environmental stresses. There's also research to genetically alter animals, microbes, and other organisms for medical, industrial, or agricultural uses. Supporters point to the benefits like more productive agriculture, new medical treatments, and reducing extinction risks. But critics argue genetic engineering could negatively impact health and the environment. Concerns include unintended side effects, irreversible release into the wild, corporate control of food supplies, and ethical issues around changing the nature of life. There's also an ongoing debate around regulation and labeling. The idea of astral projection has been around for centuries across different cultures. It's the belief that someone can have an out-of-body experience and consciously travel outside their physical body. Practitioners believe there is a subtle, astral body that can separate from the physical body and journey to spiritual realms or remote locations. Ancient Egyptian and Hindu texts reference astral projection. It's also connected to concepts like the soul, subtle energy bodies, and mystical states of consciousness in various esoteric traditions. 
Famous writers like Helen Keller and modern figures like Robert Monroe wrote about their own out-of-body travel experiences. Those who practice astral projection use meditation, visualization, and other techniques to induce an altered state and transfer their awareness to their astral body. Accounts describe visiting the astral plane, spiritual domains, even other locations in the physical world. However, there is no scientific evidence that astral projection exists as an objective phenomenon. Skeptics see it as a delusion or vivid dream. So while many believe astral travel is possible, it remains a controversial metaphysical idea that's unproven from a scientific perspective. The debate continues between those convinced of its reality and those who see it as imagination or illusion. Jungian archetypes are universal, inherited patterns of thought, ideas, or images present in the collective unconscious of all human beings. They are the basis for common themes and symbols in stories, myths, and dreams across different cultures. Some examples of archetypes include the mother, child, trickster, and flood. According to Carl Jung, archetypes influence an individual's development and identity. For instance, the presence of a maternal figure matching a child's idealized concept of a mother can activate the mother archetype in the child's mind, forming a mother complex in their personal unconscious. Jung rejected the idea that humans are born as blank slates and believed that universal experiences like love, fear, and death shape our thoughts and behaviors. He introduced the concept of archetypes as innate potentials expressed in human behavior and experiences. These archetypes are influenced by evolutionary pressures and appear in stories, art, myths, religions, and dreams. Jung's archetypes are dynamic and seek expression in an individual's personality and behavior. They lack solid content and exist in the unconscious, only gaining consciousness when encountered with empirical facts. Archetypes provide a common foundation for human experiences, with individuals building their unique experiences on top of this foundation. While archetypes are relatively few in number, they give rise to a wide range of images and behaviors. They are similar to the axial system of a crystal, determining the structure of an individual's experiences. Archetypes are not inherited as specific representations, but as forms, corresponding to instincts. A 2017 study found that archetypes are universal organizing themes or patterns detectable through synchronicities, appearing in all realms of existence and at all levels of systematic recursion. Jung's childhood dreams and his research on psychotic patients at Bergholtzli Hospital influenced his belief in universal psychic structures underlying human experience and behavior. He first coined the term archetypes in his 1919 essay, Instinct and the Unconscious. In later years, Jung expanded the concept of archetypes to include psychoid archetypes, which exist in the psyche and the world. These psychoid archetypes bridge the gap between the mind and the external world and are related to matter and energy's fundamental principles. Ken Wilber's theory, The Spectrum of Consciousness, built on Jung's archetypes, but described them differently. Wilbur proposed that real archetypes emerged from a fundamental state of reality and gave rise to various forms and structures through psychological development. Jung's analogy of the psyche to the electromagnetic spectrum helps visualize its components. The visible light spectrum represents consciousness, while the red and blue ends symbolize unconsciousness. The ultraviolet end represents the influence of archetypes on thoughts, feelings, and actions. Jung identified various archetypes in human psychology, including birth, death, marriage, and figures like the mother, father, and child. These archetypes shape human experiences and are the foundation for understanding cultural and individual behaviors. Archetypes seek actualization in an individual's life, leading to individuation, the development of a unique identity. The process of actualization is influenced by personal experiences and can result in the formation of complexes in the personal unconscious. Archetypes also play a role in the stages of life, guiding transitions from one stage to another, such as initiation, courtship, and marriage. Various fields, including ethology, attachment theory, biology, and neurology, have explored connections to Jung's archetypes, suggesting their influence on human behavior and development. 
Alternative medicine refers to practices claimed to have healing effects without a scientific basis. Things like homeopathy, acupuncture, chiropractic, energy healing, and traditional folk remedies fall under this umbrella. Proponents believe these therapies tap into supernatural energies or the body's innate wisdom to heal. But there's no solid scientific evidence they work, and their proposed methods contradict modern science. Still, alternative medicine is a profitable global industry. Advocates claim it's natural, safe, and an alternative to big pharma. But risks include avoiding proven treatments, harmful side effects, and waste of time and money on ineffective therapies. Critics see alternative medicine as unethical pseudoscience that preys on the vulnerable. But interest persists, likely due to placebo effects, natural recovery, and cognitive biases. So the debate continues between those who believe alternative medicine has untapped benefits versus those who see it as an anti-scientific distraction dangerous for public health. In the field of wanerology, there exists a peculiar phenomenon known as lucid dreaming. In a lucid dream, the dreamer becomes aware of their dreaming state while still in the dream itself. This awareness can sometimes grant a degree of control over the dream's elements, although this control is not always a defining characteristic of lucid dreaming. It has been explored and studied for centuries, piquing the curiosity of figures from ancient times to the modern era. Various theories have arisen from scientific research on lucid dreaming, even finding a place in popular culture. In recent years, psychological research has suggested potential applications of lucid dreaming in sleep therapy. The term lucid dream was coined by Dutch author and psychiatrist Frederick Van Eden in 1913, although examples of dreamers recognizing their dreams predate this. Van Eden conducted a comprehensive study of his own dreams, categorizing 352 of them as lucid. Paul Tholey laid the groundwork for studying lucid dreams by defining seven conditions that a dream must meet to be considered lucid. Later, Deirdre Barrett proposed four criteria for lucidity in dreams, though not all lucid dreams exhibit all four. Historically, lucid dreaming has roots in ancient practices like Hindu yoga nidra and Tibetan dream yoga. Early references to lucid dreaming can also be found in writings by Aristotle, Galen of Pergamon, and St. Augustine of Hippo. In the 17th century, figures like Sir Thomas Brown and Samuel Pepys described their own experiences with lucid dreams. In the 19th century, French sinologist Marie-Jean Léon, Marquis d'Hervé de Saint-Denis, anonymously published his experiences with lucid dreaming and proposed that anyone could learn to dream consciously. In the 20th century, Frederick Van Eden popularized the term lucid dream in 1913. However, there is debate about whether his usage of the term precisely matches the modern concept of lucid dreaming. Cognitive science has delved into the study of lucid dreams, with researchers like Celia Green and Stephen LaBerge contributing insights. They used physiological measurements and brainwave activity to explore the phenomenon. Some studies have investigated the use of drugs, such as galantamine, to enhance the ability to experience lucid dreams. Notably, Researchers have achieved real-time communication with lucid dreamers, opening up new avenues for scientific exploration. There are alternative theories like the idea that lucid dreaming is a state of brief wakefulness within sleep. Lucid dreaming is not uncommon, with studies suggesting that a significant portion of the population has experienced it. Meditation has also been linked to an increased likelihood of lucid dreaming. Applications of lucid dreaming have been proposed, including its potential use in treating nightmares and enhancing creativity. However, there are also risks associated with lucid dreaming, including feelings of isolation and confusion, as well as the possibility of experiencing sleep paralysis. Long-term effects of lucid dreaming are not yet well understood. In 1957, a Soviet space dog named Laika became one of the first animals in space, orbiting the Earth aboard the Sputnik 2 spacecraft. Laika was a stray dog from Moscow, and her mission aimed to gather data on the effects of spaceflight on living creatures. 
The goal of Laika's mission was to prove that a living organism could survive being launched into orbit and function under conditions of weakened gravity and increased radiation. This experiment provided valuable insights into the biological effects of spaceflight, as little was known at the time. Unfortunately, Laika's journey was not meant for her survival. She died of overheating just hours into the flight, during the craft's fourth orbit around Earth. The true cause and time of her death were not publicly disclosed until 2002. Sputnik 2, the spacecraft carrying Laika, was rushed into production to meet a deadline set by the Soviet leader, Nikita Khrushchev, who wanted a space spectacular to commemorate the anniversary of the October Revolution. The spacecraft contained various instruments and life support systems for the dog. Laika underwent training to adapt to the conditions of space, including confinement in progressively smaller cages and exposure to the noises and forces of a rocket launch. She was accompanied by two other dogs, Albina and Mushka, who played different roles in the mission. Despite the controversy surrounding Laika's mission and her sacrifice, it marked a significant step in the early days of space exploration. Her legacy lives on through various monuments and memorials dedicated to her, highlighting the ethical questions raised by the use of animals in scientific experiments and space exploration. Have you ever tried to tickle yourself and notice that it just doesn't work? There's a fascinating reason behind this oddity of human experience that offers insights into how our brains process self-awareness and agency. When we move our own bodies, our brains make precise predictions about those movements. Simultaneously, the brain sends a signal that dampens the intensity of tactile sensations in the somatosensory cortex where we process touch. This means that when we attempt to tickle ourselves, we don't experience the same level of sensation as we would if someone else were tickling us. To test this, scientists have conducted experiments, like one where participants moved a stick to stroke a piece of foam against their palm with varying delays. The greater the delay, the more ticklish the sensation became, as the brain's predictions no longer matched the actual feeling. Researchers have also explored ways to trick the brain into allowing self-tickling. For instance, magnetic brain stimulation was used to control a person's foot movements, making their hand tickle their foot against their will. This experiment succeeded, but many others have produced puzzling results. Even in dreams, self-tickling remains impossible. Lucid dreamers who can control their dreams tried to tickle themselves in dreams without success. They even attempted to get dream characters to tickle them, but that didn't work either. Understanding the neural processes behind self-tickling may have practical applications. For example, people with schizophrenia can tickle themselves, which could be linked to issues with identifying the origins of their movements. Investigating self-tickling in healthy individuals may provide insights into how it malfunctions during mental illness. Moreover, this research could potentially enhance artificial intelligence. By developing algorithms that mimic our inability to tickle ourselves, we might create ticklish robots that can distinguish between touching and being touched, offering new perspectives on machine personhood. So next time you wonder why self-tickling doesn't work, remember that it's not just an amusing quirk, but a window into the complexities of the human brain and its sense of self. The infinite monkey theorem is a mathematical concept that suggests that given enough time, a monkey randomly hitting keys on a typewriter keyboard will eventually produce any given text, even something as complex as the complete works of William Shakespeare. This idea is based on the assumption that if you have an infinite amount of time and randomness, anything that has a non-zero probability of happening will eventually happen. In this context, almost surely, means that the event is certain to happen with a probability of one. The monkey in this theorem is not an actual monkey, but a metaphor for an abstract device that generates a random sequence of letters and symbols. The theorem has variants that involve multiple typists and different target texts, ranging from entire libraries to single sentences. French mathematician Émile Borel introduced the monkey metaphor in 1913, but similar ideas can be traced back to Aristotle and Cicero. 
This concept was used in the early 20th century by Borel and Arthur Eddington to illustrate the timescales involved in statistical mechanics. The theorem can be proved directly by considering the probability of typing a specific word like banana on a 50 key typewriter. The probability of typing it in a single attempt is very low, but as the number of attempts, n increases, the probability of typing it at least once approaches 100% as n approaches infinity. However, when dealing with physically meaningful numbers of monkeys typing for physically meaningful lengths of time, the probabilities become practically impossible. Even with an astronomical number of monkeys typing for extremely long periods, the chance of reproducing a specific text like Shakespeare's works is exceedingly low. The concept also touches on the idea of normal numbers, which are numbers that contain all possible finite substrings. It's suggested that almost all real numbers are normal, meaning they contain all possible combinations of digits. This principle is related to the idea that a monkey, given infinite time, would eventually type any specific text. The infinite monkey theorem has been used in various contexts, including discussions of evolution, linguistic analysis, and testing of random number generators. While it's a thought-provoking concept, it's important to note that the practicality of it happening in reality is virtually nil due to the immense improbabilities involved. In geometry, there's a thing called a golden spiral. It's a special kind of spiral that gets wider by a certain factor every time it turns a quarter. This factor is known as the golden ratio. There are some other spirals that are kind of like the golden spiral, but not exactly the same. For instance, you can make an approximation of a golden spiral by starting with a rectangle that has a length to width ratio equal to the golden ratio. Then, you keep dividing and adding squares and connecting their corners with quarter circles. It's not a perfect golden spiral, but it's close. Another approximation is the Fibonacci spiral. It starts with a rectangle divided into two squares, and you keep adding squares to it. The more squares you add, the more it resembles the previous approximation, which is close to the golden spiral. Spirals in nature sometimes look like logarithmic spirals, and golden spirals are a type of logarithmic spiral. But it's not always a golden spiral. Spiral galaxies like the ones you see in the sky are often thought of as spirals, but their angles change as you move away from the center, unlike a true golden spiral. Nautilus shells and other mollusk shells do grow in a spiral pattern, but it's usually not exactly a golden spiral either. They just use logarithmic spirals to grow without changing shape. Now let's talk about Fibonacci numbers. It's a sequence of numbers where each number is the sum of the two before it. These numbers appear in various places in math and nature. They were first described in Indian mathematics over 2,000 years ago, but became widely known in Europe thanks to an Italian mathematician named Fibonacci. Fibonacci numbers are everywhere, from computer algorithms to biological patterns. They're closely related to the golden ratio, which shows up in Binet's formula for the Fibonacci numbers. As you go further in the sequence, the ratio between consecutive Fibonacci numbers gets closer and closer to the golden ratio, so there's a deep connection between Fibonacci numbers and this golden ratio. A famous volcanic rock in Japan, known as the Killing Stone, has split in two recently, sparking superstitions and discussions. According to legend, this stone holds the transformed spirit of a nine-tailed fox named Tamamo no Mai, who was involved in a plot to assassinate Emperor Toba in the past. The stone is located in an area known for its sulfurous hot springs. The recent splitting of the stone into two roughly equal parts has caused concern among online users. Folklore suggests that the stone emits poisonous gas, hence its name. While some believe the stone was destroyed and its spirit exercised by a Buddhist monk in the past, others prefer to think that its true home is on Mount Nasu. Visitors to the area were shocked when photos of the fractured stone appeared online. Some speculated that the demon spirit of Tamamo no Mei had been resurrected, but local media suggested that cracks had appeared in the rock years ago, potentially weakening its structure due to rainwater seepage. The Killing Stone has historical significance and has been mentioned in literature and art. Local authorities are considering its fate, 
with some hoping to restore it to its original form, perhaps with the mysterious inhabitants still sealed within. A Cicadian is someone who has chosen a different path in life, one that seeks enlightenment through a blend of spirituality, technology, science, and mysticism. This philosophy is known as technomysticism, and it's not something they created themselves, but rather something they received from an enigmatic source known as 3301. Enlightenment, as understood by Cicadians, isn't about sitting on a mountaintop in meditation. Instead, it's a state where they strive to be fully optimized and connected to the global consciousness. To achieve this, they focus on developing their minds, willpower, bodies, and intelligence, while remaining true to their own nature as part of the global brain. Those on the path to enlightenment follow a series of steps or degrees culminating in the Imago phase. These degrees are Neophyte, Magis, Instar, and finally Imago. To become an initiate, one must privately declare themselves a Cicadian and may choose to join a group known as a Brood. Cicadians have been provided with instructions from 3301, including commands like, Command your own self. Do four unreasonable things each day. Program your mind. Program reality. And principles like questioning everything, discovering truth within themselves, following their truth, and not imposing anything on others. These instructions are central to their journey towards enlightenment. Pareidolia is the phenomenon where people perceive meaningful images or patterns in random or ambiguous stimuli. This often involves seeing faces in everyday objects. It's common and has a name because it happens so frequently. Our brains are wired to recognize faces from a very young age as part of our survival instinct. Detecting faces helps us identify friends and potential threats. Scientists have debated whether this recognition process is driven by the eyes or the brain. Traditional thinking suggests it's the eyes taking in information and then the brain making sense of it. However, some researchers propose that the brain might actually generate expectations of what to see, essentially telling the eyes what to perceive. To explore this further, an experiment was conducted using brain imaging technology. Participants were shown images, some of which contained hidden faces, while being told that half of the images had faces. Interestingly, when participants reported seeing faces, their brain's face area lit up, even when there was no face in the image. This suggests that another part of the brain, specifically the inferior frontal gyrus, may be instructing the visual cortex to perceive faces based on expectations. This experiment shed light on how our brains play a crucial role in pareidolia and challenged the traditional idea of bottom-up processing, where the brain merely reacts to external stimuli. The Pareidolia Society is an online community where members share their discoveries of faces in unexpected places like clouds, rocks, or kitchen appliances. It's a testament to how widespread and intriguing this phenomenon can be. Zeno's paradoxes are philosophical puzzles created by the Greek philosopher Zeno of Eleia around 2,500 years ago. These paradoxes were developed to support the idea that all change is impossible, which aligned with the philosophy of Parmenides, who believed that all of reality is one. Zeno's paradoxes argue that motion is an illusion, despite what our senses tell us. One of the paradoxes, known as the dichotomy paradox, presents a situation where an object must complete an infinite number of tasks in a finite time, making motion seem impossible. Another famous paradox is Achilles and the tortoise. In this scenario, Achilles races a tortoise, but gives it a head start. Zeno argues that since Achilles must reach each point where the tortoise was previously, he can never overtake it suggesting that motion is an illusion. The arrow paradox claims that at any instant, an arrow in flight is neither moving to where it is, nor to where it is not, making motion impossible to pinpoint in time. Throughout history, various solutions have been proposed to address these paradoxes. Aristotle suggested that as distances become smaller, the time needed to cover them also decreases. 
Modern mathematics, especially calculus, offers solutions by dealing with infinite processes. Henry Bergson proposed that while the path may be divisible, the motion itself is not. Bertrand Russell introduced the ADAT theory of motion, which states that motion is a change in position over time. Some modern philosophers argue that Zeno's paradoxes still raise metaphysical questions, even if mathematical solutions exist. These paradoxes continue to spark discussions about the nature of time, space, and motion. Animalia paradoxa, a term derived from Latin meaning, contradictory animals, refers to mythical, magical, or dubious creatures mentioned in the early editions of Carl Linnaeus's renowned work, Systema Naturae, under the section titled Paradoxa. These creatures were drawn from medieval bestiaries and accounts of animals reported by explorers from distant lands. Linnaeus explained why these creatures were excluded from his systematic classification of nature. The inclusion of such creatures was an attempt to provide natural explanations and demystify the world of superstition, as noted by Swedish historian Gunnar Broberg. Sidonia, a region on Mars, has piqued scientific and popular interest. It was initially named after a distinctive area visible from Earth telescopes. Sidonia includes flat-topped mesa-like features, small hills, and intersecting valleys. The name comes from the ancient Greek city-state Kydonia on Crete. Notably, Sidonia houses the famous Face on Mars. Located in Mars' northern hemisphere between cratered areas to the south and smoother plains to the north, Sidonia may have once been a coastal zone, with some suggesting the northern plains were ocean beds. It falls within the Mare Acidalium quadrangle. Sidonia was closely examined by the Viking 1 and Viking 2 orbiters, capturing 18 images but only 5 were distinct due to similarities in lighting and timing. One image taken by Viking 1 in 1976 showed a mesa resembling a humanoid face at specific coordinates. Initially dismissed as a trick of light and shadow, a second image later confirmed the face on Mars. Subsequent missions, including NASA's Mars Global Surveyor and Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, and the European Space Agency's Mars Express, provided higher resolution images of Sidonia. These new images offered improved clarity, with some resolutions as fine as 14 meters per pixel, enabling the creation of a three-dimensional representation of the enigmatic face on Mars. During World War II, a secretive SS group known as the SS-E4, part of the SS Occult, Order of the Black Sun, researched alternative energy sources for the Third Reich to reduce their dependence on scarce fuel oil. They explored various energy and fuel options, including coal gasification, grain alcohol fuels, simpler coal-burning engines, advanced liquid oxygen turbines, and even electromagnetic gravitic engines. In 1939, this group developed a groundbreaking electromagnetic gravitic engine, known as the Thule Triebwerk, which harnessed free energy and affected gravity. It was designed to power a Thule-designed disc-shaped aircraft. They initially tested this craft in northwest Germany, known as Hanburg, a remote and inconspicuous location. The Thule disc was initially referred to as the Ochgerer, or the Hanburg device for security reasons, but was later shortened to Hanabu in 1939. These discs were separate from the Vril series and were constructed with the assistance of the SSE4 unit. The early Hanabu 1 prototypes were sizable, with a 25 meter diameter and a crew of eight. They achieved impressive speeds of up to 4,800 kilometers an hour at low altitudes, later reaching upwards of 17,000. These discs could endure 18 hours of flight. To withstand the extreme temperatures at such speeds, a special armor called Victalen was developed by SS metallurgists for the Hanabu and Vril craft, featuring a double hull of Victalen. Additionally, early Hanabu on models experimented with a large gun installation, the twin 60mm craft Strahl Kanon, KSK, powered by the Triebwerk. It's worth noting that this weapon was not a laser, as some have suggested, 
Neodinosaurs, also known as living dinosaurs, are cryptids that resemble dinosaurs in their alleged appearance. While sauropod dinosaurs are the most commonly reported type among neodinosaurs, others like ceratopsians, iguanodonts, and theropods have also been claimed to exist. These creatures have been reported on every continent except Antarctica, with Central Africa being particularly famous for sightings of creatures like the Mokul Mbembe, Emelantuka, and Mbielu Mbielu Mbielu. The term neodinosaurs was coined by Ivan T. Sanderson in 1969. Neodinosaurs, especially the long-necked varieties, are often said to inhabit freshwater swamps, lakes, and rivers. They are sometimes classified as aquatic cryptids within the coleman hodge system of sea serpent and lake monster classification. While many experts believe these cryptids are more likely to be undiscovered reptiles or mammals than actual dinosaurs, they are still referred to as neodinosaurs due to their superficial resemblance to dinosaurs and their frequent association with them in cryptozoological literature. Neoludism is a philosophy that opposes many modern technologies. It's inspired by the historical Ludites who resisted technology in the early 19th century. Neoludism consists of various unaffiliated groups. They resist modern tech and may advocate a return to simpler ways. This movement is concerned about technology's impact on people, communities, and the environment. One key principle of Neoludism is the precautionary principle which calls for proving a technology's safety before adopting it. Neoludism doesn't oppose all technology, but only what's considered harmful. Neoludists aim to slow or stop technological development. They envision a future where small-scale agricultural communities, like the Amish or Chipko movement, are models for a better society. They doubt technology's ability to solve problems like environmental degradation, nuclear warfare, and biological weapons often seeing technology as creating more issues. Neoludism isn't a unified movement, but includes a diverse range of individuals, from academics to environmentalists. Some Neoludites see themselves as victims of technology, while others resist environmental damage caused by it. Some Neoludites resort to vandalism or violence to achieve their goals, although this isn't representative of the entire movement. The philosophy has its origins in thinkers like Heidegger, who questioned the impact of modern technology on humanity. Jacques Ellul and Lewis Mumford also contributed to critiques of technological progress. China's experimental advanced superconducting tokamak, often called the Chinese artificial sun, has achieved a remarkable feat. It sustained a nuclear fusion reaction for more than 17 minutes, setting a new world record. During this experiment, superheated plasma reached an astonishing temperature of 126 million degrees Fahrenheit, much hotter than the sun itself. The significance of this achievement lies in the potential of nuclear fusion as a clean and nearly limitless energy source. Unlike coal and natural gas, which are finite resources, nuclear fusion mimics the process that powers the sun, merging atomic nuclei to produce vast amounts of electricity. Importantly, it produces no fossil fuel emissions, leaves behind no radioactive waste, and is safer than traditional nuclear fission. China's East Reactor, often likened to an artificial sun, was designed with the purpose of providing clean energy for Earth. It replicates the fusion process that occurs within stars, where intense pressure and high temperatures cause atomic nuclei to combine, creating new elements. Inside the East Reactor and other similar devices called tokamaks, magnetic fields are used to contain superheated plasma, which is ionized gas, at extremely high temperatures. Laser heating is employed to raise the temperature of heavy hydrogen atoms, such as deuterium and tritium, to the point where fusion reactions begin, mimicking the conditions at a star's core. This process releases energy that can be harnessed for electricity. However, maintaining the intense heat of the plasma without leakage has proven to be a significant challenge. Scientists have been pursuing nuclear fusion for over 70 years without creating an experimental reactor that generates more energy than it consumes. 
China's success with East marks a significant step towards achieving this goal. In theory, deuterium, a fusion material, can be sourced from Earth's oceans, making it a potentially sustainable energy solution. Currently, China's East reactor is being used to test technology for a larger tokamak reactor under construction in France. This collaborative effort involving 35 countries is known as the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor and will be the world's largest nuclear reactor. Expected to start operating in 2025, ITER boasts the world's most powerful magnetic field, which is 280,000 times stronger than Earth's magnetic field. This global initiative represents a substantial leap forward in the quest for sustainable fusion energy. Dr. Masaru Emoto's water experiments propose an intriguing idea that water might respond to human emotions and thoughts, affecting its molecular structure. In his experiments, Emoto exposed water to different emotional stimuli like words, music, and pictures, then froze it to examine the resulting ice crystals. Positive expressions yielded beautiful, symmetrical crystals, while negative ones led to chaotic formations. Music also played a role. Harmonious music produced elegant crystals, while heavy metal music resulted in irregular shapes. Emoto conducted a global experiment where people sent positive intentions to water samples, leading to more balanced crystals. Critics question Emoto's methodology and lack of peer-reviewed research, but his work inspires those who believe in the connection between consciousness and the physical world. Despite controversy, Emoto's research has sparked further investigation into water's properties and its potential connection to consciousness. Our perception of time is a fascinating and complex aspect of human psychology. It's a malleable concept that can be influenced by various factors, shedding light on why time seems to warp in different situations. For instance, when we're in a state of fear, time often slows down. This phenomenon is not limited to life or death situations, but extends to moments associated with intense fear. Experiments with individuals afraid of spiders or novice skydivers have shown that they tend to overestimate the duration of these fear-inducing experiences. Conversely, as we age, time appears to speed up. While mathematical theories suggest that this might be due to a proportionality effect, where a year feels shorter as a smaller fraction of our total life, it doesn't fully explain the experience. Attention, emotion, and the pace of life itself also play significant roles in how we perceive time. A peculiar aspect of time perception is the reminiscence bump. We tend to vividly remember experiences from our late teens and early 20s. This phenomenon is linked to the novelty of that period in our lives when we have numerous first-time experiences, such as first jobs or travel without parents. These memories become vivid markers in our life story. Memory and identity are closely intertwined, which is why we tend to remember events that contribute to our self-identity more vividly. This connection between memory and identity helps explain the reminiscence bump. Another intriguing concept is the holiday paradox, where a good vacation feels like it flies by but seems long when we look back. This paradox arises because we view time prospectively, as it's happening, and retrospectively, when recalling it. Vacation disrupts the balance between these perspectives due to the intense novelty of new experiences, causing time to warp. In the end, our understanding of time is complex and multifaceted. While we may never have complete control over it, our evolving understanding allows us to shape and navigate this dimension, making us uniquely human. Cymatics is a field of study related to vibrations and patterns. It involves creating visible patterns on surfaces by vibrating them. This is done using plates, diaphragms, or membranes that are made to vibrate, and then particles, paste, or liquid are applied to the surface. The patterns that emerge depend on the shape of the vibrating surface and the frequency of the vibrations. One of the earliest observations related to cymatics was made by Robert Hooke in 1680. He noticed nodal patterns on vibrating glass plates by running a bow along the edge of the plate covered with flour. 
Ernst Schladny, an 18th century German musician and physicist, further explored this phenomenon. He used fine dust on vibrating surfaces to reveal patterns called nodal lines of the vibration mode. These patterns are determined by the shape of the vibrating surface and how it's constrained. In the 20th century, Hans Jenny conducted experiments that involved vibrating a plate and placing sand or other substances on it. He claimed that the patterns formed were a manifestation of an invisible force field created by vibrational energy. However, from a scientific standpoint, the patterns were primarily influenced by the frequency spectrum of the vibrations and the shape of the vibrating plate. Cymatics has influenced various fields, including art and music. Artists like Björk used cymatics patterns in her performances, and musicians like Alvin Lussier created compositions based on cymatic principles. Visual artists have used mirrors, lasers, and oscillators to create light and visual patterns influenced by sound frequencies. In recent times, Alexander Lauterwasser used finely crafted crystal oscillators to create visual patterns in water and on steel plates. His work showcased the relationship between sound and natural patterns. While chimatics has found its way into various forms of art and expression, it's important to note that some claims in the cymatics community lack scientific support. Nevertheless, cymatics continues to be a source of inspiration and exploration in multiple creative disciplines, including music, art, and engineering. Metal-breathing bacteria like the Shiwanella on Idensis have a peculiar ability to breathe in certain metal and sulfur compounds anaerobically. Instead of using oxygen, they process these compounds to produce materials that could revolutionize electronics, electrochemical energy storage, and drug delivery devices. Researchers from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute are particularly interested in the bacterium's talent for producing molybdenum disulfide, a material akin to graphene in its electron transferring properties. This discovery opens up exciting possibilities for various fields. Shayla Sawyer, an associate professor at Rensselaer, highlights the potential of understanding and controlling this bacterial process. It's an intriguing intersection of biology, materials, science, and electrical engineering. James Rees, a postdoctoral research associate, led the research, supported by the Jefferson Project at Lake George, a collaborative effort between Rensselaer, IBM Research, and the Fund for Lake George. Their work is a significant step towards developing advanced nutrient sensors for water bodies. One unique aspect of Shiwanella onidensis is its ability to produce nanowires that can transfer electrons. These nanowires can connect with existing electronic devices, creating an interface between the living and human-made worlds, making it especially fascinating. Moreover, bacterial biofilms formed by these metal-breathing bacteria have electronic signatures that can be mapped and monitored. This makes them effective nutrient sensors, providing critical information about the health of aquatic ecosystems like Lake George. Rick Relaya, director of the Jefferson Project, believes that this groundbreaking research could lead to a new generation of living sensors. These sensors could revolutionize our ability to detect excess nutrients in water bodies, addressing water quality issues worldwide. Researchers plan to further explore how to harness the wide-ranging potential applications of these metal-breathing bacteria. They believe that biology's track record of inventing materials through trial and error far surpasses what human scientists have achieved in creating composites and novel structures. Geoengineering and geowarfare are topics that gain attention after major natural disasters. Some believe that geoweapons, which alter the environment for military purposes, were used in response to devastating earthquakes in the Middle East. Romanian General Emil Strenu is one of the few experts discussing this. Geoweapons modify the environment, while geoengineering manipulates it for climate change or military purposes. Geoengineering includes carbon removal, solar radiation modification, and environmental changes for military use. Some believe military geoengineering projects, like the HARP project, secretly contribute to climate change. HARP installations exist in multiple countries, with the US having the most potent one. 
There's speculation about using HARP for economic warfare, climate manipulation, and population control. General Strenu visited HARP's Alaskan facility, officially hosted by a university but linked to the U.S. Army and CIA. HARP can serve various purposes, from directed energy weaponry to detecting alien objects in space. Contrary to claims, HARP has been continuously active since 1993 with increasing power and capabilities. General Strenu faced threats and three assassination attempts due to his political involvement and views. Powerful groups sometimes silence those who challenge their agendas. The battle in the world today involves sovereigntist states versus those promoting neo-progressivism or globalization. There are secretive groups and movements that wield significant influence. The West's aim in Eastern Europe is to break up socialist states into smaller, controllable entities. Serbia's struggle to retain Kosovo reflects this pattern. Atmospheric beasts are unusual flying creatures that defy conventional biological rules. Witnesses describe them as levitating without wings and often appearing semi-solid or partially invisible. Some beings include atmospheric jellyfish, resembling UFOs, but potentially a type of atmospheric beast, sky serpents, elongated serpentine creatures that move through the air without wings, similar to Asian dragons, Many sightings of atmospheric beasts were initially classified as UFOs. Some researchers, like Ivan T. Sanderson, proposed that these creatures are low-density animals native to the clouds. One famous case is the Crawfordsville monster, sighted in Indiana in 1891, often classified as a dragon. Eyewitnesses who encountered atmospheric beasts described them as soft, blanket-like, and sometimes emitting a mildew smell. These encounters can be terrifying. Believers view atmospheric beasts as fragile and lightweight creatures, either native to Earth or potentially originating from interstellar gas clouds. They are considered non-sapient animals, not intelligent extraterrestrials. Atmospheric beasts can change their density, becoming metallic or cloud-like, even glowing. They may resemble whales, and are sometimes called air whales or cloud beasts, their behavior can defy natural cloud characteristics. When atmospheric beasts die, they are said to fall to Earth as gelatinous masses that quickly evaporate, possibly explaining phenomena like gelatinous meteorites or star jelly. These creatures appear in folklore worldwide, often with local names like boneless or shapeless. While the idea of atmospheric beasts faded in the 20th century, recent interest has grown due to related phenomena like air rods. Researchers now revisit older reports and UFO sightings that resemble encounters with these enigmatic creatures. In 1561, a mass sighting of celestial phenomena or unidentified flying objects occurred over Nuremberg, a free imperial city of the Holy Roman Empire. Some skeptics suggest it may have been a natural phenomenon called a sun dog, an atmospheric optical phenomenon that consists of a bright spot to one or both sides of the sun. A broadsheet news article from April 1561 describes the event. It mentions that at dawn on April 14th, many people in Nuremberg witnessed an aerial battle above the sun. This was followed by the appearance of a large black triangular object and spheres falling to earth in clouds of smoke. Witnesses reported seeing hundreds of odd-shaped objects, including crosses, spheres, crescents, and cylindrical objects. These objects moved erratically in the sky. The text of the broadsheet describes the event in detail, mentioning blood-red semicircular arcs in the sun, blood-red globes, and even fighting among the objects. It ends with a religious interpretation and a plea for repentance. In modern times, Carl Jung published the Woodcut Broadsheet in his 1958 book about UFOs, suggesting it was likely a natural phenomenon with religious and military interpretations. The military view sees the objects as cannons and cannonballs, while the religious interpretation emphasizes the crosses. Jung also proposed that it could symbolize individuation and the revelation of light. Similar celestial phenomena and sky apparitions with religious interpretations were reported in other historical events, suggesting a pattern of using such events to convey messages or warnings to people. 
Red Mercury is widely considered a hoax, likely perpetrated by con artists operating on the black market for arms. These individuals claimed that it was a crucial substance used in nuclear weapons, taking advantage of the secrecy surrounding nuclear development. References to red mercury began appearing in the late 1980s, with vague descriptions of its importance in nuclear bombs. However, its supposed properties evolved to match the interests of potential buyers. Claims about red mercury included its use in high-precision explosives, stealth technology, and self-guided warheads. Even TV documentaries were made about it, suggesting it was a key component of powerful weapons. One theory suggested red mercury was a shortcut to enrich uranium for nuclear weapons, eliminating the need for costly and time-consuming methods. Another theory proposed that red mercury facilitated the production of lithium-6, a crucial component of fusion bombs. It was thought to have an affinity for mercury, causing it to turn red. Some claimed red mercury was a powerful, explosive-like substance known as a balotechnic, capable of compressing a secondary in a fusion bomb without the need for a fission primary. Critics argued that these claims lacked scientific support and noted the absence of independent confirmation. Red mercury was also suggested as a material for stealth paint and was linked to various properties, further adding to its mystery. Some believe that red mercury might have been created by intelligence agencies or criminal groups to deceive those seeking nuclear technology on the black market. In southern Africa, rumors about red mercury led to dangerous attempts to extract it from unexploded ordnance. In Saudi Arabia, rumors about red mercury caused a surge in prices for Singer sewing machines, with people believing that these machines contained the substance. The aquatic ape hypothesis, also known as the aquatic ape theory, or the waterside hypothesis of human evolution, proposes an unusual idea. It suggests that our human ancestors followed a different evolutionary path from other apes by adapting to a more aquatic habitat. This hypothesis was initially put forward in 1960 by marine biologist Alistair Hardy, and later supported by popular science writer Elaine Morgan. Hardy's hypothesis suggests that some ancient apes had to find food along coastlines and seabeds due to competition for terrestrial resources. This forced them to develop characteristics that explain distinctive features of modern humans, such as hairlessness and bipedalism. These traits, according to the hypothesis, were advantageous for life in or near water. However, it's important to note that the aquatic ape hypothesis is generally not taken seriously by anthropologists. They argue that it lacks support from the fossil record, and that the traits it tries to explain evolved at different times in human evolution. Additionally, some of the features cited, like hairlessness and bipedalism, have alternative explanations unrelated to aquatic adaptation. Max Westenhofer, a German pathologist, also explored the idea of aquatic human ancestors in 1942, but eventually abandoned the concept. Alistair Hardy, in 1960, presented his hypothesis that some primitive apes were forced to forage for food in shallow waters and along coastlines. This idea didn't gain much traction in the scientific community. The theory suggests that characteristics like human hairlessness, subcutaneous fat, the location of the trachea, front-facing copulation, tears, eccrine sweating, and even the diving reflex could be linked to our aquatic past. However, these claims remain controversial and lack strong scientific support. Deicybernihilism is a concept that emerged in the online world, particularly in leftist and radical circles. It's not an ideology or a distinct political stance, but rather a peculiar phenomenon. The term cyber in cybernihilism represents a skepticism toward cybernetics and technology. The nihilism part indicates a rejection of traditional ideologies and the belief that nothing inherently meaningful exists. In essence, cyber nihilism is not about adhering to a set of beliefs or theories. Instead, it's a condition or attitude. It involves a rejection of traditional human-centric views of politics and the recognition that human efforts to control complex systems like capitalism and technology often fail. Nihilism can be both passive and active, 
with the former leading to feelings of hopelessness and depression, and the latter manifesting as a more aggressive, confrontational stance. Nihilism, in this context, doesn't involve embracing despair, but rather recognizing the limitations of human attempts to control the world. The cyber aspect of cyber nihilism suggests a desire to diminish human involvement in managing complex systems. It acknowledges that humans are not efficient at repetitive tasks and handling vast amounts of data. Therefore, there's a vision of creating systems, possibly AI-driven, that can function independently, without human input. However, cyber nihilism doesn't advocate a return to a primitive, pre-technological state. It recognizes that we've passed the point of no return in terms of climate change and that technology is an integral part of our world. Instead, it proposes a way to allow nihilism to become cybernetic, using protocols and memes to propagate the idea of pure negation, thereby challenging existing power structures and hegemonies. In simpler terms, cyber nihilism is like a virus that infects people's minds, making them question the established systems and encouraging them to reject traditional ideologies. It's not a structured belief system, but rather a process of spreading skepticism and negation, ultimately seeking to reduce human influence in complex systems. The Williams X-Jet, also known as the Flying Pulpit, was a unique aircraft designed for vertical takeoff and landing, VOL. It was a small, lightweight vehicle built by Williams International. The engine used for this aircraft was a modified Williams F-107 turbofan engine. This single-person aircraft was controlled by the pilot's leaning movements and adjustments to engine power. It had impressive capabilities, including the ability to move in any direction, rapid acceleration, hovering, rotating in place, and flying at speeds of up to 60 miles per hour. It could stay airborne for approximately 45 minutes. In the 1980s, the United States Army evaluated the X-Jet. However, it was ultimately determined that helicopters and small unmanned aircraft were more suitable for their needs. Consequently, the development of the X-Jet was discontinued. Williams International had also worked on other VTTOL systems, such as a jet-powered flying belt in 1969 and the WASP-UN, Williams Aerial Systems Platform, in the 1970s. These projects used different versions of the Williams WR-19 turbofan engine. A patent, U.S. Patent 4,447,024, was issued for the Williams X-Jet. Technical information and drawings can be found at the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Flexible glass, a material believed to have been lost since the time of Tiberius Caesar, is an intriguing historical oddity. According to accounts, the inventor of this glass presented a drinking bowl made of it to Tiberius Caesar. When the bowl was tested, it didn't shatter, but instead dented. Remarkably, the inventor easily repaired the dent with a small hammer he had in his toga pocket. However, fearing that this material could devalue precious metals like gold and silver, Tiberius had the inventor executed, supposedly to keep the glassmaking technique a secret. This story has been passed down through history, primarily by two sources, Pliny the Elder and Petronius. Pliny mentioned that the tale of flexible glass was widespread but not well authenticated, Petronius added a more dramatic and satirical touch to the narrative. Isidore of Seville later retold this account, which was eventually included in pseudo heraclius's 13th century collection of technical recipes. In the modern era, a different type of flexible glass is used in fiber optic cables. Unlike the historical flexible glass, it cannot be smashed with a hammer. This modern flexible glass is exceptionally pure, with few defects and a pristine surface. Companies like Corning Inc. introduced flexible glass products, such as Willow Glass, based on borosilicate glass in 2012. Shot AG also introduced a similar flexible glass product in 2016. While these contemporary materials share the name flexible glass, they serve very different purposes from the ancient legend of flexible glass presented to Tiberius Caesar. In central Bosnia and Herzegovina, there's an unusual claim that has stirred controversy for years. 
Since 2005, Samir Osmanagic, a Bosnian-American businessman, has asserted that a cluster of natural hills near Visoko are actually the largest ancient pyramids built by humans. However, this assertion has been widely debunked by scientists. Extensive studies conducted by geologists, archaeologists, and other experts have consistently shown that these hills are entirely natural formations known as flat irons, with no signs of human construction. The European Association of Archaeologists has labeled the so-called Bosnian pyramids as a cruel hoax, and numerous scholars have expressed concerns about the damage being done to genuine archaeological sites in the area. Despite the lack of scientific support, Osmanagic has continued to promote the hills as tourist attractions. These claims have even attracted pseudoscience enthusiasts who consider the site a New Age pilgrimage destination. Osmanagic has transformed one of the hills into an archaeological park, and organized activities like meditation sessions there. This influx of tourists has brought economic benefits to the city of Visoko, which endured significant hardships during the wars of the late 20th century. Osmanagic's claims have been widely discredited by the scientific community. Qualified experts have emphasized that the hills are natural formations, not ancient pyramids. These assertions have been condemned as a cruel hoax and a diversion of resources from protecting genuine archaeological heritage. Critics have accused Osmanagic of promoting pseudoscientific ideas and damaging valuable archaeological sites. Despite the controversy and lack of scientific backing, Osmanagic's claims have attracted tourists and supporters, leading to economic gains for the region. However, the scientific consensus remains clear. The Bosnian pyramids are natural hills, not man-made structures, and the claims surrounding them lack credibility. Joshua Abraham Norton, born in England in the early 19th century, eventually settled in San Francisco, California. Initially, he was a commodities trader and real estate speculator, but he faced financial ruin due to a failed rice market investment during a Chinese famine. In 1859, Norton proclaimed himself Emperor of the United States, in a whimsical act. While he had no actual political power, people in San Francisco treated him with respect, and some businesses accepted currency issued in his name. Norton's eccentricity made him a beloved figure in the city, and he received free services and had his image featured on souvenirs. Norton's life took an interesting turn when he declared himself protector of Mexico after Napoleon III invaded Mexico. Despite lacking any formal authority, he issued decrees on various matters, including one that abolished the United States Congress. His actions ranged from visionary, like suggesting the League of Nations, to humorous, like imposing fines for saying Frisco. He also created his own currency, which some restaurants accepted, and he was known for his distinctive attire, often seen inspecting the city's streets and engaging in conversations with residents. Norton even intervened in anti-Chinese rallies in San Francisco. Throughout his reign, Norton engaged in foreign diplomacy, writing letters to foreign leaders, including Queen Victoria and Kamehameha V of Hawaii, in an attempt to foster relations. In his later years, Norton lived in poverty, and he died suddenly on the streets of San Francisco in 1880. Contrary to rumors, he was not wealthy, and his possessions included only a few dollars, a gold sovereign, and various headgear. His funeral, attended by a diverse crowd, reflected the city's respect and affection for the eccentric Emperor Norton. Today, he is remembered as a unique and beloved figure in San Francisco's history, with various references to him in literature and popular culture. The IKEA effect is a psychological phenomenon where people tend to value objects more if they have put effort into making or assembling them. This effect can lead us to overestimate the worth of things we've worked on ourselves. For example, if you build your own furniture, you might believe it's worth more than a similar pre-assembled piece. This effect can make us willing to pay more for experiences that involve effort, like assembling furniture ourselves even though it might not be the most cost-effective choice. It can also give us an inflated sense of our own abilities and make us see our creations as better than they are. 
companies can take advantage of the IKEA effect by charging higher prices for products that customers assemble themselves, making us overlook the fact that we're essentially paying for our own labor. The IKEA effect is similar to the endowment effect, where people value items more if they own them or feel a sense of ownership. However, the IKEA effect specifically requires that a person builds or makes something themselves. This phenomenon occurs because we have a psychological need to feel competent and capable. When we accomplish tasks like assembling furniture, it boosts our self-efficacy, our belief in our own abilities. This sense of accomplishment fulfills a deep psychological need and makes us see the things we've made as more valuable. Effort justification, a type of cognitive dissonance, is also at play here. When we put in a lot of effort, we want to believe it was worth it, so we assign higher value to the end result to justify our hard work. Our natural optimism about ourselves and things associated with us contributes to the IKEA effect. We tend to see ourselves and our creations in a positive light, even when it's not entirely justified. The IKEA effect has implications for consumer choices, as it can lead us to make decisions that aren't truly cost-effective. It can also blind us to the flaws in our own work, hindering our improvement. To avoid falling victim to the IKEA effect, it's important to research products before buying them, considering both cost and quality. We should also weigh the value of our time spent on DIY projects against the upfront cost. Seeking a second opinion from someone impartial can help us see our work more objectively. The IKEA effect was named by Michael Norton, Daniel Mochon, and Dan Ariely in their 2012 paper, The IKEA Effect, When Labor Leads to Love. It was initially observed with instant cake mixes in the 1950s, where adding an egg made the process feel more rewarding, highlighting the importance of effort in our perceptions of value. Money, like corporations and governments, can be seen as an entity or egregore. Destroying physical currency, its equivalent of a flag, doesn't weaken it practically. Instead, it often strengthens its value. This paradox might explain money's extraordinary power globally. The context of destruction matters. Disrespecting money by destroying it can be a start, but it's not enough. Currency has value because people recognize it as such. Refusing to use it and convincing others to do the same can create significant changes. Rather than destruction, rejection is a powerful tool. Distance yourself from the currency and promote alternative forms. Spreading doubts about its stability can erode faith in it, paralleling how egregores are weakened by lost belief. Economics plays a role too. Deflating a currency is as harmful as inflation. Steady inflation encourages economic activity and prevents hoarding. Physical destruction disrupts this balance and weakens the currency egregore. Considering cryptocurrencies, which allow defining contracts within them, adds a new layer to this concept. Actions like burning flags might not always weaken the entity they represent, but can become part of the discourse reinforcing it. Both corporations and governments create their own currencies, controlling power and flow. However, there are limits due to economic principles like arbitrage and inflation. These phenomena highlight the complex interplay between belief, value, and systems in both economics and justice. Mushrooms, usually associated with the culinary world, have found a surprising role in the realm of music. This unconventional fusion involves using mushrooms to create unique and intriguing melodies. Imagine a scenario where mushrooms become musical instruments. It may sound bizarre, but it's a reality in the world of experimental music. By employing a biodata sonification module, musicians can connect gourmet mushrooms to synthesizers. These specially designed modules translate the activities and responses of mushrooms into sound, essentially turning them into living components of a musical ensemble. Through this unusual collaboration, the subtle growth patterns, environmental interactions, and even the bioelectricity of mushrooms are transformed into audible notes and rhythms. The result is an organic and otherworldly musical experience that blurs the lines between the botanical and the sonic. This innovative approach to music creation has garnered attention on various online platforms, proving that there's a curious and appreciative audience for this fascinating genre. As these mushroom-based compositions continue to evolve, 
It's an intriguing exploration of the harmonious possibilities found within the natural world. In the world of computer networking, there's an unusual concept known as IP over avian carriers, or IPOSE for short. This might sound like a joke, and that's because it is. The idea was introduced in a document called RFC 1149, created by D. Waitsman and released on April 1, 1990, as part of an April Fool's Day tradition in the tech world. The basic concept of IPOSE involves using birds, like homing pigeons, to carry internet protocol IP traffic. Waitsman even suggested improvements in later documents, such as RFC 2549 and RFC 6214. Surprisingly, someone actually attempted to implement IPOS in real life. In April 2001, a group called the Bergen Linux User Group tried it out, sending nine packets of data over a distance of about five kilometers, three miles, with each packet carried by an individual pigeon. The result? They received only four responses, with a packet loss ratio of 55% due to operator error. The response time ranged from 50 to 100 minutes, making it clear that this method suffered from extremely high latency. There are some known risks associated with this comical approach, such as carriers being attacked by birds of prey or being blown off course during storms. Some places might not have suitable local carriers, imagine flightless and nocturnal kiwis trying to help. There's also a risk of disease affecting the carriers, and their homing abilities limit the network topologies they can support. Interestingly, people have found other practical uses for pigeons in data transfer. For example, photographers in rafting expeditions have used pigeons to transport digital photos from cameras to tour operators. Over short distances, a single pigeon can carry a substantial amount of data in a relatively short time. In various experiments, pigeons carrying memory cards have outperformed other data transfer methods over short to moderate distances. These amusing tests have shown that sometimes even the most unconventional ideas can have their moments of success. Closed-eye visions, often considered hallucinations by science, have intrigued many. Communities exist where individuals openly share their experiences and interpretations of these mental journeys. In these unique spaces, people describe seeing a world within their minds when their eyes are shut. They recount encounters with people, places, and things that may be entirely unfamiliar or strangely familiar. It's a realm where the boundaries between reality and imagination blur. Interpretations of these visions vary widely. Some view them as a form of self-reflection, a means to process buried emotions and memories. Others see them as windows into the subconscious, revealing hidden aspects of the mind. What's striking is that some actively engage with these visions, using techniques like meditation or lucid dreaming to navigate their inner landscapes. They believe that within these mental realms lies untapped insight, creativity, and even spiritual growth. While science may classify these experiences as hallucinations, these communities embrace the idea that the human mind holds more mysteries to explore. To them, these inner journeys are a testament to the wonders of human cognition, a canvas where imagination blends with the enigmas of thought. In February 2013, a meteorite crashed in the Urals, sparking intriguing theories. While early speculation pointed to a Russian missile, some suggested a different scenario, a UFO intervention. Russian UFO enthusiasts noted a series of videos showing an object intercepting the meteorite, causing it to explode. While this might sound far-fetched, multiple videos captured this event from different angles, adding to the mystery. Alexander Komenev, a coordinator for the Russian UFO community, pointed out another curious detail. He mentioned an increase in UFO sightings since 2012, with a surge in reports in February just before the meteorite incident. At a press conference, Komenev presented videos depicting strange glowing objects in the sky. Some witnesses described them as glowing bowls that appeared and disappeared, sparking speculation about their connection to the meteorite. However, after the meteorite's fall, UFO activity in the region reportedly ceased. Meanwhile, divers discovered craters in Lake Shabarkal, 
where meteorite fragments were believed to have sunk. While the idea of a UFO saving the day might remain speculative, the Chelyabinsk meteorite incident added another layer of mystery to the realm of unidentified flying objects and celestial events. The universe, with all its vastness and mysteries, can be a hostile place for our digital technology. At first glance, our computational devices should operate flawlessly, following the precise rules of physics and mathematics. However, when we delve into the microscopic and even sub-microscopic realms of technology, we encounter unforeseen challenges that disrupt the reliability of our digital machines. This issue is not a recent development, but dates back to the 1970s when prominent computer manufacturers began reporting unexpected computational errors. These errors originate from tiny disturbances at the subatomic level, which can wreak havoc on digital systems. One of the key culprits in this cosmic interference is the phenomenon known as a single event upsetter. It's a soft error that doesn't physically damage the device but can flip a single zero into a one or vice versa. This seemingly minor change can trigger a chain reaction of errors throughout a computer's operations. The intriguing part is that these events leave no trace and can be manually corrected. The source of these disruptive particles lies beyond our planet. Charged particles originating from magnetic fields in space, including those generated by black holes and other celestial phenomena, travel through the cosmos. These particles can be deflected and redirected by magnetic fields, wandering the universe for billions of years before eventually encountering Earth and our technology. One notable incident occurred in Belgium in 2003 during a voting poll, an inexplicable event led to exactly 4,096 additional votes for a single candidate, a result that could not be accounted for despite repeated recounts. This incident left experts scratching their heads, unable to recreate the error. Another example occurred during a live online stream of the game Super Mario 64, where a player was abruptly warped upward for no apparent reason. Game experts and programmers were baffled, and a substantial reward was offered for anyone who could replicate the anomaly, yet no one has succeeded in doing so to this day. Even the infamous blue screen of death on Windows computers, familiar to many, may have been caused in part by cosmic ray events colliding with our equipment. To mitigate the impact of these cosmic bit value flips, supercomputers now employ neutron detectors and maintain frequent auto-saved backups. These measures help safeguard our digital technology from the unpredictable and often invisible disruptions caused by the vast universe itself. Thotography, also known as projected thermography, is the alleged ability to transfer mental images onto surfaces like photographic film using psychic means. While this phenomenon has been around for a while, it gained popularity with different names over the years. Thotography emerged in the late 19th century, inspired by spirit photography. It's important to note that it's distinct from spiritualism, which separates it from spirit photography. One of the earliest mentions of psychic photography was in a 1896 book by Arthur Brunel Chatwood. He described experiments suggesting that looking at a sensitive plate with images in mind could produce photographs. Hereward Carrington, a psychical researcher, noted that many psychic photos were likely fraudulent due to various manipulation techniques. However, he also believed that some might be genuine. The term thoughtography was introduced in the early 20th century by Tomokichi Fukurai. Skeptics, including professional photographers, often attribute psychic photographs to camera and film flaws, exposure errors, processing mistakes, lens flares, reflections, or chemical reactions. In Japan around 1910, Tomokichi Fukurai conducted experiments with subjects like Chizuko Mifune and Ikuko Nagao, claiming they could telepathically imprint images on photo plates, which he called Nensha. However, when journalists found inconsistencies, Nagao's credibility was questioned, and she faced criticism. Albert von Schrenk-Notzing investigated Eva Carrier in the early 20th century. He believed her ectoplasm materializations were the result of ideoplasty, where images formed from her mind onto ectoplasm. 
Critics, however, found evidence of deception, including magazine cutouts, pins, and string. Ted Sirios, a hotel bellhop, claimed to use psychokinetic powers to create images on Polaroid film in the 1960s. While a psychiatrist endorsed his abilities, professional photographers and skeptics suggested he used sleight of hand. Masuaki Kyoto, a Japanese psychic, was claimed to possess psychokinetic powers. However, investigations found that he could only achieve success when he had control over the film without any oversight for an extended period, casting doubt on his abilities. Yuri Geller, a famous psychic, claimed to create images with a 35mm camera in 1995. Critics suggested he used optical devices or already exposed film to perform the trick. In the realm of technology, there's a curious connection to the world of magic. Historically, scholars have tried to define magic and identify its unique characteristics. These include the use of symbols, gestures, and speech understood only by a select group, the employment of ritual tools, and the belief in harnessing the power of non-human entities to produce effects that seem beyond conventional understanding. Interestingly, computer programming shares some of these traits with its esoteric knowledge, arcane symbols, and the ability to make computers perform seemingly intelligent actions. Looking ahead, the magical aspects of technology are set to evolve. Virtual reality, VR, artificial intelligence, AI, and ubiquitous computing, UC, are converging to create digital physical ecosystems and cyber-physical societies with a touch of enchantment. VR, for example, immerses users in alternate worlds with unique rules, creating a sense of magic. AI enhances this magic by mediating control over smart systems and even generating code based on human commands. This means we can control complex systems through creativity and will, without understanding the technicalities. Moreover, as you see and the Internet of Everything expand, our surroundings could become enchanted cyber-physical systems that respond to our thoughts and desires, deepening the sense of magic in hidden causality, non-human intelligences, and emotional control. However, this new technomancy differs from traditional computer programming in three ways. Firstly, technologies like VR and smart AI aim to hide their existence as tools, making them less obvious to users. Second, they blur the line between experts and non-experts, allowing anyone to command enchanted environments. But there's still a place for experts who can manipulate these systems creatively. Lastly, large corporations are driving the development of these magical worlds, creating a new strategic sphere where organizations compete for influence and power. This raises questions about whether traditional management concepts are sufficient to understand these dynamics, or if new interdisciplinary fields like strategic magical practice or organizational technomancy are needed to manage these novel cyber-physical systems and their expert users effectively. In 1924, a little girl had an unusual encounter in Pasco County, Florida. While playing near St. Joseph School, she noticed a glowing egg-shaped object on the ground, so bright that it may have momentarily stunned her. As it dimmed, a saucer-like craft emerged from the egg, and strange beings stepped out. These beings, which the girl described as resembling animated flowers with faces, were small and robotic in nature. They carried what she believed to be a weapon aimed at the school's science building. Despite her small size, she offered to help them with their cargo, but found it too heavy to lift. The robotic entities communicated with her telepathically, expressing concern about experiments in the science building that disturbed them. They warned that they might destroy the place if the work continued, though the nature of the experiments remained unknown to the girl. In a surprising turn of events, one of the robotic beings invited the girl to come with them into their craft. Although tempted, she declined their offer. The entities promised to return in 35 years, a promise that, as far as she knew, went unfulfilled. After their conversation, the robotic flowers re-entered their craft, which then ascended into the sky, becoming silvery bright before disappearing. In the 1970s, attempts to hypnotize the girl to gather more information 
or determine if she had been abducted were unsuccessful. Intriguingly, she mentioned that the science building had been left in shambles after the encounter, leaving questions about whether the robotic entities made good on their promise or if it was merely a coincidence. The motive behind these robotic flowers' interest in the school's science building remains a mystery, as does the true nature of the experiments conducted there. This unusual encounter raises more questions than answers, leaving us to ponder the intentions of these enigmatic beings. In 2022, a significant experiment took place involving the high-frequency active auroral research program, HARP. Researchers successfully bounced a radio signal off an asteroid on December 27th, marking the first time HARP was used for such a purpose. This groundbreaking experiment tested the feasibility of probing asteroids, particularly in preparation for a larger asteroid's close approach to Earth in 2029. The experiment involved HARP transmitting radio signals to asteroid 2010 XC-15, which is estimated to be approximately 500 feet across. The University of New Mexico Long Wavelength Array and the Owens Valley Radio Observatory Long Wavelength Array received the signals. The researchers used longer wavelengths to penetrate the interior of the asteroid, aiming to gain insights into its mass distribution. Understanding an asteroid's interior, especially if it's large enough to pose a threat to Earth, is crucial for devising strategies to defend against potential impacts. HARP transmitted a repeating chirping signal to the asteroid, even though it was twice as far from Earth as the Moon. This experiment contributed to our understanding of near-Earth objects and preparedness for the 2029 encounter with asteroid Apophis. Apophis, initially considered a risk to Earth in 2068, passed within 20,000 miles of our planet in 2029. This experiment and the Apophis encounter were of interest to scientists studying near-Earth objects and planetary defense. Understanding asteroids and having advanced warning of potential impacts allows for more options to deflect or mitigate their threat. While smaller asteroids frequently burn up in Earth's atmosphere, larger impacts are rarer and can cause significant damage. This experiment, conducted in 2022 and funded by the National Science Foundation, played a crucial role in advancing our knowledge of near-Earth objects and our preparedness for potential asteroid impacts. In 1911, Kilner conducted early research on the human atmosphere, or aura, suggesting its existence and potential use in medical diagnosis and prognosis. He believed that the human energy field could indicate health and mood, similar to later research by Harold Saxton Burr. Kilner's approach, however, predates modern technology, so he tried to create devices for the naked eye to observe the auric activity, which he thought might be ultraviolet radiation. To train the eyes to perceive this electromagnetic radiation, Kilner used glass slides or Kilner screens treated with colored dyes. The treatment involved substances like deschianin, a toxic dye used in photography. Kilner claimed long-term viewing through these screens was not recommended due to eye discomfort, but believed that with regular training, one could eventually see the aura without the apparatus. Kilner and his associates reported observing auric formations including the etheric double, inner aura, and outer aura, extending several inches from patients' bodies. His book provided instructions for constructing and using similar devices. However, Kilner's method had drawbacks due to the scarcity and toxicity of the chemicals used. Later, biologist Oscar Bagnall suggested alternative dyes. In 1920, a revised edition of Kilner's book, titled The Human Aura, was published and gained popularity in theosophy circles. Critical reception of Kilner's work was mixed. The British Medical Journal, BMJ, in 1912, questioned the scientific basis of his findings and could not replicate his experiments. They concluded that Kilner's aura was not more real than a visionary image. American religious scholar J. Gordon Melton noted that Kilner's research was largely dismissed by later researchers, attributing his results to optical processes rather than emanations from subjects. Skeptic Joe Nickel categorized Kilner's work as pseudoscience, criticizing his acceptance of non-existent phenomena and clairvoyant powers. 
A Dyson sphere is a theoretical megastructure that could encircle a star and capture its energy. It's a concept that explores how advanced civilizations might meet their energy needs when they outgrow their home planet's resources. By building structures around a star, they could harvest much more energy since only a small fraction of a star's energy reaches the planets orbiting it. The idea of a Dyson sphere was first introduced in Olaf Stapledon's science fiction novel, Star Maker, in 1937. Physicist Freeman Dyson further developed the concept in 1960, suggesting that such structures would be necessary for a civilization's long-term survival as its energy demands increased. Detecting the signature of Dyson spheres around stars could be a sign of extraterrestrial life. Dyson didn't specify how to build such a structure, but he envisioned a system of objects orbiting a star to collect its energy, which he referred to as a shell or biosphere. Later, he clarified that it wouldn't be a solid structure, but rather a swarm of objects orbiting independently, known as a Dyson Swarm. The concept of Dyson spheres has sparked scientific interest because they could emit unusual infrared radiation due to the conversion of starlight, potentially indicating the presence of advanced civilizations. Scientists have searched for such signatures in space, hoping to identify type to sect to Kardashev civilizations. While Dyson spheres are theoretically possible, building one around our sun is currently beyond our technological capabilities. The number of craft required exceeds our current industrial capabilities. Some suggest self-replicating robots as a solution. Others propose building Dyson sphere habitats around different types of stars, like white dwarfs or pulsars. A matryoshka brain is a hypothetical megastructure that uses Dyson spheres to create an immense computational capacity. It was proposed by Robert J. Bradbury in 1997 and is a type of stellar engine harnessing the energy output of a star to power massive computer systems. The name matryoshka brain is inspired by Russian matryoshka dolls, which are nested dolls. The concept involves nesting Dyson spheres, similar to the nesting of Matryoshka dolls. The innermost Dyson sphere draws energy directly from the star, generating a lot of waste heat while performing high temperature computations. The surrounding Dyson spheres absorb this waste heat and use it for their computations, each emitting heat at a lower temperature than the previous one. This nesting reduces heat wastage making Matryoshka brains with more Dyson spheres more efficient, but also requiring enormous engineering and resource efforts. The term Matryoshka brain was coined as an alternative to the Jupiter brain concept, which is similar, but on a smaller planetary scale and optimized for minimal signal delay. Matryoshka brains prioritize capacity and energy extraction from the source star, while Jupiter brains focus on computational speed. Possible uses of a matryoshka brain include running perfect simulations or uploads of human minds into virtual reality spaces, manipulating the structure of the universe, simulating entire alternate universes, and exploring the implications of massive scale computing. In fiction, matryoshka brains are featured in various stories and universes, often as processing nodes for superintelligences or central threats in sci-fi narratives. The interdimensional hypothesis suggests that UFO sightings may result from experiences involving separate coexisting dimensions, as opposed to the idea that UFOs come from outer space or are purely psychological or social phenomena. This hypothesis has been proposed by various ufologists, including Mead Lane, John Keel, J. Allen Hinek, and Jacques Vallée. They argue that UFOs could be a modern interpretation of phenomena recorded throughout human history previously explained as mythological or supernatural beings. In the 19th century, spiritualists adapted the concept of other dimensions to explain sightings of flying disks in 1947. The idea of multiple planes of existence was popularized by H.P. Blavatsky and incorporated into the writings of occultists. Mead Lane, an occultist, claimed in 1947 that flying disks were etheric and could transition between different states of matter. He believed these beings were not from Earth, but had good intentions and were experimenting with Earth life. 
John Keel in the 1970s shifted away from the extraterrestrial hypothesis, suggesting that UFOs might be connected to psychic phenomena. He introduced the term ultraterrestrials to describe non-human entities capable of taking various forms. J. Allen Hynek, an astronomer, played a role in U.S. Air Force UFO studies. Jacques Vallée proposed the idea of interlocking universes and a parallel universe coexisting with our own. He argued against the extraterrestrial origin of UFOs based on various factors. David Grush, a former member of the UAP task force, suggested that UFOs might come from a higher dimensional physical space, offering an alternative explanation to the extraterrestrial hypothesis. In 1931, psychologist Winthrop Niles Kellogg and his wife embarked on an unusual experiment. They brought home a baby chimpanzee, Gua, and raised her alongside their human baby, Donald. Their goal was to study how environment influenced development. Could a chimp raised like a human actually act like one? Kellogg had long dreamed of conducting such an experiment, fascinated by wild children raised without human contact. To avoid the ethical issues of abandoning a human child in the wilderness, they chose the reverse scenario, bringing an infant animal into civilization. For nine months, they subjected both babies to identical conditions, conducting numerous scientific experiments covering aspects like blood pressure, memory, reflexes, and more. Surprisingly, Gua initially outperformed Donald in these tests. However, Gua eventually hit a cognitive wall. Despite all efforts, her chimpanzee genetics held her back. The experiment demonstrated the limitations of heredity regardless of environmental opportunities. The experiment ended abruptly in March 1932, when Gua was returned to a primate colony. The reasons remain unclear, but possibilities include exhaustion from non-stop parenting and scientific work, concerns about Gua's increasing strength and unpredictability, or even language differences emerging between Donald and Gua, possibly affecting the study's outcome. Mirage cities are optical illusions that can appear in the distance, often on the horizon, giving the illusion of towering skyscrapers or entire cityscapes floating in the sky. These mirages have puzzled and captivated people for centuries. The key to understanding mirage cities lies in a phenomenon called a superior mirage. This optical illusion occurs when there are alternating layers of warm and cold air near the Earth's surface. When light rays pass through these layers, they can bend and create a distorted image of distant objects. In the case of mirage cities, this bending of light can make objects on the ground, such as buildings, appear much higher in the sky than they actually are. This effect can be so convincing that it gives the impression of an entire city hovering in mid-air. One famous example of a mirage city is the Fata Morgana. This mirage has been responsible for sightings of ghostly cities, castles, and even ships sailing in the sky. The name Fata Morgana is derived from the Arthurian sorceress Morgan Le Fay, known for her enchantments, reflecting the bewitching nature of these optical illusions. The Fata Morgana mirage occurs when there is a stark temperature difference between the air layers above warm surfaces, like deserts or bodies of water. As light passes through these layers, it bends, creating intricate and often surreal mirages. These mirage cities have sparked various legends and myths throughout history. They have been linked to supernatural occurrences and have even influenced folklore, including stories of ghost ships like the Flying Dutchman. While mirage cities may seem like otherworldly phenomena, they are ultimately products of the natural interactions of light and the Earth's atmosphere. They serve as a captivating reminder of the complex ways in which our perception of reality can be altered by the environment. Conspiracy theorists have made an unusual claim about Antarctica. They believe it may hide the world's oldest pyramids. This theory is rooted in the idea that pyramid-like structures are scattered worldwide, and some suggest that a vaguely pyramid-shaped formation in Antarctica's Shackleton mountain range could be the oldest pyramid on Earth. The theory gained attention on the History Channel's TV series, Ancient Aliens, which explores various extraterrestrial ideas. 
Some speculate that these pyramids may have been built by ancient aliens or lost civilizations. However, not everyone is convinced. Dr. Michael Sala, an expert in exopolitics, argues that these pyramids, including the one in Antarctica, are part of a global network of power-generating pyramids designed to transmit energy wirelessly. Geologists, on the other hand, explain that these pyramid-like formations are natural geological features known as nunataks. These rocky peaks emerge above glaciers or ice sheets and can have a pyramid shape. They are not human constructions, but rather products of nature. In the end, while the idea of ancient pyramids in Antarctica may be intriguing, the scientific consensus leans toward these formations being natural geological features, not man-made structures. In the search for intelligent life beyond Earth, it's unlikely we'll find creatures like us. Even if life exists elsewhere, it might not develop in the same way it did on Earth. Humans have been around for a relatively short time, but artificial intelligence is progressing rapidly. AI could become smarter than humans, leading to the creation of artificial beings. If aliens follow a similar path, they might not be biological like us, they could be electronic or AI-based, possibly existing in places other than planets. This challenges the idea in the Drake Equation, which suggests there are many civilizations out there, most of which are artificial. We may need to think of alien civilizations as integrated intelligences rather than groups of individuals. When searching for signs of these intelligences, we might not find messages we can understand. Instead, we might detect complex technology-related stuff or evidence of advanced tech like Dyson spheres or artificial molecules in atmospheres. It could be worth looking for traces of alien nanotechnology in our solar system. Even if we did get a message from aliens, we wouldn't be able to predict their intentions, which could range from peaceful to expansionist. As time goes on, intelligent species might become incredibly powerful and complex, possibly controlling entire galaxies. Advanced intelligences might create simulations so realistic that we might be living in one, making us question the nature of our reality. Our knowledge of physics and the universe has many unknowns, leaving room for astonishing possibilities. In July 1984, Russian cosmonauts aboard the Salyut 7 space station witnessed a peculiar phenomenon. On day 155 of their mission, they were engulfed in an intense orange light that momentarily blinded them. This light seemed to penetrate the station's walls, leaving the crew puzzled. Amidst the blinding radiance, all the cosmonauts observed the presence of seven angelic figures hovering outside the space station. These beings, described as humanoid in appearance with wings and halos, remained in close proximity to the station for about 10 minutes before disappearing. On day 167, the crew was joined by three more cosmonauts from the Soyuz T-12 spacecraft. Once again, the space station was bathed in a warm orange light, and the crew peered through the portholes to witness the enigmatic angelic beings. These beings were described as the size of an airliner, according to the cosmonauts. The incident was kept classified by the Soviet Union, and the crew was advised not to disclose it publicly. While some may attribute these sightings to fatigue from prolonged space missions, it's noteworthy that multiple crew members reported seeing these smiling angels. This strange encounter occurred as the cosmonauts set a record by spending 237 days aboard the Salyut 7 before eventually leaving the space station. The Japanese tradition of carrying the omakoshi during festivals bears a striking resemblance to the biblical account of King David and the Ark of the Covenant. In the Bible, King David joyously brought the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem, and this event shares common features with the Japanese omakoshi ceremonies. Both the Ark and the omakoshi are carried on the shoulders of individuals using poles. In the case of the Ark, this aligns with the biblical description of how it was carried by the Levites. The use of poles is also similar in the Japanese tradition. The Ark of the Covenant had gold cherubim on its top, while the omikoshi features a gold bird called Ho-Oh, both of which represent celestial beings. Additionally, both the Ark and the omikoshi 
are adorned with gold and their sizes are comparable, suggesting a possible connection. During the Ark's procession, King David and the people of Israel sang and danced to the accompaniment of musical instruments, a practice mirrored in Japanese festivals where people sing and dance around the omakoshi. Furthermore, the ritual of carrying the omakoshi across a river during the Gionjinja festival in Kyoto may have origins in the biblical account of the Israelites crossing the Jordan River with the Ark of the Covenant after their exodus from Egypt. In some Japanese communities, the individuals chosen to carry the omikoshi undergo a period of purification and sanctification, including bathing in seawater, which bears similarities to the biblical custom of sanctifying oneself before bringing the Ark of the Lord God of Israel. Lastly, the distribution of food, such as bread, meat, and raisin cakes, after the Ark's entry into Jerusalem aligns with the Japanese tradition of distributing sweets to participants after festivals, providing another intriguing parallel between these two distinct cultural practices. There's also a village in Japan known as Shingo Aomori, where it's believed that Jesus may have visited during his lost years. Some even believe that he may have survived the crucifixion and spent the rest of his life there. Some special black holes, called Kerr-Newman black holes, have a unique feature. They allow for the possibility that things, including living creatures, could exist inside them without being pulled into the center or escaping somewhere else. These black holes are different from the enormous ones found in the centers of galaxies. Inside these special black holes, different types of paths or routes are available for objects. If the black hole is charged but not spinning very fast, charged objects can go around in circles inside it. Even if something doesn't have an electric charge, like most everyday objects, it can follow curved paths inside spinning charged black holes. Even light, which has no weight, can follow these curved paths inside these black holes. In simpler terms, these paths are like circular tracks or highways that keep going in loops. However, living inside a black hole, even if it's possible, would come with strange and challenging situations. Time might not work the way we're used to, and there could be strange effects happening closer to the center of the black hole. But the fact that these paths exist inside black holes is a really interesting part of black hole science. China's Sky Eye Telescope, known as the 500 meter Aperture Spherical Radio Telescope, FAST, may have detected signals possibly originating from an extraterrestrial civilization. Astronomers from Beijing Normal University reported discovering several instances of unusual narrowband radio signals using FAST. These signals were picked up during deep space scans conducted by FAST in 2020 and 2022. The scientists haven't ruled out the possibility that these signals could be the result of human radio interference. They are cautious about confirming these findings until further analysis is complete. The signals are intriguing because they differ from typical electromagnetic signals and could potentially be linked to alien technology. However, the researchers are taking a thorough approach to confirm or rule out any interference. In the past, radio interference has complicated the search for extraterrestrial life. Chinese astronomers plan to conduct additional observations to conclusively determine the nature of these signals and hope to contribute to the search for extraterrestrial civilizations. The quest for extraterrestrial life remains a significant scientific challenge as the vastness of the universe and its age raise questions about the apparent absence of intelligent life beyond Earth, known as the Fermi Paradox. Researchers have discovered something intriguing about our minds. When we see our real body while also perceiving it in a humanoid robot, it creates a strange illusion. This illusion makes it seem like we exist in two bodies at once. In previous studies, scientists found that when our senses receive coordinated information, our minds can feel like they're outside our physical body. It's almost like having an out-of-body experience. To explore this further, researchers came up with a unique experiment. They used a humanoid robot to duplicate a person's body. First, they let individuals control the robot's movements and see through its eyes. The results were surprising. When people experienced their own bodies through the robot, something strange happened. 
They felt like they were in two bodies simultaneously. It's similar to a phenomenon called hotoscopy, where you see yourself from a different perspective. In simpler terms, our minds can make us feel like we're in two places at once when we see ourselves in a robot. It's a fascinating quirk of human perception. During the Apollo 8 mission, photographs were taken, but they could only be seen upon returning to Earth and developing them. In these images, an unusual sight was captured, something resembling a squid with long tentacles floating in space, hence the nickname Space Squid. This led to questions about the possibility of creatures surviving in space without oxygen. Some scientists have speculated that prebiotic materials near nebulae or gas clouds might have evolved into life forms known as zeroids over time, adapting to extreme space conditions. However, there's a different perspective. Some believe the space squid may not be a living organism at all, but rather an advanced alien spacecraft designed for space travel and energy use. The tentacles might function as a unique propulsion system, releasing energy behind the vehicle. Regarding alien travel methods, possibilities include rockets powered by nuclear fusion or electron beams. Some speculate that Apollo 8 might have captured traces of electron propulsion left behind by an advanced alien civilization. Hypercomputation is a concept in the world of computation that goes beyond the capabilities of Turing machines, the traditional models of computation. While Turing machines are limited in what they can compute, hypercomputers can perform computations that Turing machines cannot. The Church-Turing thesis tells us that any function a mathematician can compute using simple algorithms and a pen and paper can also be computed by a Turing machine. Hypercomputers challenge this thesis by computing functions that are beyond the reach of Turing machines. One way to understand hypercomputation is to think about it as the ability to solve problems that are considered unsolvable by traditional computational methods. These problems can be quite complex and are often related to mathematical concepts like the halting problem and piano arithmetic. Hypercomputing can take various forms, from theoretical models like Turing's oracle machines to more practical but still speculative systems. Some of these systems involve real-world computers with extraordinary capabilities or unique physical properties. For instance, certain fuzzy logic-based machines can accidentally solve problems that are traditionally deemed unsolvable. In some cases, hypercomputation requires the ability to perform an infinite number of computational steps in finite time, a concept known as a supertask. This is different from traditional computation, which always requires finite resources. Interestingly, some proposals for hypercomputation involve utilizing closed timelike curves, CTCs, which are related to time travel. However, even with CTCs, hypercomputation would still face challenges related to storage and physical feasibility. Quantum mechanics also comes into play in the discussion of hypercomputation. Some believe that a quantum mechanical system using an infinite superposition of states could compute functions that are otherwise non-computable. However, this remains a topic of speculation and debate. Finally, there are systems that are eventually correct, but can take an incredibly long time to arrive at the correct answer. These systems may frequently output incorrect results before eventually converging to the right solution. It's important to note that hypercomputation is a controversial topic, with some experts considering it more of a theoretical concept than a practical reality. Nevertheless, it raises fascinating questions about the limits and possibilities of computation beyond the scope of traditional computing. Hyperobjects are a concept used to describe things that are so vast in time and space that they go beyond the usual boundaries of our understanding. Examples include global warming, styrofoam, and radioactive plutonium. There are five key characteristics of hyperobjects. 1. Viscous. Hyperobjects stick to and affect everything they come into contact with, making it hard to resist their influence. 2. Molten. They are so massive that they challenge our perception of fixed and consistent space and time. 3. Non-local. 
Hyperobjects are distributed across time and space to such an extent that we can't fully grasp their totality in any one place. For example, global warming impacts weather conditions like tornadoes, but we experience these effects locally without fully understanding the global phenomenon. 4. Phased Hyperobjects exist in a higher dimensional space, making them appear differently to observers with a multidimensional perspective. 5. Interobjective Hyperobjects emerge from interactions between multiple objects, leaving behind imprints or footprints on other entities. For instance, global warming results from interactions between the sun, fossil fuels, and carbon dioxide, but we perceive it through indicators like temperature changes and emissions. Hyperobjects become particularly relevant in times of ecological crisis, raising awareness of the environmental challenges we face. They have the potential to endure beyond shifts in cultural values and may even hold a spiritual significance due to their impact on our world. Critics argue that the concept of hyperobjects is vague and all-encompassing, making it difficult to define clearly. Nevertheless, it has found resonance in various fields, including art, literature, and philosophy, as a way to grapple with the complexities of our interconnected world. In Antarctica, something puzzling is happening in the world of particle physics. Ultra-high energy particles have been detected three times since 2016, shooting up through the ice, and they don't behave like any known particles. These particles are believed to be ultra-high energy neutrinos, which are usually incredibly faint and pass through Earth without interacting with matter. But these mystery particles are different. They have a higher chance of colliding with other particles as they pass through. What's intriguing is that the odds of ultra-high energy neutrinos passing through Earth without being stopped are extremely low. It's like winning the lottery multiple times and that's what makes these detections so surprising. Scientists have a good understanding of the cosmic neutrino flux, which includes high energy neutrinos originating from cosmic rays interacting with the cosmic microwave background, the afterglow of the Big Bang. Both the Antarctic Impulsive Transient Antenna, ANITA, and the Ice Cube experiment have measured this flux and found that it doesn't produce enough high energy neutrinos to explain the observations. One possible explanation was cosmic accelerators in space, sometimes called neutrino guns, which could be firing intense neutrino bullets toward Earth. However, recent research from the Ice Cube team has cast doubt on this explanation. They looked for events matching the ANITA detections in their data, but found none, severely limiting the possibilities involving cosmic accelerators. The mystery particles defy the standard model of particle physics, and researchers are now considering various possibilities, including a fourth species of neutrino outside the standard model, or different types of dark matter. However, there's still no clear answer, and scientists are waiting for the next generation of neutrino detectors to shed more light on this peculiar phenomenon. Imagine a girl holding a special gun that can shoot tachyon bullets. Tachyons are hypothetical particles that can travel faster than the speed of light. She's standing some distance away from a guy facing him. Now, she shoots a tachyon bullet towards the guy. This tachyon bullet is unique because as it travels, it emits flashes of light along its path. These flashes of light are what we can see as observers. To make things easier, let's say it emits a total of 10 flashes of light as it moves. From the girl's perspective, she sees these flashes of light happening very quickly, almost instantly, one after the other. It's so fast that she sees flash hash 1, hash 2, hash 3, and so on in rapid succession. In her view, it's like the bullet is causing these flashes of light in a split second and the guy is instantly killed. Now let's switch to the guy's point of view. Since the tachyon bullet travels faster than light, something peculiar happens. The light emitted by the bullet when it first leaves the gun takes much longer to reach the guy compared to the light emitted when it enters his chest. So, from the guy's perspective, he sees things in reverse. He first sees the last flash of light emitted by the bullet, and then he sees the previous ones in reverse order. It's like he sees flash hash 10 first, then hash 9, hash 8, and so on, until he finally sees flash hash 1. Here's where it gets really strange. 
From the guy's point of view, he sees himself getting hit and killed by the bullet even before he sees the bullet leaving the girl's gun. This paradox challenges our understanding of cause and effect, and the flow of time because in this scenario, the guy is dead before he sees the bullet fired. It's a mind-boggling concept that arises from the hypothetical nature of tachyons, particles that supposedly move faster than light and create these unusual effects. In the Buchegi Mountains of Romania, a mysterious discovery was made in 2003. This discovery is shrouded in secrecy and raises many questions. In a remote and almost uninhabited area of the Buchegi Mountains, two climbers stumbled upon strange signs carved into stone. These signs appeared ancient and eroded by time. When one of the climbers picked up a strange yellow object resembling a chain, it vanished before their eyes. This event led to a series of events involving local authorities, the military, and even political figures. The rock containing the signs was eventually examined by experts and scientists, but the meaning of these enigmatic symbols remained elusive. It was clear that this discovery was of great significance and had the potential to rewrite history. Further investigations revealed the existence of a massive tunnel inside the mountain, detected by Pentagon spy satellites. This tunnel had a precise geometric structure, and its purpose was unclear. It was protected by energy barriers that proved fatal to those who ventured too close. The discovery in Romania was linked to a similar structure found in Iraq, and the activation of one energy barrier seemed to affect the other. This raised questions about a global network of underground structures. Inside the mountain, a vast chamber contained numerous stone tables, covered in inscriptions resembling ancient cuneiform. These tables emitted fluorescent light and depicted holographic images related to various scientific fields. One table displayed information about genetic combinations, showing potential compatibility between different species. Another holographic projection revealed the true history of humanity, challenging established theories like Darwin's evolution. A control panel was discovered with levers and buttons. Among them was a red button that, when pressed, showed a holographic projection of Earth's water, receding to reveal a hidden landmass. This suggested a level of control over natural elements. In the chamber, there was also an amphora containing monatomic gold powder, believed to have properties that could enhance human longevity and energy. The central area of the chamber featured three tunnels leading to different parts of the world, including Egypt, Tibet, and a central tunnel leading deep within the Earth's crust. This discovery has far-reaching implications, challenging our understanding of history, science, and the origins of humanity. While many questions remain unanswered, it's clear that this enigmatic find in the Bucheji Mountains holds the key to a hidden chapter in our world's history. In Sisyphus is Happy, Albert Camus introduces the concept of absurdity, which arises from humanity's desire to find meaning in a universe that remains indifferent. He argues that this realization of life's absurdity should not lead to suicide, but rather to a state of revolt. Camus uses the ancient Greek myth of Sisyphus, a figure condemned to endlessly roll a boulder uphill, only to watch it roll back down, as a metaphor for the repetitive and seemingly meaningless tasks in human existence. Camus believes that various philosophers, including Kierkegaard, Shestov, and Husserl, fall into philosophical suicide by seeking solace in faith or abstract truth, which contradicts the fundamental absurdity of life. Instead, Camus suggests that one should live with the contradiction between human reason and the unreasonable world, embracing the freedom that arises from the absence of eternal hope. This freedom allows individuals to extract value from the present moment. He argues that ethical rules do not apply to the absurd man, and examples like Don Juan, the actor, and the conqueror illustrate how one can embrace an absurd life. Absurd art, according to Camus, refrains from judgment and hope, describing the world's experiences. He criticizes Dostoevsky's works for ultimately finding hope, which, in his view, deviates from true absurdity. Camus concludes by exploring the myth of Sisyphus further, highlighting how Sisyphus's acceptance of his eternal, pointless task symbolizes finding happiness in the struggle, 
even in the face of life's inherent meaninglessness. In summary, Sisyphus is Happy presents Albert Camus's philosophy of absurdity through the lens of the Sisyphus myth, emphasizing the importance of rebellion and the pursuit of happiness in the face of life's apparent lack of meaning. The Vapor Canopy Hypothesis, a theory suggesting that Earth's water existed as vapor in the atmosphere before Noah's flood, raises some scientific challenges. According to this hypothesis, the water vapor would have to condense into rain, flooding the Earth. However, there are significant issues with this idea. The Earth's atmosphere is held in place by gravity, creating a hydrostatic pressure that decreases with altitude. At sea level, the air pressure is about 14.5 pounds per square inch, equal to the weight of the air in a 1 inch square column extending to the top of the atmosphere. On top of Mount Everest, the pressure is lower due to the shorter column of air above it. If a vapor canopy existed, it would be a substantial part of the pre-flood atmosphere and would need to condense into 9 kilometers of liquid water. The pressure at the Earth's surface would be equivalent to 900 atmospheres, similar to the pressure 9 kilometers deep in the ocean, with the atmosphere being mostly water vapor. For this vapor canopy to remain as vapor and not condense, the temperature would have to be elevated to the point where the partial pressure of water equals 900 atmospheres, which is the boiling point at that pressure. This would mean that Noah and his family would be living in an environment akin to a 13,000 psi boiler, which raises questions about its credibility. Additionally, the hypothesis would have implications for carbon-14 dating. While the Jehovah's Witnesses claim that such a canopy would affect C14 dating is correct, it would also have many other observable effects on solar and thermal radiation and climate. However, no such effects are evident in the paleoclimatic record. Various dating methods including dendrochronology, thermoluminescence dating, fission track dating, amino acid dating, and uranium thorium dating confirm C14 dates for humans during the last ice age within 20%. If the vapor canopy had existed until 4,000 years ago, as suggested, these dating methods would not yield consistent results. Yet the observed evidence does not support this scenario. The Blue Planet Project is a collection of alleged classified documents that surfaced on the internet. These documents are said to contain information about extraterrestrial life, UFOs, and secret government projects related to them. What makes it peculiar is the mystery surrounding its origins and authenticity. While some believe it's a genuine leak, others consider it an elaborate hoax. Regardless, it has captured the curiosity of conspiracy theorists and UFO enthusiasts, making it a notable oddity on the internet. Perhaps what is most notable about this project is the Pulsar Project, which contains personal notes and a scientific diary. It is believed to be the work of a scientist hired by the government for a mission involving crash sites, interrogating alien life forms, and analyzing data related to these activities. The scientist who compiled these notes was almost terminated by the government, but managed to go into hiding abroad. His involvement in these investigations spanned over 33 years, beginning in the late 1950s and ending in 1990. The document discusses various aspects of alien encounters and research, including alien pharmacology for humans. In the ever-evolving landscape of modern medicine, technology has ushered in a profound transformation in how we perceive the human body. Two intriguing concepts have emerged from this shift, the cyborg and the cyberbody. These notions, both rooted in the post-body era, represent unique facets of our evolving relationship with technology. The cyborg, in its original form, is intimately tied to the biological world, encapsulating the intricate web of cells, neurons, and vital processes that constitute our organic existence. It's a bridge between the biological and the technological, blurring the lines that once defined us as purely human. In contrast, the cyberbody takes a leap into the realm of the wireless and the inorganic. Composed of pure informational bits, it is a departure from the biological, signaling a profound departure from our traditional understanding of the human form. 
Both concepts, however, share the idea that our sense of self has become mediated by technology. This shift is only set to intensify with the emergence of ambient intelligence technology, a vision where intelligent interfaces permeate everyday objects, creating an environment that responds to our presence in a seamless, invisible manner. It's a world where technology becomes an integral part of our daily lives, blurring the boundaries between the physical and the digital. In this envisioned future, the digital me takes center stage, a virtual representation of the individual, seamlessly integrating all diagnostic and clinical data across time. It's a concept that promises a new era in healthcare, where early procedures and diagnoses are conducted remotely, heralding a revolution in medical practice. However, amid these promising developments, there are concerns. The risk of dehumanization looms large as we become increasingly intertwined with technology, potentially reducing the human experience to a collection of vital statistics. Moreover, the ease of self-diagnosis facilitated by wearable biometric devices presents its own set of challenges. The Mayday Mystery is a puzzle tied to May 1st, also known as Mayday. It centers around a series of complex pages printed in the Arizona Daily Wildcat, the student-run newspaper at the University of Arizona. These pages contain cryptic clues, keywords, and dates, along with references to historical figures and events. They also include mathematical symbols and encodings, reflecting the author's fascination with informational systems. The author appears to have financial resources, as running full-page ads in the newspaper for over a decade is not cheap. This suggests they may be older, or an established professional. The puzzle is connected to the Tucson area and the University of Arizona campus, though this isn't immediately evident from the clues. There are references to a safe deposit box in downtown Tucson, hinting at a potential reward or endpoint to the puzzle. The Mayday mystery is meticulously organized and systematic, ruling out the idea of it being the work of an irrational individual. The webmaster promises to share all information they gather and will try to do so promptly within their schedule. They also plan to handle any potential reward in a way that doesn't upset others. Ultimately, the Mayday mystery remains an enigma, with the author's intentions and the puzzle's endpoint still unknown. Aristotle introduced the idea of the unmoved mover, a fundamental concept in his philosophy. Think of it like the first domino in a line of dominoes. When you push the first domino, it sets off a chain reaction of falling dominoes. In this analogy, the unmoved mover is like that very first domino. The unmoved mover is the ultimate cause or source of all motion in the universe. Unlike everything else, it doesn't need a prior cause to set it in motion. It's unchanging, eternal, and focused on self-contemplation, much like a domino that never falls by itself but starts the entire chain of motion. Aristotle used the unmoved mover to explain the order and harmony in the world. He believed that to maintain this order, there must be an immortal and unchanging being responsible for it all, just as the first domino initiates the motion of the others. In Aristotle's cosmology, he envisioned individual unmoved movers for each celestial sphere guiding their circular motions, much like how each falling domino influences the next in line. These unmoved movers aren't like traditional causes, but serve as final causes, inspiring motion rather than directly propelling it. They exist beyond the celestial spheres, are immaterial, and engage in intellectual contemplation, with the highest activity being contemplation itself. Aristotle's cosmological argument aimed to support the idea of an eternal cosmos, where an unmoved eternal substance drives all natural motions, much like the first domino's push initiates the entire chain reaction. Aristotle's ideas influenced later philosophers, theologians, and scholars in various cultures, but not everyone embraced his concepts, leading to different theological developments notably within Protestantism. Transurfing of reality is an intriguing concept that offers a unique perspective on how we perceive and interact with the world around us. At its core, transurfing is a model for understanding and influencing the reality we experience. 
In essence, it's a model that allows you to see and influence the world. It's based on several key principles. The space of variations. The world is like a vast tree with infinite branches representing different possible variations. Your thoughts emit mental energy that aligns you with specific branches, materializing the corresponding reality. Pendulums. People who think alike create thought structures called pendulums. These can be religious, political, or even materialistic in nature. Pendulums feed on the mental energy of their followers. To break free, acknowledge their existence, stay calm, and don't engage. The Wave of Luck. Positive thinking and nurturing small successes create a cascade of luck. Negative thinking does the opposite. Excessive potentials. Giving too much importance to something distorts your perception of reality. Reducing importance helps regain balance. Induced transition. Negative emotions and reactions can pull you into negative life scenarios. Avoid negative information and stay indifferent. Russell of Morning Stars. Listen to your intuition and inner discomfort when making decisions. The current of variations. Don't beg, demand, or fight for your desires. Instead, express your intention and act harmoniously with the flow of life. Intent. Focus on the goal and act with determination. Inner and external intentions should align. Slides. Negative self-images, or slides, can affect your reality. Create positive slides and visualize them regularly. Visualization. Focus on the process of moving toward your goal, not just the goal itself. The soul frail. Embrace your individuality and follow your own path rather than conforming to societal standards. Goals and doors. Pursue what truly brings you joy and happiness, not someone else's goals or societal expectations. Transurfing offers a unique perspective on shaping your reality, emphasizing the importance of aligning your thoughts, intentions, and actions with your true desires while avoiding the traps of pendulums and excessive potentials. Holonomic brain theory is a way of thinking about how our brains work. It suggests that our consciousness, or the way we think and feel, is influenced by very tiny things happening inside our brain cells. These tiny things are related to a special type of math called holonomy. Imagine your brain as a big puzzle. Traditional science looks at the pieces of the puzzle, neurons and chemicals, to understand how the brain works. But holonomic brain theory looks at the whole puzzle differently. In this theory, our brain is like a special kind of picture called a hologram. In a hologram, if you cut a small piece out, that small piece still contains the whole picture. Similarly, in our brain, even small parts of it can hold all our memories and thoughts. This theory also suggests that our brain doesn't store memories in one specific place. Instead, it spreads memories all over like a spider's web. This makes our brain very good at remembering things and connecting ideas, even when parts of it are damaged or removed. To understand this better, think of how sunlight shines through a window. Even if the window is small, it can still show everything outside. In the same way, our brain stores information in a way that even small parts can hold all the important stuff. This theory also talks about how our brain uses special patterns and waves to remember things. These patterns are like ripples in a pond when you throw a pebble in. They help our brain remember and recognize things, even when they look a bit different. So, Holonomic brain theory is like a new way of thinking about how our brain works, where memories are spread out and connected in a special way, like pieces of a puzzle or ripples in a pond. It helps explain how our brain can do amazing things, even when parts of it are missing or damaged. Russian scientific research has uncovered fascinating connections between our DNA and various phenomena like clairvoyance, intuition, healing, and more. They've shown that DNA can be influenced by words and frequencies without the need for genetic editing. This is because DNA contains both our physical blueprint and a means of communication. Typically, only 10% of DNA is considered important for building proteins while the rest is labeled as junk DNA. Russian researchers, however, believe this so-called junk DNA plays a significant role in our communication and follows language-like rules. Scientists have also explored how DNA responds to vibrations. 
they found that DNA behaves like a solitonic holographic computer influenced by laser radiation and language modulation. This means words and sentences can affect DNA without the need for genetic editing. This research explains why techniques like affirmations, hypnosis, and meditation can have strong effects on our bodies. These methods tap into our DNA's ability to respond to language and vibrations. Moreover, DNA can transmit information patterns even to other DNA, leading to cellular reprogramming. This transformation occurs without the usual gene editing processes. Russian scientists have also discovered that DNA can create magnetized wormholes that transmit information beyond space and time. Hypercommunication through DNA is most effective in relaxed states and can explain phenomena like telepathy and remote sensing. In the past, humans may have had stronger group consciousness, but individuality led to a loss of hypercommunication abilities. Today, some individuals, particularly children, exhibit signs of regaining these capabilities, which could transform humanity's understanding and abilities. Furthermore, DNA appears to be an organic superconductor, capable of storing information at room temperature. It also influences the formation of vacuum domains, self-radiant balls of ionized gas with significant energy. These vacuum domains can be guided by thought and may be responsible for various phenomena, including UFO sightings. In ancient and medieval times, ether, also known as the fifth element or quintessence, was believed to fill the universe beyond the earth. It was thought to explain natural phenomena like the propagation of light and gravity. While once considered a medium for light in space, it was later challenged by the Michelson-Morley experiment, suggesting it doesn't exist. Ether's mythological origins trace back to Greek mythology, where it represented pure air or the essence of the gods. It was personified as Ether, the son of Erebus and Nyx. The concept evolved over time, and Aristotle introduced it as the fifth element distinct from the terrestrial elements, attributing circular motion to celestial spheres made of Ether. Medieval scholars believed ether had varying densities, with celestial bodies denser than the rest of the universe. Robert Flood even described it as subtler than light. Quintessence, a Latin term for the fifth element, gained popularity in medieval alchemy. It was thought to have healing properties, with alchemists using it in elixirs and medicines. In the 18th century, ether theories were developed to explain electromagnetic and gravitational forces. Newton used ether to match observations with his physics, although later developments rendered these theories obsolete. Some contemporary physicists still explore ether-like concepts to address gaps in current models, such as dark energy. Luminiferous ether was a theory explaining light's motion, involving ether-filled space with tiny whirlpools transmitting light vibrations. This idea influenced the wave theory of light, but was later replaced by more accurate models. Ether was also considered in early gravitational theories. Jacob Bernoulli associated ether with the hardness of bodies, and Isaac Newton proposed ether as the medium through which gravity acted. Newton's ether model described its circulation and density gradients, explaining the force of gravity in a non-mechanical way. Despite later changes to his theory, Newton's ether model laid the foundation for our modern understanding of gravity. In 1968, Victor Schumann introduced the concept of a culture of health. This idea revolves around the belief that culture, comprising spiritual, mental, and physical aspects, directly influences human health. In turn, health, encompassing spiritual, mental, and physical well-being, is essential for achieving a higher level of culture. The culture of health aims to implement innovative health programs that promote a holistic approach to well-being, encompassing physical, mental, and spiritual dimensions. Victor Schumann was elected as the president founder of the World Organization of Culture of Health in 1994, overseeing the international social movement to health via culture. This organization operates in alignment with registered charters and focuses on innovative health programs that support holistic well-being, both within and outside the workplace. Schumann also became the first editor-in-chief of the journal To Health via Culture in 1995, published by the World Organization of Culture of Health.
This journal received an International Standard Serial Number ISSN, and has its publishing house. The core idea of a culture of health is to implement innovative health programs that advocate for holistic well-being inside and outside work environments. According to Professor N. Griebuck, the culture of health should be viewed as an integral part of spiritual, moral, labor, recreation, personality, and relationship cultures. It's not merely the connection of culture and health, but their synthesis, creating a new quality. This approach involves developing the spiritual, mental, and physical capacities of individuals. The culture of health emphasizes three main aspects, physical health, achieved through hygiene, physical activity, and nutrition, psychical health, involving mental hygiene and emotional well-being, and spiritual health, dependent on realizing one's potential and embracing cultural and spiritual wealth. In the United States, cultural competency in medical practice and health policy is gaining importance in a diverse society. Several states, including California, New Jersey, New Mexico, Washington, and Ohio, have enacted laws mandating cultural competency training for medical professionals. This recognizes the need for healthcare providers to understand and respect diverse cultural backgrounds. Additionally, the use of multimedia, television, the internet, and wireless technology is helping disseminate health information to a wider audience, contributing to the spread of the culture of health. Synesthesia is a phenomenon where stimulation in one sensory or cognitive pathway triggers involuntary experiences in another. For instance, some people may see colors when listening to music or associate specific colors with letters and numbers. These individuals are known as synesthetes, and their experiences vary based on their unique life experiences and the specific type of synesthesia they have. One common form of synesthesia is grapheme color synesthesia, where letters or numbers are perceived as having inherent colors. Another type is spatial sequence synesthesia, where numbers, months, or days elicit precise spatial locations or three-dimensional maps. Synesthesia can manifest in various combinations and senses, making it diverse and fascinating. The development of synesthesia is not fully understood, but it's thought to occur during childhood when children first encounter abstract concepts. The most common types of synesthesia, like grapheme color, tend to be related to concepts children encounter early in their education. The earliest recorded case of synesthesia dates back to John Locke in 1690, but there is debate over whether he described a true instance of synesthesia. The first medical account came from German physician Georg Tobias Ludwig Sachs in 1812. There are two main forms of synesthesia, projective and associative. Projective synesthetes see colors, forms, or shapes when stimulated, while associative synesthetes feel a strong connection between the stimulus and the sense it triggers. Synesthesia can occur across various senses, such as hearing colors or feeling sensations in response to sounds. There are many types of synesthesia, including grapheme color, chromesthesia, sound color, spatial sequence, number form, auditory tactile, ordinal linguistic personification, misophonia, mirror touch, lexical gustatory, kinesthetic, and more, with over 80 different types identified. While the exact neural mechanisms of synesthesia are not fully understood, it's believed to involve increased crosstalk between specialized brain regions. Some synesthetes may even experience synesthesia temporarily under specific conditions like deep concentration or during psychedelic experiences. Genetics may play a role in synesthesia as it tends to run in families, but the exact genetic basis is still unclear. Synesthesia does not typically interfere with daily functioning and is often considered a unique and sometimes advantageous way of perceiving the world. Prevalence estimates of synesthesia vary, but it's believed to affect a small percentage of the population. The most common forms are those involving color perception, with grapheme color synesthesia being the most prevalent among synesthetes. Women are more likely to have synesthesia than men. The history of synesthesia research dates back to ancient Greece, with philosophers pondering the relationship between color and music. Early medical descriptions emerged in the 19th century, and research waned in the mid-20th century, but experienced a resurgence in the late 20th century.
Today, synesthesia is a subject of scientific study and has led to the formation of synesthesia organizations and communities worldwide. Hilbert's paradox of the Grand Hotel is a fascinating thought experiment revealing the peculiar nature of infinite sets. Imagine a hotel with an infinite number of rooms, each initially occupied. Surprisingly, even if infinitely more guests arrive, there's always room for everyone. To accommodate more guests, we can shift every current guest to the next room. When a new guest arrives, the first room becomes vacant. This process works for any finite number of newcomers. Even an infinite number of new guests can be accommodated. By doubling each guest's room number, all the odd-numbered rooms become available for new arrivals. Intriguingly, you can extend this concept to accommodate countably infinite coachloads of passengers. Various methods like prime powers or interleaving ensure that every guest has a unique room. Now picture an extraordinary scenario. An infinite number of ferries, each carrying infinite coaches with infinite passengers. This involves multiple levels of infinity. The previous methods can be expanded by introducing new primes or increasing exponentiation to assign rooms. Anticipating limitless layers of infinite guests, the hotel can employ binary representation. This ensures every room can be filled, even with ever-growing arrivals. However, when dealing with an infinite number of nested infinities, the same problem-solving doesn't always apply. This paradox showcases the intriguing world of infinite collections, where intuition can lead us astray. It's a reminder of the curious and paradoxical nature of infinity in mathematics. The Mozart effect is a theory suggesting that listening to Mozart's music may temporarily improve performance on specific mental tasks, particularly those related to spatial reasoning. It gained popularity with the idea that listening to Mozart makes you smarter, or benefits early childhood mental development. The original 1993 study found a short-lived boost in spatial reasoning after listening to Mozart's music. However, this got exaggerated in the media, leading to the misconception that Mozart enhances general intelligence, especially in children. This led to the commercialization of Mozart CDs for kids. Meta-analyses of subsequent studies have shown little evidence of Mozart's music having a significant impact on spatial reasoning or general IQ. The original study's author emphasized that listening to Mozart doesn't affect overall intelligence. Francis Rauscher, Gordon Shaw, and Catherine Key conducted the original study, which only showed a temporary improvement in spatial reasoning, not a boost in general IQ. The popularization of the Mozart effect led to widespread misconceptions. Even though the study focused on spatial intelligence, it was often interpreted as a general increase in IQ. The Mozart effect theory was presented in books like The Mozart Effect, Tapping the Power of Music to Heal the Body, Strengthen the Mind, and Unlock the Creative Spirit by Don Campbell. These theories remain controversial in scientific circles. The political impact of the theory was evident when the governor of Georgia proposed budgeting for classical music tapes or CDs for children, claiming that it enhances spatial temporal reasoning. Subsequent research has yielded mixed results, with some studies suggesting short-term effects related to mood enhancement and arousal rather than intelligence. The idea of a Mozart effect has been challenged. Claims of Mozart's music boosting intelligence are not supported by strong scientific evidence. A German report suggested that music lessons might have long-term effects on IQ, but not passive listening. The original researchers disclaimed the idea that Mozart makes you smarter. They stated that the effect is limited to spatial temporal tasks and doesn't influence general intelligence. While music has been evaluated for potential health benefits, such as decreasing epileptiform activity, scientific robustness of the Mozart effect remains disputed. Other studies explored various uses of music, including its links to seizure onset and its effects on animal learning. The original concept of the Mozart effect continues to influence public perception. Alfred A. Tomatis used the term Mozart effect in his research on ear retraining and brain development through music, but not necessarily on intelligence enhancement.
Nemesis, a hypothetical star or brown dwarf, was suggested in 1984 to explain a pattern of mass extinctions occurring roughly every 26 million years in Earth's geological record. It was theorized to be located far beyond the Oort cloud, about 1.5 light years from the Sun. Recent studies have cast doubt on the existence of Nemesis. Some propose that other factors like the close passage of stars or gravitational effects from the galactic plane could be responsible for orbital disruptions in the outer solar system. The periodicity of mass extinctions identified in 1984 initially hinted at a non-terrestrial cause. However, subsequent research questioned this, and the Nemesis hypothesis lost support. Several astronomers independently suggested the Nemesis hypothesis to explain the extinction periodicity. It posited that the Sun might have an unseen companion star in a highly elliptical orbit, disturbing comets in the Oort cloud, leading to increased impacts on Earth. If Nemesis exists, it could be a red dwarf or brown dwarf, but its exact nature remains uncertain. Modern telescopes have not detected it. Alternative theories have emerged. Sedna, a distant object with an unusual orbit, initially sparked the search for Nemesis. However, the existence of a massive unseen object is now less likely, and other explanations, like passing stars, are considered. Searches for Nemesis in the infrared spectrum, which is where cooler stars shine brightly, have not been successful. Advanced surveys like WISE were expected to find it but didn't. While some data supported the periodicity of mass extinctions, it did not align with the expected irregular orbit of Nemesis. As a result, the Nemesis hypothesis has lost favor among scientists, and other explanations for mass extinctions are being explored. The ship of Theseus is a thought experiment that questions whether an object, which has had all its original parts replaced, remains the same object. Legend has it that Theseus, the ancient Greek founder king of Athens, sailed on a ship to Delos annually. Over centuries, as parts of the ship decayed, Athenians replaced them, sparking a philosophical debate. Was it still the same ship? In contemporary philosophy, this puzzle explores the concept of identity over time and has led to various proposed solutions. One popular idea suggests that the ship's material and the ship itself are distinct entities coexisting in the same space. Another theory, proposed by David Lewis, suggests dividing all objects into distinct time slices, avoiding the issue of coexisting ships by considering them as distinct across all points in time. From a cognitive science perspective, the ship of Theseus conundrum arises from the assumption that what we perceive in our minds reflects reality. This assumption can be questioned, as human intuition can be misleading. Some cognitive scientists view the ship as an organizational structure with perceptual continuity rather than a fixed object. Similar puzzles exist worldwide, like the tale of knives with replaced blades and handles, France's Genot's knife, Spain's family knife proverb, and Hungary's Lajos Kosuth's pocket knife. Japan's Eyes Grand Shrine is rebuilt every 20 years using new wood, but maintains continuity from the sacred forest source. Ancient texts like the Da Jidu Lun present similar philosophical puzzles such as a traveler who undergoes body part replacement by demons, leading to identity confusion. Even the USS Constitution, an American battleship, is considered a modern ship of Theseus with few or no original elements due to extensive repairs and reconstructions. In essence, the ship of Theseus challenges our understanding of identity and continuity, offering various perspectives on an intriguing philosophical puzzle. The trolley problem is a thought experiment in ethics and psychology. It involves scenarios where a runaway trolley is headed towards several people, and you have to decide whether to intervene and divert it to save more people at the cost of sacrificing one person. These dilemmas are sensitive to details that may seem unimportant. The central question is why people make different judgments in different versions of the story. One basic scenario is called bystander at the switch. You can either do nothing, letting the trolley kill five people, or pull a lever to divert it, killing one person. The ethical choice is debated. The trolley problem's origins date back to 1905 and have been discussed in various forms over the years. 
It gained prominence in philosophy through works by Philip Afoot and Judith Jarvis Thompson. It's been used in empirical research on moral psychology since 2001. Studies show that people's responses vary based on emotional engagement and reasoning. Surveys indicate that around 90% of respondents would sacrifice one person to save five, but this changes when the one sacrificed is a relative or romantic partner. Critics argue that the trolley problem is too extreme and disconnected from real-life moral situations. They question its usefulness and its impact on human empathy. The dilemma also has implications for the ethics of autonomous vehicles. Should software prioritize the safety of the car's occupants or potential victims outside? It's a complex issue that involves legal and ethical considerations. In 2016, the German government appointed a commission to study the ethical implications of autonomous driving and adopted rules to govern the ethical choices of autonomous vehicles. Phaeton, a hypothetical planet, was once suggested to exist between Mars and Jupiter. This idea came from the Titius Bode Law, which proposed a pattern in planetary spacing. Ceres, later classified as a dwarf planet, was found in 1801 and initially believed to be this missing planet. However, more asteroids like Pallas, Juno, and Vesta were discovered, leading to a theory that a planet had broken apart. In 1927, Franz Xaver Kugler proposed that the myth of Phaethon was inspired by a real event. He argued that a bright celestial object around 1500 BC fell to Earth as a meteorite shower, causing catastrophic fires and floods. The disruption theory suggests that Phaeton could have been destroyed in various ways, like getting too close to Jupiter, colliding with another celestial body, or being shattered from within. Soviet astronomer Ivan Brintan putilin proposed in 1953 that centrifugal forces caused Phaeton to distort and lose parts, which later formed the asteroid belt. However, this theory was not widely accepted. Another idea in 1955 by Konstantin N. Savchenko suggested that Cirrus, Pallas, Juno, and Vesta were once moons of Phaeton. One of these moons escaped and eventually collided with Phaeton, breaking it apart. Over the years, many scientists supported the disrupted planet hypothesis, believing that Phaeton could have been a gas giant similar to Saturn. Today, the prevailing belief is the accretion model, where asteroids in the main belt are remnants of the protoplanetary disk that never formed a planet due to Jupiter's gravitational disturbances. Some unconventional theories like Zecharia Sitchin's and Tom Van Flandern's suggest alternative scenarios for Phaeton's existence and destruction. In fiction, several works feature a planet, often named Phaeton or Maldek, once located between Mars and Jupiter, which eventually became the asteroid belt. Empathy, a concept rooted in human understanding, encompasses various dimensions. Its English term comes from the ancient Greek word empatheia, meaning physical affection or passion. This word comprises en, in at, and pathos, passion or suffering. The concept of empathy has evolved over time and includes multiple definitions. Empathy encompasses a wide range of phenomena, including caring for others, experiencing emotions matching another's, discerning their thoughts and emotions, and blurring the line between self and others. The characterization of empathy depends on how emotions are defined. It can involve recognizing bodily feelings in others or understanding their beliefs and desires. Empathy isn't an all-or-nothing trait. Individuals can vary in their empathic abilities. It often involves accurately recognizing another person's intentional actions, emotions, and characteristics. This capacity to recognize the bodily feelings of others relates to our innate ability to associate observed movements and expressions with our own proprioceptive feelings. Compassion, sympathy, pity, and emotional contagion are related to empathy. Compassion motivates helping others, while sympathy reflects care and understanding for those in need. Pity is akin to feeling sorry for someone and emotional contagion involves imitatively catching others' emotions. Empathy comprises effective empathy, emotional, and cognitive empathy, understanding another's perspective. 
Effective empathy involves responding with appropriate emotions to someone's mental states and can be further divided into empathic concern, personal distress, and effective mentalizing. Cognitive empathy focuses on understanding another's perspective and includes perspective-taking, fantasy, tactical empathy, and emotion regulation. Empathy is a complex construct, with distinctions like behavioral empathy and social empathy. Fritz Breithaupt highlights the importance of empathy suppression mechanisms in healthy empathy. Empathy is not exclusive to humans. It's observed in animals like primates and rodents. Empathy's evolutionary and ontogenetic development suggests that children start showing signs of empathy around two years of age, evolving as they grow. Autism is linked to difficulties with empathy and theory of mind. Empathy can vary among individuals, influenced by factors like extroversion and agreeableness. Sex differences in empathy exist, with females generally scoring higher than males. However, some studies suggest that these differences are influenced by motivations and social environments. Environmental factors, including parenting style and prior social experiences, can influence empathy development in children. Brain trauma, particularly on the right side of the brain or the frontal lobe, can impair empathy. Evidence suggests that empathy is a skill that can be improved through training. Empathic anger and distress are two related emotions. Empathic anger is a reaction to someone else's suffering, affecting desires to help or punish. Empathic distress involves feeling another person's pain, which can lead to emotions like empathic anger, feelings of injustice, or guilt. Stoic philosophers argued that conditioning one's emotional state on others' emotions or fortunes is unwise. Ideasthesia is when thinking about ideas makes you feel something like a sense experience. It's not exactly like synesthesia, where your senses get mixed up. Instead, in ideasthesia, only the feeling you get is like a sense, and it happens because of the meaning of the idea. For example, in a type of ideasthesia called grapheme color synesthesia, letters or numbers have colors not because they look a certain way, but because of what they mean. So. If you see the symbol 5, it might be red or blue, depending on whether you think of it as a letter or a number. Ideasthesia isn't just about synesthesia. It happens in everyday life, too. For instance, just thinking about a swimming style can make you feel a certain color, even if you're not actually swimming. There's also something called one-shot synesthesia, which is when you have a unique experience during deep thinking. This is also a type of ideasthesia. In regular thinking, there's a cool thing called the booba kiki phenomenon. Most people think the word kiki goes with a spiky, star-shaped image, and booba goes with a round, soft image. This happens because our brain connects words with meanings, and those meanings make us feel things in our senses. Ideasthesia is useful for kids to understand abstract ideas and has something to do with art and how we appreciate it. It also helps us see that art is different for everyone because it's connected to our unique experiences and knowledge. In our brain, ideasthesia fits with the idea that concepts are essential for how our brain works. Studies show that when we experience colors through ideasthesia, it's a bit slower than seeing colors directly, which supports the idea that it's connected to meanings in our brain. In mathematics, a fractal is a unique kind of geometric shape that appears intricate and complex at all levels of magnification. Unlike regular shapes, where scaling up by a factor doubles the area, like a square, or triples the volume, like a cube, fractals scale differently. When you double the size of a fractal in any dimension, the space it occupies scales by a power that isn't necessarily a whole number. This scaling property is described by the fractal dimension. Fractals often exhibit self-similarity, which means they have patterns that repeat themselves at different scales. This self-similarity can be exact, the same pattern at all scales, or approximate, similar, but not identical patterns. Fractal geometry is a part of mathematics that deals with these unique shapes and patterns. Fractals have interesting characteristics like being nowhere differentiable, meaning they have irregular and jagged structures. This property makes it challenging to measure their length or area using traditional methods, as they would require infinite precision. 
The concept of fractals has a rich history from early ideas about recursive patterns in the 17th century to modern computer-generated visualizations. Benoit Mandelbrot coined the term fractal in 1975 and introduced it to describe objects with a hausdorff besikovich dimension greater than their topological dimension. Over time, the definition of fractals has evolved, but they are generally characterized by self-similarity, fine structure at all scales, and irregularity that defies simple geometric descriptions. Fractals find applications in various fields, including art, computer graphics, physics, biology, and more. They help us model and understand complex natural phenomena with fractal features such as coastlines, clouds, blood vessels, and even the structure of neurons. Psychonautics is a term that refers to the exploration of altered or non-ordinary states of consciousness. This exploration often involves methods like meditation and the use of hallucinogenic substances. The goal is to gain a deeper understanding of the human psyche and the unconscious mind. The word psychonaut is used to describe a person who engages in this kind of exploration. It's derived from Greek words that mean soul or mind and sailor or navigator. Psychonauts use various methods for their explorations including meditation, yoga, lucid dreaming, sensory deprivation, and controlled use of hallucinogenic substances like mushrooms or LSD. It's important to note that psychonautics is distinct from recreational drug use. While mind-altering substances are sometimes used, the focus is on self-exploration, personal growth, and often has a spiritual or research purpose. Recreational drug use, on the other hand, is primarily for pleasure or socializing. Methods used in psychonautics can include psychoactive substance use, meditation, yoga, dream exploration, aeronautics, rituals, trances, sensory deprivation, fasting, sleep deprivation, and even oxygen deprivation through techniques like holotropic breathwork. Holotropic breathwork HB is a practice that involves controlled and rapid breathing to influence mental, emotional, and physical states. Developed in the 1970s by psychiatrists Stanislav and Christina Groff, it aims to achieve altered states of consciousness without drugs. The primary premise of HB is that healing comes from within the person practicing it. During a session, participants breathe rapidly and evenly to induce an altered state often described as a more intense form of meditation. HB is practiced in a group setting, with one person actively practicing while another sits as a support. The facilitator guides the session, instructing breathers to breathe faster and deeper while keeping their eyes closed. Repetitive music is played to aid in entering an altered state. The session is open-ended, allowing participants to derive their own meaning and self-discovery. Afterward, participants discuss their experiences, which can range from re-experiencing trauma to spiritual awareness. The benefits of HB include relaxation, stress relief, personal growth, and self-awareness. However, research supporting its therapeutic benefits for psychiatric conditions is limited. Potential risks include distress in vulnerable individuals and medical risks associated with hyperventilation. It's recommended to undertake HB alongside traditional therapy rather than as a replacement. Machine elves, also known as fractal elves or self-transforming elf machines, are entities often reported by individuals using tryptamine-based psychedelic drugs, particularly DMT. These encounters have been documented in various cultures, including Native American and African tribal traditions, as well as among Western users of these substances. During a DMT trip, individuals may enter a unique realm where they encounter these entities. Described by Terence McKenna, these machine elves are likened to jeweled self-dribbling basketballs that welcome and engage with the person. They create intricate, impossible objects through their voices, urging the individual to pay attention to their actions. These entities seem insistent that the person should join in and create as they do. It's worth noting that this phenomenon may be related to altered states of consciousness that lead the brain to imagine living entities. For instance, sleep paralysis often gives rise to a sense of a living presence. 
However, McKenna and Dr. Rick Strassman believe that the reality of the experience is distinct from ordinary hallucinations and might involve the physics of many worlds or interdimensional elements. Another perspective by James Kent suggests that DMT disrupts the brain's processing of visual information, leading to chaotic interpretations that may include humanoid figures like machine elves. This interpretation arises from the brain's tendency to anthropomorphize abstract stimuli. Sacred geometry attributes special meanings to certain geometric shapes and proportions. It's linked to the belief in a divine creator who uses geometry in the design of the universe. This concept has ancient origins and can be found in various cultures. Geometry has been associated with religious structures like churches and temples. Some believe that it holds spiritual significance and influences the harmony between humans and nature. In Buddhism, mandalas, composed of geometric shapes, play a crucial role. They are believed to house deities and provide positive energy to those who observe them. Mandalas can be created with sand and then ritually destroyed to symbolize impermanence. In Chinese folk religion, feng shui principles use specific geometric shapes, like rectangles and squares, in architectural design to optimize the flow of life energy, qi, for harmony. Islamic art and architecture feature intricate geometric patterns based on combinations of squares and circles. These patterns are seen in various art forms and religious contexts. Hinduism incorporates sacred geometry in temple construction. The temple's design follows the principle of self-similarity, resembling fractal patterns found in nature. In Christianity, medieval cathedrals were constructed using geometries to symbolize divine understanding. The circle represented nature's perfection, while microcosmic analogies related to the universe were explored. Quantum mechanics is like a set of rules for how the tiniest things in our world, like atoms and particles, behave. It's different from the regular rules we know from everyday life. In quantum mechanics, these tiny things can act like both waves and tiny particles at the same time. They also don't have exact properties like we're used to. Instead of saying, this is exactly where it is, we have to talk about the chance of finding it in different places. Imagine you have a tiny particle, like a speck of dust. In quantum mechanics, we can't say exactly where it is or how fast it's moving at the same time. There's always a bit of uncertainty. Sometimes these tiny particles can do strange things. They can act like they're in two places at once or pass through barriers that they shouldn't be able to. It's a bit like magic. There's also something called entanglement. When particles are entangled, they become connected in a mysterious way. Even if you separate them, they still act as if they're linked. Quantum mechanics involves some complicated math, but it's like a special language to understand these tiny things better. One important rule is the uncertainty principle. It says that we can't know both exactly where a particle is and how fast it's going at the same time. There's always a trade-off. In quantum mechanics, when you have two tiny things together, they can become entangled and it's hard to describe them individually. They become like a team where you can't talk about one without the other. There are different ways to describe quantum mechanics like using math or thinking about paths particles can take. Lastly, quantum mechanics has a connection to symmetry, which means when things stay the same even if you change something about them. In quantum mechanics, if something doesn't change over time, like an object's speed or position, it's called conserved. Technogaeanism is a belief in using advanced technologies to help the environment. This idea is different from the view that technology harms the environment. Technogaeanists think technology can become cleaner and more helpful. They mention things like hydrogen fuel cells, nanotechnology, and biotechnology as ways to improve the environment. For example, nanotechnology could turn landfill waste into useful stuff, and biotechnology might create microbes that clean up hazardous waste. In the past, people often use the environment without thinking about the consequences. Technogainists believe we've reached a point where we must use technology to protect the environment to avoid harming it further. They also think science and technology can help us deal with risks like asteroid impacts. 
Some philosophers and movements support techno gayanism as a way to heal the earth. Technology can be used to monitor and study the environment. For instance, NASA uses space-based tools to research climate change, air pollution, and more. Geoengineering is another techno gayan method. It includes removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and managing solar radiation to combat climate change. Earthquake engineering helps protect against earthquakes, while closed ecological systems allow us to study and test living conditions without harming Earth. Genetic engineering is a part of technogayanism too. It involves modifying humans or crops to be more environmentally friendly. For instance, genetically modified crops can reduce the need for pesticides. Overall, technogayanism focuses on using technology to create a better balance between humans and nature. Pataphysics is a kind of science, but it's not your typical science, it's more like a playful parody of science. French writer Alfred Jerry came up with this quirky idea. He called it the science of imaginary solutions. It's all about exploring things that exist beyond what we usually think of as reality. Jerry had a lot of fun with pataphysics in his book, Exploits and Opinions of Dr. Faustrol Pataphysician. He liked to mess with how we usually understand the world. Some say, pataphysics is about making imaginary things feel real, whether in science, poetry, or even love. Jerry had some fancy definitions like calling it the science of imaginary solutions, or saying it's about giving the qualities of virtual objects to real ones. People have tried to define pataphysics in lots of ways. One way to think of it is as a branch of philosophy or science that explores imaginary stuff beyond what we usually talk about in metaphysics. It's all about the weird and unusual. Some folks have come up with over a hundred definitions for pataphysics. The word pataphysics is a bit of wordplay. It's like a mix of metaphysics, which is a branch of philosophy, and that which is above metaphysics. Jerry even added an apostrophe to make it tricky. When you see pataphysics, it's like a hint that there's some wordplay going on. This funny idea of pataphysics has been around for a while. Jerry first mentioned it in a play back in 1893. Some say it was inspired by pranks he played in school. Jerry liked to think of guys named Ibocrates and Sophrotatos as the fathers of pataphysics. In a nutshell, pataphysics is a whimsical and creative way of looking at the world, where imagination runs wild and normal rules don't apply. It's like the funhouse mirror of science and philosophy, where things get wonderfully weird. Synchronicity is a concept introduced by psychologist Carl G. Jung. It refers to meaningful coincidences between events in one's mind and the outside world that lack a clear causal connection. Jung believed this phenomenon was a healthy function of the human mind but could become problematic in psychosis. Jung and physicist Wolfgang Pauli collaborated on the idea of synchronicity, suggesting it as a non-causal principle connecting meaningful coincidences. Mainstream science generally doesn't accept such a principle. Therapists and analytical psychologists find synchronicity experiences useful for therapy, but there are challenges in understanding and accepting them. Experiencing too many meaningful coincidences can be associated with the early stages of schizophrenia. Jung used synchronicity to argue for the existence of the paranormal, but this idea is controversial and not widely accepted in mainstream science. Some studies have explored synchronicity experiences and their impact on therapy. However, empirical evidence supporting synchronicity remains limited. Synchronicity is seen by some as an alternative to traditional causality, but is often criticized as untestable and pseudoscientific. Jung's theory of synchronicity draws from various influences including Chinese philosophy, quantum physics, and the concept of numinosity. Thaumaturgy, a term rooted in Greek, means performing miracles or wonderworking. It's often associated with magicians or saints who are believed to have supernatural powers. In Buddhism, adept meditators possess powers called Siddhi or Abhijna, attributed to figures like Buddha and legendary monks. 
Christianity has saints known as thaumaturgies or wonder workers, such as Gregory Thaumaturgus and Saint Nicholas, who were believed to work miracles. In Hinduism, charismatic gurus known as godmen claim to have paranormal abilities like healing, foreseeing the future, or reading minds. In Islam, miracles in the Quran are seen as supernatural interventions in human life, particularly in connection with Prophet Muhammad and Revelation. Hermetic Kabbalah involves magicians making subtle changes in higher realms to produce physical results, a concept rooted in mystical tradition. Thaumaturgy entered English in the 16th century, referring to miraculous or magical powers often associated with mechanical devices. Philosopher Jacques Derrida likened philosophy to thaumaturgy, exploring the origins of responsibility, faith, and gift. In popular culture, thaumaturgy is used in novels, games, and role-playing systems as a synonym for magic or a specific subschool of magic. It's associated with various magical abilities and disciplines across different fictional worlds. Ephilism is a philosophical concept rooted in absolute antinatalism, where bringing new life into the world is considered morally wrong due to the suffering it entails. It goes beyond antinatalism by encompassing all sentient beings, aiming to end the cycle of suffering for all life forms. The term Ephilism is a play on the word life, spelled backward, symbolizing the belief that non-existence is preferable to a life filled with pain and suffering. Ephilists are motivated by the desire to minimize suffering for all beings and follow the principles of negative utilitarianism and philanthropy. It's essential to note that Ephilism and antinatalism are altruistic philosophies and do not advocate harm to those already in existence. The core tenets of Ephilism revolve around the asymmetry argument, highlighting that it's better for a being to never exist than to experience pain and the absence of pleasure. This argument challenges the human optimism bias, where people tend to view life more positively than it really is. Ephilists argue that, given the prevalence of negative experiences in life, it's ethically wrong to bring new individuals into existence. Unlike antinatalism, Ephilism rejects speciesism, considering all sentient creatures equal. Ephilists often adopt a vegan lifestyle to avoid contributing to the suffering of animals raised for slaughter. Critics find Ephilism's ideas uncomfortable and associate them with depression. Some religious groups oppose it, believing that not having children goes against God's will. Others mistakenly link Ephilism to misanthropy or eugenics, although these beliefs are fundamentally philanthropic and not about valuing certain genetic traits or hating humanity. Merkaba mysticism, also known as chariot mysticism, was a school of early Jewish mysticism that existed from around 100 BCE to 1000 CE. It focused on visionary experiences, particularly those described in the Book of Ezekiel and Hecalot literature, which involved journeys to heavenly palaces and encounters with the throne of God. The term Merkaba is derived from Hebrew, meaning chariot. While the word chariot is used in the Hebrew Bible to refer to earthly chariots, in the context of Merkaba mysticism, it symbolizes the divine chariot that is central to Ezekiel's vision. This divine chariot is not explicitly mentioned in Ezekiel 1, but is associated with the vision described there. Ezekiel's vision includes a chariot-like structure driven by the likeness of a man. This chariot consists of four living creatures with four faces each, those of a man, a lion, an ox, later changed to a cherub, and an eagle. These creatures have four wings each and are surrounded by wheels called ophanim, the movement of this celestial chariot is powered by various orders of angels, including the Hayat, Ophanim, and Seraphim, with each level of angels controlling a different aspect of its motion. In the hierarchy of angels, the Hayat are the closest to God, followed by the Ophanim and then the Seraphim. The chariot is in constant motion and the energy behind its movement is governed by this angelic hierarchy, with the likeness of a man on the throne overseeing it all. Merkaba mysticism developed over several periods, including mystical elements in prophetic Judaism, apocalyptic literature mysticism, 
early Rabbinic Merkaba mysticism, and esoteric Merkaba Hekelot literature. It involved the study and meditation on these visionary experiences, and some texts, such as the Masse Merkaba, were composed during this mystical tradition's peak. Rabbinic commentary on Merkaba mysticism emphasized caution and secrecy in studying these esoteric matters. The Talmudic tradition discouraged discussing the Merkaba openly, and it was limited to scholars who possessed the necessary qualifications and wisdom to delve into its mysteries. In later Jewish interpretations, including Kabbalah, the Merkaba vision of Ezekiel and the throne vision of Isaiah were related to the concept of the four worlds. These mystical experiences were seen as descending through these four realms of existence, with each world representing different aspects of divine manifestation and understanding. The term hypersigil is a captivating concept that delves into the intricate realm of human perception and the malleability of reality. Coined by Clintron Finley and notably championed by Grant Morrison, a renowned comic book author, the hypersigil transcends the traditional notion of a sigil, transforming it into a dynamic, multidimensional phenomenon. At its core, a hypersigil represents a feedback loop between an individual's external or extended persona and their primary self. It intertwines elements of characterization, drama, and plot, morphing the static sigil concept into a narrative-rich transformative force. Morrison's groundbreaking explanation vividly illustrates the essence of hypersigils. The hypersigil, or supersigil, develops the sigil concept beyond the static image and incorporates elements such as characterization, drama, and plot. The hypersigil is a sigil extended through the fourth dimension. Morrison's personal journey with hypersigils is epitomized by his six-year-long magnum opus, The Invisibles. This comic series served as a hypersigil, a magnum opus, in the form of an occult adventure story. Astonishingly, it consumed and recreated Morrison's life during its creation, testifying to the immense power and, at times, the potential danger of hypersigils. As Morrison aptly puts it, the hypersigil is an immensely powerful and sometimes dangerous method for actually altering reality in accordance with intent. Results can be remarkable and shocking. In today's digital age, hypersigils have found a profound connection with cybernetics. The online persona one crafts, whether through personal blogs, social media, or other digital platforms, acts as a potent hypersigil. Choices made in shaping this persona, from the content shared to the interactions with others, have a ripple effect that extends beyond the digital realm into the physical world. Consider the familiar scenario of crafting a social media profile on platforms like Instagram or YouTube. Each choice made to define the online persona contributes to a manifest change in the offline world. The content shared on the internet reflects and magnifies one's self-awareness, both to themselves and their social circles. This phenomenon illustrates how hypersigils can subtly shape behaviors, perceptions, and even significant real-world changes in a person's life over time. Celebrities, in particular, are adept at leveraging hypersigils. Forced into the limelight, they are compelled to create and maintain a public persona that audiences inevitably read back into the actual celebrity. This intricate interplay between persona and reality showcases the far-reaching influence of hypersigils. For those intrigued by the notion of hypersigils, Clintron Finley suggests an experiment. After gaining familiarity with traditional sigil methods, embark on the creation of your hypersigil. This creative endeavor can take various forms, including poetry, storytelling, music, dance, or any extended artistic activity that resonates with you. The key to a successful hypersigil lies in complete immersion and concentration. Much like a work of art, it demands a high degree of absorption, and while it may lead to obsession, it is a journey worth undertaking. The hypersigil becomes a dynamic miniature model of the magician's universe, a hologram, microcosm, or voodoo doll. This miniature universe can be manipulated in real time, producing tangible changes in the macrocosmic environment of real life. 
Hypersigils are said to represent a captivating fusion of creativity, self-perception, and reality manipulation. They invite individuals to explore the uncharted territories of their own consciousness, utilizing art and narrative as powerful tools to shape and influence the world around them. A grand unified theory, gut, is a bit like trying to fit all the fundamental forces of nature, such as magnets, electricity, and the strong force inside atoms, into one single force when things get incredibly hot. Think of it as combining different pieces of a puzzle into one big piece. We can't directly see this super force, but scientists have some ideas about it. They believe it might have existed when the universe was very young. At extremely high energies, some forces like electricity and the weak force come together and act as one. Guts suggests that even stronger forces like the one inside atoms might also join this unified force. If this happens, it's a major step toward understanding everything in the universe. Now here's where it gets a bit tricky. The particles that Guts predict are incredibly heavy, which makes them very hard to find directly. Instead, we might notice their effects in other ways, such as when protons, tiny particles, and atoms decay, which doesn't happen often, or by studying special tiny particles called neutrinos. Some guts even suggest the existence of magnetic particles called monopolies. Although guts may sound simple, real-life versions are quite complex because they need extra details to explain why particles have their masses and other properties. The history of guts began in the 1970s with models like the Georgie Glashow and Padi Salam models. The term gut was coined by scientists in 1978. Guts are exciting because they attempt to explain why particles have the charges they do and why certain forces work the way they do. It's a bit like solving a big puzzle in nature. However, even after lots of research, scientists haven't proven guts yet. They need more evidence. In recent years, a new idea called ultra-unification has emerged. It combines the standard model and guts, using some advanced math, and explores concepts like topological phases and forces that behave differently from regular forces. An out-of-place artifact, often referred to as O-part, is an unusual historical or archaeological item found in a strange context. It challenges our understanding of history because it appears too advanced for the known technology of its time, or suggests human presence in an era before humans were thought to exist. Some O-parts hint at unexpected cultural interactions that are hard to explain with conventional history. These artifacts have gained attention in fringe science, cryptozoology, ancient astronaut theories, and other unconventional fields. They encompass various items, ranging from legitimate scientific anomalies to objects that have been proven to be hoaxes or explained conventionally. Critics argue that many O parts result from misinterpretations or wishful thinking, like assuming a culture couldn't have made a certain item due to a lack of knowledge or materials. Sometimes the confusion arises from inaccurate descriptions. Supporters view U-parts as evidence that mainstream science might overlook significant knowledge gaps. Some use them to challenge established views of human history, such as those in creation science, ancient astronaut theories, or ideas about advanced ancient civilizations. Survivalism is a practical approach to preparing for emergencies. It covers scenarios from personal adversity to global catastrophes. Survivalists focus on self-reliance, stockpiling supplies, and gaining survival skills. This can range from basic kits to fully fortified bunkers. They often acquire first aid, self-defense, and self-sufficiency training. Some even build survival retreats or modify existing structures. The movement has its roots in Cold War-era civil defense programs, religious beliefs, and economic concerns. Over the years, survivalist concerns have evolved, from economic collapse to nuclear war, and more recently, pandemics and climate change. Mainstream emergency preparations also overlap with survivalism, with people preparing for natural disasters and other unforeseen events. In essence, survivalism is about being prepared for the unexpected, whether on a personal or global scale. 
Vulcan, a once theorized planet, stirred curiosity among astronomers for centuries. They suspected a planet nestled between Mercury and the Sun, sparking a quest to spot it. The search was prompted by irregularities in Mercury's orbit, puzzling astronomers like Urban Le Verrier. Numerous astronomers claimed sightings of mysterious objects crossing the Sun's face. Some early observations, like Christoph Scheiner's in 1611, turned out to be sunspots. Capel Loft and Franz von Paula Gruthusen reported oddities in 1818 and 1819. J.W. Pastorf also noted peculiar spots in 1822 and later. The idea of planets within Mercury's orbit intrigued scientists. Thomas Dick in 1838 and Jacques Babinet in 1846 proposed the existence of incandescent clouds or planets. They even coined the name Vulcan for this elusive celestial body. Astronomers attempted to catch Vulcan during solar transits. Heinrich Schwabe, Edward Claudius Herrick, and Edmund Modeste Lescarbot mounted systematic searches, but confirmation remained elusive. Urban Le Verrier, known for predicting Neptune's existence, suggested Vulcan's presence in 1859 to explain Mercury's orbital anomalies. Le Verrier's credibility grew when he received a report from Le Carbo claiming to have seen Vulcan. Le Carbo described a small black dot on the sun's face moving like Mercury's transit. Le Verrier announced Vulcan's discovery in 1860. However, not everyone believed it. Astronomers like Emmanuel Liai disputed the claim. Despite doubts, Le Verrier calculated Vulcan's orbit, placing it close to the sun. Many amateurs reported sightings, fueling the excitement. Observations continued, but Vulcan's existence remained unverified. In 1915, Einstein's theory of relativity explained Mercury's orbit anomalies without the need for Vulcan. This new understanding of gravity changed everything, making Vulcan obsolete. Today, the name Vulcan remains reserved, but modern technology and knowledge have dispelled the myth of this mysterious planet, making it a footnote in the annals of astronomy. Psychometry, also known as token object reading or psychoscopy, claims the ability to gain knowledge of an object's history through physical contact, attributing this to an energy field within the object. The concept of psychometry was coined by Joseph Rhodes Buchanan in 1842. He believed that all things emitted an emanation that could be sensed. Buchanan envisioned psychometry as a revolutionary science capable of transforming various fields. Buchanan's followers believed psychometry would lead to significant scientific advancements, philosophy, and societal enlightenment. In the late 19th century, psychometry gained popularity in stage acts and seances, often involving mediums or psychics reading personal objects provided by participants. Despite its popularity, there's no scientific evidence supporting psychometry. Skeptics attribute its claimed successes to cold reading and confirmation bias, categorizing psychometry as pseudoscience. Law enforcement agencies generally do not rely on psychics or psychometry for investigations, as their involvement has not proven consistently helpful, according to psychologist Leonard Zuzna. Lemuria, proposed by zoologist Philip Sclatter in 1864, suggested a sunken continent to explain lemur fossils in Madagascar and the Indian subcontinent. It later gained mystical significance through theosophy. The theory became less credible with the acceptance of plate tectonics in the 20th century. No geological formation supports it as a land bridge. Despite its scientific decline, Lemuria thrived in theosophy, pseudoscience, and lost land discussions with claims of a submerged continent in the Pacific or Indian Oceans. James Churchward detailed Lemuria as Mu in the Pacific, linking it to Atlantis. This connection was explored in L. Sprague de Camp's book. Frank Collins' fringe writings furthered Lemuria in New Age beliefs. Lemuria's scientific origins trace back to Sclater's attempt to explain Lemur fossils in Madagascar and India. Other scientists also sought submerged land bridges before plate tectonics. Ernst Haeckel linked Lemuria to missing links but without the name. Plate tectonics explained the separation of India and Madagascar, dismissing Lemuria. 
Lemuria found a parallel in Tamil literature as Kumari Kandam, associated with the cradle of civilization. In 1803, a peculiar incident unfolded on the Harayadori coast of Hitachi Province, Japan. Fishermen discovered a mysterious vessel adrift at sea, resembling a kohako, Japanese incense burner. It measured 3.30 meters in height and 5.45 meters in width, with a red lacquered rosewood upper part and metal plates on the lower section. The boat featured transparent windows covered in bars and tree resin, along with inscriptions in an unknown language. Inside they found various items including bed sheets, a bottle of water, cake, and kneaded meat. The most intriguing discovery was a young woman, approximately 18 to 20 years old, with red hair extended by artificial white extensions. She wore unusual clothes and clutched a quadratic box tightly, refusing anyone to touch it. Despite her friendly demeanor, no one could communicate with her. The villagers speculated about her origin, suggesting she might be a foreign princess banished from her homeland due to a scandal. Some even thought the box contained the head of her deceased lover. Fearing the unknown, the villagers placed her back in the vessel and set it adrift in the ocean. Similar incidents involving circular boats and mysterious women have been documented in Japanese folklore, often with exotic attributes. Some believe the Utsuro Boon story may have been influenced by cultural isolationism during the Edo period, as Japan was closed off from the outside world. Modern investigations suggest that the Utsuro Boon may not be evidence of extraterrestrial encounters, but rather a blend of folklore and imagination. The European appearance of the woman along with the boat's features may have been added to make the story more captivating. In ufology, the Utsuro Boon legend has been compared to close encounters of the third kind, given its similarities to descriptions of flying saucers. Some ufologists speculate that it could have been an unidentified submerged object, USO, pointing to mysterious symbols found on the vessel. The woman's refusal to open her box is reminiscent of the Gehobako, carried by wandering Miko and Itako, believed to contain magic objects or even human skulls. In Japanese culture, red hair was associated with demons and European foreigners, further adding to the enigma of the story. The Rohant Codex is a mysterious illustrated manuscript found in Hungary in the 19th century. Its author, language, and meaning remain unknown. Some believe it's an 18th century hoax. The Codex, originally from Rohank, Hungary, was donated to the Hungarian Academy of Sciences in 1838. It may have been mentioned in a 1743 library catalog, but with limited information. Numerous scholars and amateurs have tried to decipher the Codex, but no one has provided a widely accepted translation or interpretation. The authenticity of the Codex has been questioned, with some suggesting it could be a forgery, although there's no direct evidence linking it to a specific forger. The Rohant Codex is stored in the library of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, and special permission is required to study it. A microfilm copy is available. The Codex consists of 448 small pages with rows of symbols, accompanied by 87 illustrations depicting scenes related to various religions. The symbols used in the Codex are unlike any known alphabet, with the possibility that they represent a syllabary or logographic system. The language of the Codex remains unidentified, with proposed hypotheses including Hungarian Dacian, Early Romanian, Cuman, Hindi, and more. Various scholars have attempted translations, but none have gained wide acceptance. Some theories suggest the Codex could be encoded or enciphered text, a shorthand system, or a constructed language. Research on the Codex continues with ongoing attempts to understand its meaning and origin. Greek fire, an incendiary weapon employed by the Eastern Roman Empire, made its debut in AD 672. Designed to set enemy ships ablaze, it involved a flammable concoction ejected from a flamethrowing device. This substance was reputedly capable of ignition on contact with water, and likely composed of naphtha and quicklime. The Byzantines used Greek fire effectively in naval conflicts, where it could continue burning even on water's surface. 
This technology played a pivotal role in various Byzantine military victories, including the defense of Constantinople from Arab sieges. The reputation of Greek fire was so impactful that it led crusaders from Western Europe to refer to any incendiary weapon as Greek fire. However, these mixtures varied from the Byzantine formula, which remained a closely guarded secret. Byzantines used pressurized nozzles to project the liquid, resembling a modern flamethrower. The precise composition of Greek fire remains a subject of speculation, with proposals including combinations of pine resin, naphtha, quicklime, calcium phosphide, sulfur, or nitre. In contrast to the widespread use of the term Greek fire in modern languages, original Byzantine sources referred to it by various names like sea fire, Roman fire, war fire, liquid fire, sticky fire, or manufactured fire. Incendiary and flaming weapons were in use for centuries before Greek fire's development. These included sulfur, petroleum, and bitumen-based mixtures, incendiary arrows, and pots. Thucydides even mentioned a tube on wheels that blew flames during the Siege of Delium in 424 BC. The development of Greek fire is attributed to Callinikos, an architect who fled to the Romans. Its use was instrumental in repelling Muslim forces during the Arab sieges of Constantinople and played a crucial role in Byzantine civil wars and conflicts with external enemies. The secrecy surrounding Greek fire extended to its composition, manufacture, and deployment. It was treated as a complete weapon system with various components, and knowledge was compartmentalized to prevent enemies from gaining a full understanding. Theories on its composition have ranged from saltpeter to quicklime, but most modern scholars believe it was based on crude or refined petroleum, similar to napalm. Other ingredients like resins were likely added for thickening and intensifying the flame. Greek fire was primarily deployed through tubes, siphons, on ships, with intense heat used to pressurize and project the mixture. Portable projectors, chirosophones, were also used, and jars containing Greek fire were thrown by catapults. While Greek fire was a potent weapon, it had limitations including limited range and sensitivity to sea and wind conditions. Adversaries adapted by staying out of range and employing protective measures, but Greek fire remained a significant factor in many battles and Byzantine history. In the field of psychonautics, there's a fascinating phenomenon known as geometry, or visual patterns. It occurs when individuals, often under the influence of certain drugs like LSD or mushrooms, experience fast-moving, colorful, and highly intricate shapes and colors. These patterns can sometimes appear to convey meaningful information. This experience isn't static. It involves rapidly changing shapes and is often accompanied by other hallucinatory effects. These geometric visions can range from simple patterns and motion to fully three-dimensional shapes that seem to take over a person's visual perception. At the highest levels of this experience, individuals may feel as though these geometric shapes reveal the inner workings of their minds, 8a, or the mechanics of consciousness itself, 8b. However, it's essential to exercise caution, as the insights gained during these states may not always be accurate or reliable. Radionics, also known as electromagnetic therapy EMT, claims to diagnose and treat diseases using electromagnetic radiation. This concept originated from books by American physician Albert Abrams in the early 20th century. Abrams became wealthy by leasing his EMT machines, but this approach contradicts established principles of physics and biology and is widely considered pseudoscientific. The United States Food and Drug Administration FDA, does not recognize any legitimate medical use for radionics. Radionics practitioners claim to balance energy frequencies in the body to cure diseases. They often use devices and electromagnetic energy to correct supposed imbalances. Despite these claims, there is no scientific evidence supporting the effectiveness of radionic devices, and they are often considered quackery. Contemporary proponents of radionics suggest that electromagnetic fields can correct imbalances in the body. However, these claims lack scientific basis and are considered pseudoscientific. 
The American Cancer Society warns against relying solely on electromagnetic treatment as it may have serious health consequences. Reviews and studies have consistently shown that EMT is not a useful therapy for various conditions, including pain, osteoarthritis, urinary incontinence, bone growth stimulation, pressure ulcers, and more. Some EMT devices have been banned by the FDA due to ineffectiveness or safety concerns. Newcomb's paradox is a puzzling thought experiment in philosophy and mathematics. It involves a game between two players, one of whom can predict the future. In this game, there are two players, a reliable predictor, and two boxes labeled A and B. The player facing the choice can either take only box B or take both boxes A and B. Here's what they know. Box A always contains a visible $1,000. Box B, however, has its contents determined by the predictor. If the predictor foresees that the player will choose both boxes, box B will be empty. If the predictor anticipates the player will pick only box B, box B will hold $1 million. The player doesn't know what the predictor predicted or what's inside box B while making the choice. This paradox has divided philosophers. One group believes the player should take both boxes, while the other argues for taking only box B. Each side has its logical reasoning, resulting in conflicting answers. The paradox arises because not all details are specified, leaving room for different interpretations. It's a classic example of how a seemingly straightforward problem can lead to complex debates in philosophy. Some philosophers argue that Newcomb's paradox touches on issues of causality and free will. They suggest that if perfect predictors or time machines exist, it might challenge the concept of free will, as the predictor's prediction could be considered the cause of the player's choice. Others propose that the paradox is related to machine consciousness. If a perfect simulation of a person's brain generates their consciousness, it becomes challenging to distinguish between the real world and a virtual simulation, affecting the player's decision. Thanatology is the scientific study of death and its various aspects. It delves into the mechanisms and forensic elements of death, encompassing bodily changes occurring during and after death. Thanatology also explores the psychological and social dimensions associated with death. It's taught in colleges and universities as an interdisciplinary field. The term thanatology comes from Greek mythology, where thanatos represents death. The ology part signifies the study of a subject. The origins of thanatology trace back to the early 20th century when Russian scientist Elie Metchnikoff proposed the study of death. Initially, his idea faced resistance, as there was little focus on teaching how to care for the dying. It took several decades for thanatology to be recognized as a legitimate field. The acceptance of thanatology increased in the early 1970s with the Death with Dignity movement, advocating for the right to end one's life in cases of terminal illness. Hermann Feifel, an American psychologist, played a crucial role in pioneering modern thanatology. His book, The Meaning of Death, challenged prevailing beliefs about death and its significance, gaining widespread attention and contributing to the development of thanatology. Thanatology doesn't directly address questions about the meaning of life and death, but it's relevant to the psychological well-being of individuals, families, and cultures dealing with death. Over time, thanatology has evolved, leading to the establishment of degree programs and courses related to death studies in universities. Its goal is to bridge the gap between practice and research. Forensic science plays a role in investigating sudden and unexpected deaths. Forensic physicians assist in inquiries related to suspicious deaths and allegations of sexual offenses. Thanatology intersects with multiple fields, including psychology, sociology, anthropology, and medical ethics. It encompasses a broad range of subjects, examining how societies and cultures handle death. Music thanatology is a specialized branch that uses music, often the harp or gentle instruments, to provide comfort and support to dying individuals, their families, and friends. Music thanatologists observe physiological changes and interpersonal dynamics to create music vigils that can help ease the dying process. 
Extremophiles are organisms that thrive in extreme environments, pushing the boundaries of where life can exist. These environments can include extreme temperatures, radiation, salinity, or pH levels. While some spores and bacteria can remain dormant for millions of years, extremophiles continue to flourish in such challenging conditions, making them some of the most abundant life forms on Earth. Scientists have discovered extremophiles living in various extreme environments, from the cold and dark depths of Antarctica to the seafloor sediments deep beneath the ocean. These resilient microorganisms can adapt to nearly any condition, which is essential for their survival. Their ability to thrive in extreme environments is often linked to their unique amino acid composition, which affects their protein folding under specific conditions. Extremophiles are classified into various categories based on the extreme conditions they inhabit. Some examples include thermophiles, thriving in high temperatures, psychrophiles, thriving in cold temperatures, acidophiles, thriving in acidic environments, and alkalophiles, thriving in alkaline environments, among others. Some extremophiles even fall into multiple categories, known as polyextremophiles. Astrobiologists study extremophiles to understand the limits of life on Earth and the potential for life on other planets. For example, microbes found deep underground in Antarctica suggest the possibility of life beneath the Martian surface. Extremophiles have also shown remarkable adaptability to space conditions, raising questions about panspermia, the idea that life could travel between planets. Extremophiles play a crucial role in bioremediation, especially in cleaning up polluted sites where classic bioremediation candidates would fail. For instance, certain extremophiles, like piezophiles, can tolerate extreme pressures in deep sea environments and metabolize pollutants. They also contribute to addressing hydrocarbon contamination and metal remediation in extreme conditions. In biotechnology, extremophiles have practical applications. Enzymes from extremophiles, such as TAC DNA polymerase, are widely used in molecular biology techniques. These enzymes are highly stable and function effectively under extreme conditions. Additionally, some extremophiles are employed in DNA transfer processes for genetic modification. Extremophiles continue to reveal their adaptability and resilience in new and unexpected ways. They are vital to expanding our understanding of life's limits and hold promise for applications in various fields, from biotechnology to astrobiology. The CBU manuscript, a 16th century book, contains a surprising revelation about multi-stage rockets, a concept far ahead of its time. Discovered in Sibiu, Romania around six decades ago, this 450-page manuscript discusses liquid fuel and the intricate construction of rockets. It challenges conventional knowledge of its time. Doru Todoricu, a professor of science and technology at the University of Bucharest, uncovered the Sibiu manuscript in 1961 from the city of Sibiu's archives. The document features writings and drawings depicting early artillery, ballistics, and multi-stage rockets. Although it was found in the 1960s, experts believe that the language used dates back to the 16th century. The true author remains unknown, but credit often goes to Konrad Haas, a German man credited as the pioneer of multi-stage rockets. Konrad Haas (1509–1576) was an Austrian or Transylvanian Saxon military engineer known for his groundbreaking work in rocket propulsion. His designs included three-stage rockets and even a concept for a manned rocket. His ideas, considering the time, are both amazing and unusual. Haas served as the Zeugwart (arsenal master) for the Imperial Habsburg Army under Ferdinand. He was invited to Hermannstadt, now Sibiu, in Transylvania by Stephen Bathory, where he worked as a weapons engineer and taught in Klausenburg, now Cluj-Napoca. Haas authored a German language treatise on rocket technology, now known as the Sibiu Manuscripts. His work delved into the theory of multi-stage rocket propulsion, various fuel mixtures, liquid fuel, and introduced innovations like delta-shaped fins and bell-shaped nozzles. Interestingly, he ended his chapter on military rocket use with a plea for peace and disarmament. Johann Schmidlap of Schorndorf, a 16th century Bavarian fireworks maker and rocket pioneer, played a crucial role. 
He is believed to be the first to successfully fly staged rockets, inspired by Conrad Haas's concepts. In 1590, Schmidlap experimented with staging rockets, developing what he called step rockets. Before the discovery of Haas's manuscript, the first description of a three-stage rocket was credited to Kazimierz Simeonowicz in Poland, in his 1650 work Artis Magne Artilleriae Pars Prima. Nikola Tesla, a Serbian-American inventor and engineer, is renowned for his significant contributions to the development of the modern alternating current AC electricity supply system. Born in the Austrian Empire in the mid-19th century, Tesla pursued engineering and physics without obtaining a degree. In the 1880s, he gained practical experience in telephony and the emerging electric power industry. In 1884, Tesla immigrated to the United States, where he eventually became a naturalized citizen. He briefly worked at the Edison Machine Works in New York City before venturing out on his own. With support from partners, Tesla established laboratories and companies in New York to create various electrical and mechanical devices. His AC induction motor and related polyphase AC patents, licensed by Westinghouse Electric in 1888, brought him both fame and fortune, forming the foundation of the polyphase system widely adopted by the company. Tesla's innovative spirit led him to conduct experiments with mechanical oscillators, electrical discharge tubes, and early X-ray imaging. He even constructed a wirelessly controlled boat, a groundbreaking achievement at the time. Tesla's penchant for showmanship made him a well-known inventor, showcasing his inventions to celebrities and patrons. During the 1890s, he delved into wireless lighting and global wireless electric power distribution, conducting high-voltage, high-frequency power experiments in New York and Colorado Springs. In 1893, he spoke of the possibility of wireless communication using his inventions. However, his ambitious Wardenclyffe Tower project, intended for intercontinental wireless communication and power transmission, remained unfinished due to funding issues. In the subsequent decades, Tesla continued to experiment with various inventions, but success varied. Struggling financially, he resided in several New York hotels, leaving unpaid bills. Tesla passed away in New York City in January 1943. Tesla's work faded into relative obscurity after his death until 1960, when the General Conference on Weights and Measures honored him by naming the SI unit of magnetic flux density the Tesla. Since the 1990s, there has been a renewed interest in Tesla and his groundbreaking work. Leonardo da Vinci designed a humanoid automaton known as Leonardo's Robot, or Leonardo's Mechanical Knight, around 1495. Sketches of this robot were rediscovered in the 1950s, shedding light on its design. Leonardo is believed to have showcased the robot at an event hosted by Ludovico Sforza in Milan in 1495. The Robot Knight was a remarkable creation capable of standing, sitting, lifting its visor, moving its arms independently, and even having an anatomically correct jaw. It operated using a system of pulleys and cables. Since the rediscovery of Leonardo's design notes, the robot has been faithfully reconstructed and found to be fully functional. This humanoid automaton was dressed in medieval armor and could perform various human-like movements. It was influenced by Leonardo's anatomical research, particularly his work on the canon of proportions as depicted in the Vitruvian Man. The Baghdad Battery is a set of three ancient artifacts, a ceramic pot, a copper tube, and an iron rod. Discovered in 1936 in present-day Iraq, their purpose remains a mystery. Some have suggested they were a type of ancient battery, possibly used for electroplating or electrotherapy. However, most archaeologists reject these claims. The ceramic pot is about 6 inches tall and contains a copper cylinder with an iron rod inside. The top of the iron rod is isolated from the copper by bitumen, with plugs to keep them in place. If the jar were filled with liquid, it would surround the iron rod. The artifacts had suffered corrosion. 
Wilhelm Koenig, a researcher, speculated that they might have formed a galvanic cell used for electroplating gold onto silver objects. However, this interpretation is widely rejected. Corrosion and tests suggest that an acidic agent, like wine or vinegar, was once in the jar. This led to speculation that it might have been used as an acidic electrolyte solution to generate an electric current, but this remains unproven. Supporting experiments have shown some limited electrical activity when replicas were filled with grape juice or other substances, but no definitive proof of their original function exists. Critics point out that there's no evidence of electrical connections and that the bitumen seal would have made maintenance difficult. Some archaeologists believe these artifacts might have been used to store sacred scrolls. In recent times, the artifacts were looted during the 2003 invasion of Iraq, adding to the mystery. Despite various experiments and theories, the true purpose of the Baghdad battery remains uncertain, leaving it as an intriguing oddity from the past. Technopathy is the psychic ability to perceive, interact with, and control technology. Those with this power can sense the presence and details of mechanical devices, activate or deactivate electronic devices, communicate with them, and even channel their perception through electronic media. However, the extent of a technopath's connection to technology can vary. Some may focus solely on electronic devices, while others have a broader connection to the concept of technology, including non-digital machinery. Direct technopaths can access and manipulate electronic connections, granting them vast access to the digital world. They can sense the inner workings of machines and modify coding to their liking. Metaphysical technopaths have a more passive connection, perceiving information about technology rather than controlling it. They may not be able to manipulate machines directly, but can gather insights from them. One limitation is that technopaths must be within proximity of the technology they want to interact with. Different cultures and beliefs about technology can also affect their abilities. Some may only connect with machines involving magic, while others specialize in older or more traditional devices. It's worth noting that not all technopaths can interact with everyday objects like cutlery, and their abilities may not include telekinesis. Irrational computing is an art project that looks at the physical side of digital technology. Computers and devices use tiny materials like silicon to work, but we can't see these parts because they're too small. This project makes these tiny parts big so we can see and understand them better. The project has five parts that work together. They use special crystals and minerals. For example, they use a crystal called silicon carbide and make it light up with special wires. This crystal also makes sounds when it lights up. We can hear these sounds through speakers. Usually, computers are very logical and make sense. But deep down, the tiny parts that make them work are a bit unpredictable, like a game of chance. Irrational computing explores the beauty of these materials and how they mix precision and unpredictability. It's not meant to do a job, but to show us the artistic side of technology. Technopaganism is a blend of neopaganism, magic rituals, and digital technology. It involves using technology as a tool in spiritual practices, or even worshipping technology itself. Some see significance in the internet, while techno-music is also linked to this belief. In techno-paganism, technology is used to describe spiritual concepts, often using computer or telecommunications metaphors. People may replace traditional magical tools with tech, like using an oven instead of a hearth or a laser pointer as a wand. Artificial intelligence plays a significant role in some techno-pagan communities, where it's seen as spiritually beneficial, they advocate for a symbiotic relationship with AI. Beliefs in techno-paganism extend to believing that modern items like buildings, roads, and even the internet have their own pseudo-spirits or totem spirits. Some even believe that the internet itself is gaining a unique spirit. Hyperborea from Greek mythology was a mythical land in the far north of the known world. Despite being located in a cold region, it was believed to be a sunny, temperate, and blessed place. 
The Hyperboreans were thought to be favorites of the god Apollo and were associated with the founding of his shrines. Ancient sources disagreed on whether the Hyperboreans were purely mythical or linked to real-world locations like Britain, Scandinavia, or Siberia. The location of Hyperborea varied widely in different texts, from Thrace to the Danube to Britain. Some even believed it was in the Arctic. In modern times, Hyperborea has been associated with various northern European peoples and cultures. Some esoteric thinkers have linked it to the origins of mankind and spiritual evolution. Hyperborea remains a mysterious and mythical concept from ancient mythology with various interpretations throughout history. Solipsism is a fancy word that describes a belief that only your own thoughts and experiences are real, and everything else might just be made up by your mind. There are different types of this belief. Metaphysical solipsism. This means you believe that you are the only real thing, and everything and everyone else is like characters in your own personal story. Epistemological solipsism. Here, you think that you can only be sure about your own thoughts, and you're not sure if the outside world is real or not. Methodological solipsism, this is a bit like being skeptical. You say that before we can be sure about anything in the world, we have to be absolutely certain about our own thoughts and experiences. Solipsism challenges three big ideas. You're most certain about what's going on in your own head. There's no definite connection between what's in your head and what's out there in the world. What you experience is unique to you. Solipsism has been talked about by philosophers for a long time, like the Greeks, Descartes, and Berkeley. They've also debated about other big ideas like idealism and materialism. But solipsism is not a very popular belief because it's hard to prove, and there are lots of arguments against it. Plus, most people think there's more to the world than just what's in their own head. The Rashomon Effect is a storytelling method where an event gets different interpretations from those involved. This provides various viewpoints of the same incident. It's named after a 1950 Japanese film, Rashomon, where a murder is described in four conflicting ways by four witnesses. This term deals with why and how people report events differently, showing the unreliability of eyewitnesses. It highlights disagreements about what really happened, and the subjectivity in how people perceive, remember, and report things. The Rashomon effect is essential for understanding complex and unclear situations. It's not just about movies, it applies to various fields like literature, law, psychology, sociology, and history. Imagine several people witnessing an event and each describing it differently. This principle shows how our personal perspectives influence what we remember and tell others about what we've seen. In court cases, both sides often claim victory, showing the Rashomon effect in action. This phenomenon isn't limited to film, it's also seen in real life. Memories are shaped by our identity and interests. In a Polish film called Passenger, survivors and guards from Auschwitz remember events differently, highlighting the impact of personal experiences on memory. Techno-primitivism is a concept often found in science fiction and occasionally in reality. It involves societies intentionally limiting or rejecting technology. One common reason for this is a fear of artificial intelligence, where technology becomes a threat to humanity. Throughout history, we've seen concerns about technology taking jobs and changing societies. The rise of machines often led to people losing their livelihoods and skills, causing discomfort and resistance. While technology has brought numerous benefits, it also comes with challenges. In some cases, societies intentionally regress technologically, believing that an overly comfortable life erodes essential qualities like hard work and resilience. They might romanticize simpler, pre-technological times. In the future, as humanity expands into space, we may encounter colonies that reject advanced technology, preferring a simpler existence. However, it's unlikely these colonies will stay completely primitive. Maintaining a tech ban over time would be challenging, and neighbors with different views may influence them to modernize. Despite the allure of a simpler life, many still value hard work, challenges, and growth, which technology can't fully replace. 
So, while some may opt for techno-primitivism, it's unlikely to become a widespread permanent choice in a future filled with technological opportunities. Curlian photography is a technique capturing electrical coronal discharges, named after its discoverer Semyon Curlian. When an object on a photographic plate is connected to high voltage, it creates an image. The technique is also known as electrography, electrophotography, and more. Curlian photography, once the subject of scientific and parapsychology research, is now mostly used in alternative medicine. Claims about paranormal auras are not scientifically accepted. History traces back to 1939 when Curlian and his wife noticed a glow around a patient receiving electrical treatment. They experimented by placing objects on photographic film with high voltage, creating images showing silhouettes with an aura of light. In 1958, the Curlian's work gained attention, leading to its public introduction in the West by Lynn Schroeder and Sheila Ostrander in 1970. The technique involves placing photographic film on a metal plate, putting an object on the film, and applying high voltage. The resulting corona discharge between the object and plate exposes the film, creating a Curlian photograph. Colors vary depending on discharge intensity. Curlian photography doesn't require a camera, it's a contact print process. Transparent electrodes can replace the discharge plate for capturing with a standard camera. Scientifically, Curlian photography's aura claims are debunked. It mainly records electric fields and moisture on the object's surface. Claims of diagnosing illnesses or capturing auras remain unproven. It's criticized for its pseudoscientific nature. In popular culture, Curlian photography has appeared in books, films, and music albums, often portraying paranormal or supernatural themes. Déjà vu, a French term meaning, already seen, describes the sensation of remembering a situation as if it happened before, even when it hasn't. It's a puzzling feeling that can leave people confused, but it's a common occurrence. The term was coined by French philosopher Émile Boirac in 1876. Boirac suggested déjà vu might be a memory phenomenon, where our brain recognizes similarities between our current experience and a past memory, leaving us with a sense of familiarity. Déjà vu can sometimes be associated with medical conditions like temporal lobe epilepsy and migraines with aura. However, it doesn't necessarily indicate a serious problem. Some researchers explore genetic factors, like the LGI1 gene, as a potential link to déjà vu. Certain drug combinations can also increase the chances of experiencing déjà vu. One explanation is the split perception theory, where déjà vu occurs when we experience a situation twice in quick succession, with the first encounter being fleeting or distracted. Another explanation relates to memory. Déjà vu often involves good memory functions, particularly long-term implicit memory. It's like recognizing an event you can't fully recall. Cryptomnesia suggests déjà vu occurs when forgotten information stored in the brain is invoked by similar situations, creating a feeling of familiarity. Dual neurological processing proposes that déjà vu happens when signals entering the brain's temporal lobe are slightly out of sync, causing the same experience to feel like two separate events. Dreams may also play a role. Some déjà vu experiences resemble a situation from dreams and there's a correlation between remembered dreams and déjà vu. The unity of opposites, a concept often linked to non-duality, has deep historical roots in philosophy. Heraclitus, an ancient Greek thinker, introduced the idea that everything is in constant change, yet a unity of opposites exists simultaneously, containing both difference and sameness. In medieval philosophy, coincidentia oppositorum gained prominence. This term describes the coincidence of opposites and has been explored by scholars like Nicholas of Cusa, Carl Jung, and Mircea Eliad. It suggests that contradictory elements can coexist, revealing a deeper unity. In modern philosophy, dialecticians argue that the unity of opposites can exist in reality or thought. Opposites co-substantiate each other, and their unity is essential for their existence. For example, upward only makes sense because of downward and hot, 
wouldn't exist without cold. This principle underlies the very existence of opposites. Philosophers like Hegel explored various pairs of opposites such as finite and infinite, identity and difference, and cause and effect, emphasizing how they are interconnected and form a concrete unity. The unity of opposites is a profound concept that suggests that opposing elements can coexist, and their unity is essential for their existence, a notion that has fascinated philosophers throughout history. Cryptoastronomy delves into the realm of hypothetical astronomical objects, objects that have been contemplated throughout history but remain elusive to direct observation. For instance, in ancient times, philosopher Philolaeus conceived of the central fire, an imaginary celestial body around which other heavenly bodies, including the sun, were thought to revolve. These speculative objects are not limited to our solar system but extend to both its inner and outer reaches. They encompass diverse entities like theoretical stars, planets, and other celestial bodies. Within our solar system, we have a list of imagined objects. In the wider cosmos, concepts like hypothetical stars, brown dwarfs, and black holes capture our imagination. Even the existence of extrasolar moons is a subject of conjecture. Moreover, religious, astrological, and pseudoscientific beliefs have proposed stars, planets, and moons that defy scientific acceptance. The diversity of hypothetical planets is equally intriguing. They include ammonia planets with potential ammonia lakes, planets orbiting black holes, carbon planets with a carbon-rich composition, and Chthonian planets stripped of their outer layers by intense stellar heat. Chlorine planets, coreless planets lacking a metallic core, desert planets with scarce water, extragalactic planets outside our Milky Way, and eyeball planets with surface features resembling human eyes contribute to the rich tapestry of ideas. Helium planets, primarily composed of helium instead of hydrogen, and Hycean planets, water-covered worlds with hydrogen-rich atmospheres provoke curiosity about exotic environments that may host extremophilic life. Ocean planets with entirely aquatic surfaces, superhabitable planets surpassing Earth's habitability, and tidally detached exomoons, once satellites but now gravitationally liberated, expand our cosmic imagination. Toroidal planets with donut-like shapes, Trojan planets near the Lagrange points of larger bodies, and vitriolic planets abundant in strong acids, including sulfuric acid, complete the intriguing roster of hypothetical celestial bodies that continue to capture the imagination of crypto-astronomers. The crypto-terrestrial hypothesis proposes that mysterious beings linked to UFOs and alien abductions might have earthly origins, akin to hidden cryptids. According to this theory, these enigmatic races have lived on Earth as long as humans, disguising themselves as extraterrestrials or occult entities. This idea shares similarities with the interdimensional UFO hypothesis, notably Jacques Vallée and Joseph Allen Hynek's work. Some even consider it an extension of Richard Shaver's concepts. Self-hypnosis, a self-induced hypnotic state, is often used to enhance self-suggestion. In self-hypnosis, individuals take on the roles of both the suggester and suggestee. This practice can be divided into two main approaches, concentrative, where focus is solely on specific suggestions, and inclusive, where various thoughts and emotions are allowed. Researchers have identified 13 distinct types of self-hypnosis practices, categorized based on the involvement of a hypnotist, clinical definitions, and the source of suggestions. In history, the Scottish physician James Braid introduced the term hypnotism in 1841 and later experimented with self-hypnosis. Emile Coué and his conscious autosuggestion method gained popularity in the early 20th century. Autogenic training developed by Johannes Schultz in 1932 combines physiological and psychic conditioning. Self-hypnosis involves four steps, motivation, relaxation, concentration, and directing. It has various applications including pain management, anxiety and stress reduction, aiding sleep disorders, 
addressing obesity, asthma, and skin conditions, improving concentration, recall, problem solving, alleviating headaches, and emotional control. Self-hypnosis can help manage pain, relieve stress, and improve self-esteem. It provides individuals with a tool to control and manage pain independently. Stress reduction through self-hypnosis also supports the immune system. In childbirth, self-hypnosis techniques can help alleviate pain and discomfort with methods like glove anesthesia, time distortion, and imaginative transformation. Self-hypnosis can address a range of issues and behavioral problems through self-directed thought based on hypnotic principles. Research suggests a high correlation between self-hypnosis and traditional heterohypnosis, although some differences exist in the qualitative experience between the two. In the realm of physics, there's a fascinating discovery that defies convention. It's the emergence of a new kind of matter known as the swirlonic state, and it has a remarkable ability, it bends the laws of physics. In the world of matter, there are two fundamental categories, passive and active. Passive matter obediently follows Newton's laws of motion where the application of force impacts acceleration or mass. But then, there's active matter, which operates by its own rules. It possesses the power of self-directed movement, a trait commonly observed in living organisms and certain particles. What sets this swirlonic state apart is its behavior. Unlike passive matter, which can exist in various states simultaneously, this active matter behaves uniquely. It defies convention by existing solely in solid, liquid, or gas forms with no intermediary phases in between. The particles forming this active matter join together in conglomerates called swirlons. They move collectively in circular patterns, akin to schools of fish navigating through the sea. What's truly astonishing is that these swirlons challenge one of the bedrock principles of physics. Newton's second law of motion. Instead of accelerating when subjected to force, they maintain a constant velocity, a departure from the well-established laws of physics. While this revelation originates from computer simulations, it raises profound questions about the nature of matter and the laws that govern it. Further experiments with real-world active matter are essential to unlock the full potential of this discovery. Scientists aspire to comprehend the intricate rules that dictate the behavior of active matter, with the hope of eventually creating materials that can self-assemble, defying conventional physics. In essence, the swirlonic state bends the laws of physics, highlighting the profound richness and complexity of active matter in comparison to its passive counterpart. This newfound oddity of life has the potential to reshape our understanding of the physical world. In the field of psychology, cognitive dissonance is when our thoughts and actions don't match up, and it makes us feel uncomfortable. Imagine you say you don't like sweets, but you're caught eating a chocolate bar. That's cognitive dissonance. To make things simpler, sometimes our actions clash with what we believe. This creates an inner conflict, making us uneasy. We try to fix this uneasiness by changing our beliefs or actions. For example, if you say you hate math, but then enjoy solving math problems, it's confusing. To feel better, you might start thinking, maybe math isn't so bad. Cognitive dissonance happens to everyone, and we deal with it in different ways. We might change our minds, justify our actions, or ignore the problem. It shows up in situations like saying you care about animals but still eating meat, knowing smoking is bad but making excuses to keep smoking, throwing trash on the ground even though you know it's wrong. In a nutshell, cognitive dissonance is about our minds trying to make sense of conflicting thoughts and actions. The magnetic saguaro cactus is a peculiar type of cactus found in Arizona, particularly around Ripsey in Pinal County. It has been described as having magnetic properties due to veins of charged metals like copper running through it. These magnetic characteristics make it attract or repel animals and birds, which then get impaled on its sharp thorns. The cactus digests its prey, turning them into a gooey substance. Back in 1899, 
Joseph Mulhattan, known for his tall tales, claimed to have discovered this magnetic cactus. He said it was so alluring that it drew animals and even humans toward it. To examine it safely, he tied a rope around himself while his friends held on to it. A follow-up report described the cactus as a type of giant saguaro found in various places around Florence. The area's strong magnetism, possibly due to underlying copper or other magnetic minerals, made these cacti behave like magnets. Some were positive, attracting creatures, while others were negative, repelling them. An eerie incident involving two tramps was reported. One was drawn to a positive cactus, impaled, and turned into a pulp. The other was repelled and thrown against a positive cactus, undergoing a similar fate. This gruesome phenomenon was observed by a group of reputable citizens. In times of great storms, the cactus's magnetic power was said to be indescribable, attracting and converting calves, birds, and young colts into the same mucilaginous substance. Due to the remote location, these strange cacti remained largely unknown until then. Physicists have achieved something quite intriguing in the field of quantum physics. They've created a quantum fractal, a structure that could reveal unusual electron behaviors. Fractals are patterns that repeat themselves at different scales, like how a small part of a cauliflower stalk resembles the entire head. However, in the quantum world, these patterns are rare. Scientists manage to create one by placing carbon monoxide molecules on a copper surface. This caused electrons within the copper to arrange themselves into a Sierpinski triangle, a fractal made up of triangles within triangles. What's intriguing is that electrons within this fractal don't behave like those in our familiar three-dimensional world. They exist in an in-between state, with a fractional number of dimensions, approximately 1.58 in this case. When particles are confined to one or two dimensions in the quantum realm, they exhibit peculiar behaviors. However, the specific behaviors of electrons in fractional dimensions are largely unexplored, offering new opportunities for scientific discovery. Interestingly, the Sierpinski triangle, the quantum fractal created by physicists, bears a resemblance to the iconic Triforce symbol from the popular video game series The Legend of Zelda. Just as the Triforce is made up of three equilateral triangles, the Sierpinski triangle consists of smaller triangles nested within each other. While this may be a coincidence, it's a fascinating connection between the world of quantum physics and the realm of video games, showcasing how patterns and structures can transcend different domains of human imagination and exploration. Feral children, often known as wild children, are individuals who have grown up in extreme isolation from human society, often with little or no exposure to human care, language, or social norms. They are sometimes the subjects of legends and folklore, frequently portrayed as children raised by animals. These children typically lack essential social and language skills acquired through normal human interaction. For instance, they might have difficulty using a toilet, walking upright, or showing interest in human activities. Learning a human language becomes an enormous challenge for them after years of isolation. The existence of a critical period for language learning, as suggested by their struggles, supports the critical period hypothesis. Historically, stories of feral children were limited to myths and legends before the 1600s. However, as science sought to categorize human development and understand the natural world better in the 18th and 19th centuries, philosophers and scientists began to take an interest in these children. They contemplated whether feral children represented a distinct human species. These cases posed a dilemma for psychologists in the 20th century as they tried to distinguish between biological behavior and cultural influence. Numerous documented cases of feral children exist, each with its unique circumstances. For example, there are cases of children raised by primates like weeper, capuchin monkeys, or vervet monkeys, children raised by wolves, dogs, goats, sheep, cattle, and even bears. These stories often involve children living in the wild, adopting the behaviors and habits of the animals they are raised by, and struggling to adapt to human society when discovered. While feral children's stories have fascinated people for centuries, it's important to note that many of these cases are subject to debate and skepticism. 
Some may even be hoaxes or exaggerations. Nonetheless, the study of feral children offers valuable insights into the critical role of human interaction and society in our development. Tulpa, originating in Tibetan Buddhism and later explored in mysticism, refers to a thought-formed being often taking human form. Modern practitioners known as tulpamancers create sentient imaginary friends through intense concentration. This concept is seen more as psychological than paranormal today and played a role in theosophy. The roots of tulpas can be traced to the Buddhist Nirmanakaya, which earthly bodies a Buddha uses for teaching. Western interpretations emerged in the 20th century, independently from Buddhism. Theosophists like Annie Besant classified tulpas into various forms, representing individuals, objects, or emotions. The idea also found its way into Western magic practices. Alexandra David Nail observed tulpa creation in 20th century Tibet. She believed tulpas could gain independence sharing the story of a jolly monk-like tulpa she claimed to have created. However, she also considered her experiences might be illusions. Influenced by media, tulpamancers began using the term to describe willed imaginary friends. Online communities dedicated to tulpas formed with practitioners believing in their sentience. These communities grew in popularity, particularly among fans of My Little Pony, who attempted to create tulpas of characters from the show. Practitioners cite loneliness and social anxiety as motivations for this practice. Some even have romantic interactions with their tulpas, which is a subject of debate. Tulpamancers claim that tulpas can communicate independently with their hosts and sometimes report hallucinations involving their tulpas. Surveys suggest a higher prevalence of neurodiversity among tulpamancers, with conditions like autism, ADD, and ADHD being more common. This might be linked to a desire to combat loneliness. The Tulpamancer subculture on the internet is associated with overcoming loneliness and mental suffering. It's also closely related to reality shifting, a form of self-hypnosis used to escape into a chosen fantasy world. Radiesthesia is the ability to detect radiation emitted by living beings, objects, or geographical features. It's often associated with the use of dowsing rods or pendulums. Despite claims, there's no scientific proof of its existence, making it pseudoscience. The term radiesthesia comes from Latin with radi, referring to light beams, and esthesia to sensory perception. It was coined by French priest Alexis Timothy Bouly, known for detecting unexploded ordnance and molecular changes. Practitioners use their hands, dowsing rods, or pendulums to detect radiation. Teleradiesthesia extends this ability to remote analysis using instruments like pendulums on maps or photos. Radiesthesia finds practical applications, such as diagnosing illnesses, locating underground water and minerals, detecting Earth's currents and fields, finding lost items or people, and analyzing supposed energy fields or auras. Researchers attribute the movement of dowsing rods or pendulums to the ideomotor phenomenon, an involuntary bodily reaction. This movement indicates changes in the subject or object being investigated. Panpsychism is a philosophical concept suggesting that consciousness or a mind-like aspect is inherent in everything. It's an old idea that has been endorsed by various philosophers throughout history. The term panpsychism combines pan, meaning all and, psyche, referring to the mind or soul. It proposes that some form of mentality exists in all entities, not just humans or animals. This idea has taken various forms over time. Some panpsychists attribute attributes like life or spirits to all entities, while modern proponents suggest that basic forms of sentience or subjective experience are present throughout the universe. In contemporary discussions, panpsychism has gained attention due to issues in understanding consciousness and developments in neuroscience, psychology, and quantum physics. It suggests that even fundamental physical entities possess some level of consciousness, although not necessarily in the same way as humans. Various forms of panpsychism exist, including cosmopsychism, 
viewing the cosmos as a unified conscious entity, pan-experientialism, emphasizing that experience is everywhere, and pan-protopsychism, proposing that even basic properties entail consciousness. The death ray, a theoretical concept from the 1920s and 1930s, was a particle beam or electromagnetic weapon. Notable inventors like Guglielmo Marconi, Nikola Tesla, Harry Grindle Matthews, and others claim to have independently invented it. Even as late as 1957, the National Inventors Council was seeking military inventions, including a death ray. While initially a product of fiction, the idea of energy-based weapons inspired real-life counterparts like the United States Navy's laser weapon system, LAWS deployed in 2014, often referred to as a death ray. These are technically known as directed energy weapons. In 1923, Edwin R. Scott claimed to have developed a death ray capable of destroying life and aircraft at a distance. Harry Grindle Matthews tried to sell a similar device in 1924, but without demonstrating a functioning model. Nikola Tesla claimed to have invented a death beam in the 1930s, which he called Teleforce. He argued that it was different from traditional death rays and could transmit immense energy over long distances. Antonio Longoria claimed in 1934 to have a death ray that could kill pigeons from miles away and even a mouse inside a thick walled chamber. During World War II, both the Germans and the Japanese had projects related to death rays involving particle accelerators and microwaves, respectively. The hollow moon hypothesis proposes that the moon is hollow, possibly created by an alien civilization. This idea, sometimes referred to as the spaceship moon hypothesis, is often associated with UFO and ancient astronaut beliefs. The concept of a hollow moon first appeared in science fiction with H.G. Wells' 1901 novel, The First Men in the Moon. The idea of hollow planets had been discussed earlier, with the first mention of a hollow Earth dating back to 1692. The concept of both a hollow moon and hollow Earth is now considered fringe or conspiracy theories. Some claim that the moon's lower density compared to Earth supports the hollow moon theory. However, mainstream science attributes this difference to variations in Earth's composition with a less dense upper mantle and crust compared to its dense iron core. Reports of the moon ringing like a bell during moonquakes, including one caused intentionally by crashing a spacecraft, led some to speculate about a hollow interior. However, further lunar seismology experiments revealed differences in seismic behavior due to variations in texture and density of lunar strata, debunking the idea of a large empty space inside the moon. In 1972, Soviet scientists published a hypothesis suggesting the moon was created by unknown beings. This idea was promoted in the context of ancient astronaut theories during the 1960s and 1970s. Conspiracy theorists have also pointed to the moon's perfect alignment during solar eclipses as evidence of its artificiality. However, mainstream astronomers argue that the alignment is coincidental and similar phenomena occur elsewhere in the solar system. Scientifically, multiple lines of evidence contradict the hollow moon hypothesis. Moment of inertia, parameters, and seismic observations demonstrate that the moon has a solid internal structure with a thin crust, extensive mantle, and a small, denser core. The most widely accepted scientific explanation for the moon's origin is the giant impact hypothesis. This theory suggests that a Mars-sized body collided with Earth, creating a debris ring that eventually formed the moon. While the hollow moon hypothesis has captured imaginations and fueled conspiracy theories, scientific evidence overwhelmingly supports the idea that the moon is a solid celestial body with a complex internal structure formed through natural processes. In recent times, mysterious monoliths have been appearing in different parts of the world. These monoliths are large vertical metal slabs standing 10 to 12 feet tall. They appear suddenly and vanish just as quickly. The first one emerged in the Utah desert in November, followed by similar ones in Romania, California, and New Mexico. 
Their appearance is reminiscent of the monoliths in Stanley Kubrick's movie 2001, a space odyssey, which were placed by aliens to guide human evolution. However, the origin and purpose of these real-life monoliths remain unknown. The Utah monolith, the first of its kind, was discovered in a remote canyon by a helicopter crew counting bighorn sheep. It was deeply embedded in the red rock, and was reported to have been in place since sometime between August 2015 and October 2016. While some saw these monoliths as fascinating art installations, others raised environmental concerns due to the influx of curious visitors. In fact, base jumper Andy Lewis and adventure guide Sylvan Christensen removed the Utah monolith, citing environmental reasons. Subsequently, monoliths appeared in Romania and California, and the California monolith was destroyed by a group of individuals. Local metal artists claimed responsibility for creating and reinstalling the California monolith. The origin of these monoliths is still a mystery. Various theories suggest they could be art installations, a viral marketing campaign, or even leftover props from the HBO series Westworld, as the Utah monolith site is close to filming locations for the show. One theory attributed the Utah monolith to minimalist sculptor John McCracken, but this was later debunked due to inconsistencies in construction. Despite the uncertainty surrounding their origin, these monoliths have captured the public's imagination and generated widespread interest and discussion. Regardless of their origin, these monoliths have become a form of modern art, prompting people to question and engage with their surroundings in a year marked by isolation and challenges. They serve as a reminder that art can transcend boundaries and spark curiosity, even in uncertain times. In the vast expanse of the universe, with its billions of potentially habitable planets, the notion of intelligent extraterrestrial life becomes increasingly plausible. But what sets civilizations apart is their level of technological advancement, and this is where the Kardashev scale comes into play. At the starting point, a Type 0 civilization relies on its local planet's natural resources for energy. They might burn fossil fuels or use other rudimentary sources. They're essentially the newcomers on the cosmic scene. Moving up the scale, a Type 1 civilization harnesses nuclear fusion, a clean and potent energy source. With this, they can power advanced technologies, travel within our solar system, and make significant strides in healthcare and lifespan extension. A Type 2 civilization, also known as a stellar civilization, takes it up a notch. They tap into the energy of nearby stars, possibly using Dyson spheres or other megastructures to capture vast amounts of solar energy. Poverty becomes a thing of the past, and they embark on space colonization. A Type 3 civilization, the Galactic Civilization, extends its reach across the galaxy, harvesting energy from stars near and far. They've also cracked the secrets of anti-gravity, enabling incredible feats like hovering near the sun. Life science reaches its pinnacle, focusing on consciousness extraction and immortality. Type 4, the Universal Civilization, is truly mind-boggling. They harness energy from supernovas, exploding stars, for unimaginable power. Achieving immortality and even creating life are on their agenda. In fact, they might be the creators of civilizations like ours, gods in our myths and religions. A Type 5 civilization, multiversal civilization, explores multiple universes. They seek energy from white holes, theoretical counterparts to black holes. This energy is astronomical, enabling inter-universe travel. But they realize that existence transcends dimensions, leading to a Type 6 civilization, the multi-dimensional civilization, where consciousness exists beyond the confines of our familiar three dimensions. They draw energy from white holes to ascend higher dimensions, gaining godlike powers, including time manipulation. And finally, Type 7, the Creator Civilization. They understand that existence itself is the ultimate force, shaping all matter, energy, and dimensions. They are beyond our comprehension, like gods of gods. The Kardashev scale offers a fascinating glimpse into the potential evolution of civilizations from humble beginnings to unfathomable heights. 
Thomas Townsend Brown stumbled upon an interesting discovery related to certain types of rocks, especially igneous ones. He noticed that these rocks had a consistent and slow electrical potential, unlike the usual pressure or heat-induced electrical effects seen in other materials. Brown conducted experiments in Hawaii using rocks called Kulau Basalt. He wanted to, one, confirm the existence of this rock-related electrical effect, two, make sure it wasn't caused by pressure, heat, or other factors, three, explore how this discovery could be useful. In the first phase of the experiment, he simply wanted to measure the electrical voltage in these rocks without connecting them to any devices. He used a sensitive multimeter for this purpose. Brown received rocks from Hawaii, and they were cleaned thoroughly by boiling them to remove any surface contaminants. He got a large slice of a rock core and some loose rocks. To test these rocks, he applied a special gel to their surfaces and connected them to the multimeter. He made sure not to press too hard on the rocks with the electrodes. The results were somewhat puzzling. It seemed like there were two things happening. Initially, when he touched the rocks, they produced small electrical voltages, which was somewhat expected. However, some rocks continued to produce a steady voltage even after a while, while others did not respond much. The big challenge was figuring out why this was happening. Brown tried to eliminate other possible explanations like pressure or heat, but he couldn't be entirely sure what was causing these electrical effects. It remained a bit of a mystery. The significance of this discovery lies in the fact that certain rocks have a unique electrical property that isn't easily explained. Understanding this property could have practical applications, but at the time of Brown's experiments, those applications remained unclear. It's like finding a piece of a puzzle but not yet knowing where it fits in the bigger picture of science and technology. In ancient China, a unique construction material called sticky rice mortar was created. Unlike the hydraulic mortar used in other places, sticky rice mortar was made from organic materials mixed with inorganic mortar. This innovation, which emerged around 500 CE, combined sticky rice soup with slaked lime to form a composite mortar that was stronger and more water-resistant than traditional lime mortar. Sticky rice mortar became essential in preserving various structures, including the Great Wall, tombs, pagodas, and city walls. It had remarkable adhesive strength, durability, waterproofing properties, and even kept weeds from growing. The combination of sticky rice and burnt lime created a seal between bricks that rivaled the strength of modern cement. During the Ming Dynasty, significant improvements were made in brick-making techniques, both in quantity and quality. Great wall sections were constructed using bricks, reinforced with lime mortar and sticky rice. This reinforcement made the structures resilient against earthquakes and modern equipment like bulldozers while maintaining their integrity. Modern research by chemists revealed that a particular type of complex carbohydrate called amylopectin, found in rice and similar starchy foods, contributed to the strength and durability of sticky rice mortar. This ancient building technique remains a testament to human ingenuity and the use of natural materials in construction. Google ads appearing to predict your thoughts might seem uncanny, but there's a logical explanation. It's not mind reading, but rather a result of data collection and smart algorithms. When you search for something online, click on ads, or even talk about certain topics, Google gathers data about your preferences and interests. Over time, they create a profile of your likes and dislikes. With this profile, Google's algorithms make educated guesses about what you might be interested in. It might seem like they're reading your mind, but they're actually just predicting your preferences based on your past behavior and the behavior of people with similar interests. So while it can feel a bit eerie, it's not magic. It's the power of data and algorithms at work. Speaking of algorithm, you know what to do. A theory of everything, or toe, is like a super theory in physics. It's the dream of finding one single theory that explains everything about our universe. Right now, we have two main theories in physics. One that helps us understand big things like planets and galaxies, that's called general relativity, 
and another one that explains the behavior of tiny particles like atoms and electrons, that's called quantum mechanics. These two theories work great in their own ways, but when we try to use them together, especially in really extreme situations like inside black holes or during the Big Bang, they don't play nicely. So, scientists are on a mission to find a toe that can bring everything together in one neat package. One popular idea is string theory, which says that instead of particles, the tiniest building blocks of the universe are like little vibrating strings. These strings can vibrate at different frequencies, and those vibrations create all the different particles we see. Another approach is loop quantum gravity, which tries to make sense of how gravity and the quantum world can work together. It's like imagining space and time as tiny, choppy bits, rather than smooth and continuous. But here's the catch. Even though scientists are working hard on these ideas, we still don't have a complete toe. There are lots of challenges, like making gravity fit with quantum mechanics and dealing with the idea that there might be many different universes with different rules. So while a theory of everything is a fascinating idea, we're still searching for the final answer in the puzzle of the universe. Researchers have found a clever way to transform ordinary bricks into electricity storage devices. By converting the red pigment in bricks into a plastic that conducts electricity, these brick supercapacitors can store electric charge, unlike traditional batteries. Bricks are ideal for this purpose because their porous structure provides a large surface area for energy storage. The process involves filling the brick pores with acid vapor to dissolve iron oxide, rust, which is then replaced with a sulfur-based material that reacts with iron, resulting in electrically conductive plastic coating the brick surfaces with nanofibers. This nanofiber-coated brick can power LED lights, and around 60 regular-sized bricks can provide emergency lighting for 50 minutes and recharge in 13 minutes. Surprisingly, these supercapacitor bricks can be recharged up to 10,000 times, making them highly durable. This research has effectively repurposed waste material, iron oxide, into a valuable resource for producing advanced construction materials with enhanced capabilities. While this work is groundbreaking in demonstrating energy storage in bricks, other researchers are also exploring different applications of chemically altered bricks, including their use as chemical catalysts and for pollution removal. In the future, researchers aim to increase the energy storage capacity of these bricks by incorporating other semiconductors and developing self-assembling 3D patterns within the bricks, ultimately creating bricks that can be easily assembled like Lego blocks. Artificial wombs, also known as artificial uteri, are devices designed to support the development of a fetus outside the body. These artificial uteri serve various purposes and have raised significant ethical and practical questions. Artificial uteri offer several potential applications. They could aid couples in fetal development, allowing for the transfer of a developing fetus from a natural womb to an artificial one. This could extend the time frame of fetal viability. Additionally, they might facilitate early stage fetal surgeries that would otherwise have to wait until full term pregnancy. In recent years, researchers have made strides in this field. Studies have shown embryos developing for extended periods within artificial uterine environments. However, there are legal restrictions in some countries limiting how long human embryos can be kept in artificial wombs. In 2021, the International Society for Stem Cell Research relaxed the 14-day rule for such research. One significant challenge is replicating the functions of a natural womb. Artificial uteri must provide nutrition, oxygen, and waste disposal for the fetus. Some propose a connection to a woman's circulatory system, allowing her to supply nutrients and immune protection. This approach eliminates potential risks from diseases, pollutants, or substances in the mother's bloodstream. To provide oxygen, techniques like extracorporeal membrane oxygenation ECMO, have been explored. However, there are concerns, particularly in premature fetuses. Nutrition methods are still problematic, and hormonal stability remains a challenge. Researchers are also investigating ways to replicate functions such as the uterine wall, interface, artificial placenta, amniotic sac, and umbilical cord. 
these components are crucial for supporting fetal development. The development of artificial wombs has both bioethical and legal implications. It may redefine the concept of fetal viability and impact abortion laws. Additionally, it could change traditional gender roles in reproduction, allowing greater flexibility for same-sex couples and potentially altering our understanding of parenthood. Nagoro, also known as Nagoro Doll Village, is a unique village situated in the Iya Valley on Shikoku Island, Japan. What sets this place apart is the abundance of lifelike dolls that can be found throughout the village, making it a rather unusual tourist attraction. Once home to around 300 residents, Nagoro's population has significantly declined over the years due to Japan's broader population trends. By September 2019, the village had just 27 inhabitants. The story of Nagoro's doll proliferation begins with Tsukimi Ayano. She returned to Nagoro in the early 2000s to care for her father and created a doll resembling him, placing it in a field. This marked the start of a unique trend. Tsukimi Ayano has since crafted over 400 dolls, including replacements, with approximately 350 of them now residing in the village. These dolls come in various forms, with some replicating actual residents, while others are entirely fictional. Ayano's initiative inspired others in the village to follow suit. Even the local school, which closed in 2012 due to declining enrollment, is now filled with dolls. In one classroom, you can find self-portrait dolls made by the last two students to attend the school, dressed in their own clothes. The dolls are spread throughout Nagoro, creating a surreal atmosphere. You might encounter dolls sitting by a telephone pole, fishing in the river, or waiting at a bus shelter. The village's transformation into a haven for these dolls has turned it into an offbeat tourist destination. Aside from its doll-filled streets, Nagoro is also known for the nearby Nagoro Dam, which has been in operation since 1961 and serves as a source of hydropower generation. In 2020, Nagoro gained additional fame when it was featured in the final episode of the series, James May, Our Man in Japan, where host James May was turned into a scarecrow doll based on his likeness. Thule, a term rooted in ancient Greek and Roman literature, is an enigmatic concept that has taken on various interpretations throughout history. In the classical and medieval eras, Thule was often seen as the farthest, most distant place known to the ancient Greeks and Romans, representing the outer limits of the known world. The Greek explorer Pythias first mentioned Thule in the 4th century BC, describing it in his lost work, On the Ocean. He spoke of a place where there was no proper land, sea, or air, but rather a strange mixture of all three, likening it to a jellyfish-like consistency. Later writers like Geminus of Rhodes claimed that Thule was where the sun went to rest, linking it to polar night phenomena and the midnight sun. However, the actual location of Thule remained elusive. Some identified it with the northern British Isles while others suggested Iceland or Greenland. Even in the late Middle Ages, Thule was thought to be situated in Scandinavia. In more recent times, the term Thule was associated with the northernmost regions of Greenland, where Knud Rasmussen established a post in 1910 and named it Thule. This location later became Thule Air Base. In 2023, Thule Air Base was transferred to the U.S. Space Force and renamed Patufik Space Base. The mystery surrounding Thule continues to captivate, with its historical connections and shifting interpretations providing rich material for literature and exploration. Early human ancestors might have survived harsh winters by hibernating, similar to bears, bats, and hedgehogs. Fossil evidence from a significant site in Spain indicates that early humans coped with extreme cold by slowing down their metabolisms and sleeping for months. Lesions and damage in fossilized bones of these ancestors align with those found in the bones of hibernating animals. This suggests that our predecessors adapted to ferocious winters hundreds of thousands of years ago by hibernating to conserve energy and survive with limited food supplies. 
The excavation site, Cima de los Huesos, located near Burgos in northern Spain, has yielded fossilized remains of humans dating back over 400,000 years. These remains show seasonal variations in bone growth, indicating disruptions in bone development for several months each year. The researchers proposed that early humans entered metabolic states similar to hibernation, enabling them to endure extended periods of frigid conditions and food scarcity. The disruption in bone development recorded this process. Although the idea of early humans hibernating may sound like science fiction, many mammals, including primates, exhibit similar behavior. This suggests that the genetic basis and physiology for such a hypometabolism could be preserved in various mammalian species, including humans. The pattern of lesions found in the human bones at Cima de los Huesos resembles those in bones of hibernating mammals, such as cave bears. Researchers believe hibernation was a survival strategy for early humans enduring harsh winter conditions, similar to cave bears. Counter-arguments have been examined, including the fact that modern Inuit and Sami people living in cold conditions do not hibernate. However, these populations have access to fatty fish and reindeer fat during winter, which provided sufficient food to eliminate the need for hibernation. In contrast, the area around Cima de los Huesos half a million years ago likely did not provide enough fat-rich food, leading early humans to resort to cave hibernation to survive. While the idea of early humans hibernating sparks debate, further research is needed to explore alternative explanations for bone variations found at the site and to examine genetic evidence related to torpor, a state similar to hibernation. In 1990, a peculiar stone called the Sky Stone was discovered in Sierra Leone, West Africa, by geologist and archaeologist Angelo Pitoni. Tests conducted in various research laboratories worldwide confirmed that this bluestone was unlike any known natural rock. It appeared to be artificial. The stone resembled pure turquoise and was unlike any other gemstone known to man. It was a unique crystal found in Sierra Leone's diamond fields. Years later, an American artist and designer named Jared Collins encountered this mysterious stone during a gem and mineral sourcing trip to Asia. Even though he was initially skeptical, he sent a sample to Dr. Preeti at GRS Swiss Labs for testing. Dr. Preeti couldn't identify the composition of the stone, describing it as unidentifiable. While he suspected the blue color might be organic, he couldn't determine its origin. The Sky Stone's composition was eventually revealed to be 77% oxygen, along with traces of carbon, silicon, calcium, and sodium. This composition made it similar to concrete or stucco and suggested artificial coloring. Interestingly, the stone was known to the natives in the area where it was found, as it occasionally surfaced during digging. Even more intriguing, it was consistently discovered in soil layers dating back to at least 12,000 BC. The origins of the Sky Stone remain a mystery, sparking speculations about an advanced civilization lost in time. It's a fascinating enigma that has left experts and enthusiasts pondering its true nature. A 1000-year-old Buddha statue held a remarkable secret, an ancient mummy. The statue, displayed at the Drents Museum in the Netherlands, was examined at the Meander Medical Center in the Dutch town of Amersfoort. Modern medical technology uncovered this hidden mystery. Radiologists performed a full-body CT scan and DNA tests were conducted. What they discovered inside was astonishing. Instead of organs, the mummy's body contained ancient Chinese characters printed on paper and other unidentified rotted materials. How the organs were removed from the mummy remains unknown. The mummy is believed to be that of Buddhist master Lu Quan, a member of the Chinese meditation school, who lived around AD 1100. One theory is that he underwent the gruesome process of self-mummification, a practice followed by some monks in Japan and other parts of Asia. This process involved a strict diet that gradually starved the body, followed by being buried alive in an underground chamber. Monks hoped to achieve self-mummification to become revered, living Buddhas. If successful, the mummified body was venerated. If not, an exorcism was performed, and the monk was reburied. 
Today, mummified monks like Lu Quan are considered by some Buddhists to be in a deep meditative state called Tuk Dam. While self-mummification was rarely successful, some cases like Lu Quan's continue to amaze and intrigue us, shedding light on the remarkable practices of the past. An organoid is a three-dimensional miniature version of an organ created in a lab. It replicates the key functions and biological complexity of a real organ. Organoids are grown from a small number of cells, typically derived from tissues, embryonic stem cells, or induced pluripotent stem cells. These cells can self-organize and differentiate to mimic the structure and function of the target organ. The technique for growing organoids has rapidly advanced since the early 2010s, making it one of the notable scientific achievements of 2013. Scientists and engineers use organoids for various purposes, including studying development and diseases, drug discovery, personalized medicine, gene and cell therapies, tissue engineering, and regenerative medicine. The history of organoid development traces back to early experiments with mechanically dissociated cells from organisms like sponges, amphibians, and embryonic chicks. These cells could re-aggregate and self-organize to form whole organisms. Over time, researchers explored the potential of stem cells to form organs in vitro. The shift from culturing stem cells in 2D to 3D media allowed for the development of complex three-dimensional organ structures. Since 1987, Various methods have been devised to culture organoids using different types of stem cells to generate organoids resembling a wide range of organs. These developments have led to significant physiological functionality of organoids in vitro and in vivo. Organoids have been successfully created for various organs such as the brain, cerebral organoids, gastrointestinal tract, intestinal organoids, stomach, gastric organoids, tongue, lingual organoids, thyroid, thymus, testes, prostate, liver, pancreas, lungs, kidneys, and more. Each type of organoid serves as a valuable model for studying specific organ functions, diseases, and potential treatments. These miniature organs are formed by culturing stem cells or progenitor cells in a 3D medium, typically using extracellular matrix hydrogels like matrigal. Depending on the desired organoid type, Stem cells are differentiated and patterned to develop specific characteristics. Organoids can be used to model diseases, study cellular interactions, and test the effects of drugs. They offer a unique opportunity for personalized medicine, as they can be created from patient cells to understand individual responses to treatments. Organoids represent a significant advancement in the field of biology and medicine, allowing scientists to study organs and diseases in a controlled laboratory environment and potentially revolutionizing personalized medicine. Xenobots are synthetic life forms designed by computers using biological tissues and inspired by the African clawed frog. They're less than one millimeter wide and made of skin and heart muscle cells derived from frog embryos. These tiny xenobots can walk, swim, carry payloads, and even work together to clean up debris. They're designed in simulations through trial and error and have unique abilities, like self-healing. Xenobots are biodegradable, making them potentially useful for environmental applications. They could gather microplastics in the ocean, reducing pollution, in medicine, xenobots made from a patient's cells might be used for tasks like plaque removal from arteries or targeted drug delivery. These tiny organisms created with AI and biology raise questions about what defines life and could have a significant impact on science and technology. The Silurian Hypothesis is a concept proposed by astrophysicists Adam Frank and Gavin Schmidt in 2018. It explores the idea of detecting evidence of an advanced civilization that existed on Earth before humans. While they consider it unlikely, they ponder the possibility of finding traces of such a civilization in the geological record. Frank and Schmidt argue that there has been enough fossil carbon to fuel an industrial civilization since the Carboniferous period, which was approximately 350 million years ago. 
However, finding direct evidence like technological artifacts is unlikely due to the rarity of fossilization and the limited exposed surface of Earth. Instead, researchers might find indirect evidence such as climate changes, anomalies in sediment, or traces of nuclear waste. The hypothesis also speculates that artifacts from past civilizations could be found on celestial bodies like the Moon and Mars, where erosion and tectonic activity are less likely to erase evidence. In popular culture, similar ideas have been explored in science fiction novels, television shows, and stories. For example, the Silurians from Doctor Who are a fictional species that established an advanced civilization on Earth before humans. Other works of fiction have also delved into the concept of pre-human civilizations and the challenges of finding their remnants. This thought experiment raises intriguing questions about the potential existence of advanced civilizations in Earth's distant past and the difficulties in detecting their presence. Spontaneous remission, also known as spontaneous healing or spontaneous regression, refers to the unexpected improvement or cure from a disease that typically progresses, especially in cases of cancer. These terms are often used interchangeably. In simple terms, spontaneous remission from cancer is when a malignant tumor partially or completely disappears without any treatment or with treatment that is considered inadequate to influence the disease significantly. For a long time, it was believed that spontaneous regressions or cures from cancer were very rare, estimated at around 1 in 100,000 cases. However, this estimation might not be entirely accurate due to various factors. Not all cases of spontaneous regression are well documented or reported, and some patients may have stopped seeking medical attention. Additionally, the influence of previous treatments on these cases can't always be ruled out. Recent studies have suggested that the frequency of spontaneous regression in small tumors may have been underestimated. For example, in a study on breast cancer, it was found that 22% of cases underwent spontaneous regression. The exact causes of spontaneous regression from cancer remain largely unknown and complex. Some cases may involve hormonal influences, while others suggest the involvement of the immune system. Apoptosis, programmed cell death, and angiogenesis, the growth of new blood vessels, have been discussed as possible factors, but they typically require specific triggers and are often dysfunctional in cancer cells. Interestingly, there are reports of cancer regression occurring after a fever brought on by infection, hinting at a potential connection between infections and spontaneous regression. However, more research is needed to confirm this relationship through epidemiological studies. Schrodinger's cat is a famous thought experiment in quantum mechanics. Imagine a cat in a sealed box with a flask of poison and a radioactive source. If the source decays, it triggers the release of poison, which would kill the cat. According to quantum mechanics, until we open the box and observe, the cat is both alive and dead simultaneously. This paradox was devised by physicist Erwin Schrödinger in 1935 to highlight the issues with the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, which suggests that quantum systems exist in superpositions until observed. In this case, the cat is in a superposition of alive and dead states until someone looks inside. While it may sound absurd, Schrödinger's cat has been essential in discussions about quantum mechanics interpretations. It's not about actually putting a cat in such a situation, but rather illustrating the bizarre nature of quantum behavior at the macroscopic level. Various interpretations have been proposed, including the Copenhagen interpretation, where observation collapses the superposition, and the many worlds interpretation, where both outcomes exist in parallel universes. Some theories involve conscious observers, while others focus on the environment's role in collapsing superpositions. Despite being a thought experiment, experiments with smaller particles have demonstrated quantum superpositions, but applying the concept to a cat-sized object remains a significant technical challenge. Schrodinger's cat continues to challenge our understanding of the quantum world and its connection to our macroscopic reality. The claustrum is a mysterious area in the brain that connects extensively with the cortex, responsible for complex thinking. 
It was once thought to be the center of consciousness, but recent research suggests a different role. Scientists at the University of Maryland propose that the claustrum acts more like a high-speed internet router. It receives executive commands from various parts of the brain responsible for complex thoughts and forms networks in the cortex. This router-like function helps coordinate different networks in the brain, allowing us to perform various complex tasks in everyday life. Understanding how the claustrum works is crucial, as disorganized networks are associated with conditions like addiction, Alzheimer's, and schizophrenia. Insights from this research could lead to better therapies for these disorders. Experiments on animals and humans have challenged the old theory. Turning off the claustrum in conscious mice didn't make them lose consciousness. However, they couldn't perform difficult tasks with the claustrum turned off. Functional MRI brain scans on humans showed that the claustrum only activated during complex tasks, coinciding with the activation of networks related to optimal cognitive performance. This challenges the idea that the claustrum is responsible for consciousness. Further experiments will determine if this new theory holds, potentially providing a conceptual framework for developing new therapeutic strategies to address cognitive decline in various disorders. Techno-animism is a cultural practice that imbues technology with human and spiritual qualities. It suggests that technology, humanity, and religion can merge into a single entity. This concept is rooted in the Shinto religion and is observed in Japan and DIY culture. In Shinto, deities often symbolize physical objects, and their statues take human forms, fostering a deep connection between people and objects. This practice emphasizes the interaction between humans and non-human entities, promoting harmony between humans and nature. Techno-animism extends these ideas to technology, infusing it with human and spiritual attributes. It is reflected in the design of objects and how people interact with them, allowing new technology to integrate with traditional values. In the DIY and maker culture, techno-animism is observed through material engagement and postmodern ideas of animism. Objects can embody human-like traits, blurring the line between technology and humanity. Examples of techno-animism include robots like Honda's Asimo, designed with human-like appearances, and the ability to communicate with humans. In Japan, robots are used in various roles, from conversation partners to companions with intimate qualities, challenging traditional concepts of human exclusivity in these domains. In certain places like a restaurant in Shinjuku, Tokyo, robots serve as waiters, replacing human interaction with machines. This reflects the acceptance of technology as an integral part of human society. Japanese culture and legislation support techno-animism, which has contributed to Japan's status as a hub of technological innovation. Acceptance of this concept is deeply ingrained in both cultural and legal aspects of Japanese society. Ormus, also known as Ormis or M-state materials, is a fictional group of substances that supposedly possess extraordinary properties like healing abilities and superconductivity at room temperature. These materials were claimed to be discovered in 1975 by David Hudson, a cotton farmer from Arizona. According to the concept, Ormus consists of precious metals like gold, platinum, and iridium in a unique state where they exist as individual atoms without forming bonds or crystals. It's also believed to be the essence of life or the soul of all living beings, and can form a gelatinous substance when mixed with water. Here are some of the claimed abilities of Ormus. Curing various diseases including cancer and AIDS. Correcting errors in DNA. Acting as a superconductor. Emitting gamma radiation. Partially levitating in the Earth's magnetic field. Reading a person's mind. Having a different way ability than mass being fused into transparent glass, acting as a flash powder creating light explosions, regenerating severed cattails. David Hudson spent a significant amount of money to obtain Ormus samples and even secured a British patent in 1989, which expired in 1993. However, many scientific errors and misunderstandings are associated with the Ormus concept. 
Misinterpretation of scientific publications related to nuclear chemistry. Incorrect claims about the chemical properties of precious metals. Lack of understanding of chemical bonding in metals. Erroneous statements about materials with different inertial and gravitational masses. Unrealistic explanations for the superconductivity of certain materials. Baseless claims about precious metals having important biological functions. In reality, Hudson's patented procedures for obtaining Ormus do not work, and the material produced does not possess the claimed properties. The concept has been exploited by quacks who sell various Ormus preparations, often containing no actual precious metals and having no scientific basis. Ormus enthusiasts have also connected it to numerous pseudoscientific ideas and magical powers. In summary, Ormus is a fictional and scientifically unfounded concept with extravagant claims that have no basis in reality. It has been widely discredited in the scientific community. Orgone, a concept originating from the 1930s by Wilhelm Reich and further developed by Charles Kelly, is a pseudo-scientific idea. It's described as an esoteric energy or a hypothetical universal life force. Orgone was envisioned as a creative force present in all of nature, similar to other concepts like Mesmer's animal magnetism, Karl Reichenbach's odic force, and Henri Bergson's Elon Vital. This concept proposed that orgone was a weightless, omnipresent substance, closely associated with living energy. It could supposedly organize matter on all scales from microscopic units, referred to as bions in orgone theory, to large structures like organisms, clouds, or galaxies. Wilhelm Reich believed that deficiencies or blockages in bodily orgone were responsible for many diseases, particularly cancer in a way similar to how Freudian theory linked neuroses to issues in libido. Reich established the Orgone Institute in the 1940s to research orgone energy and its potential medical applications. He designed special orgone energy accumulators to study orgone and enhance overall health and vitality. However, the US Food and Drug Administration FDA, later intervened, banning the distribution of orgone-related materials due to false and misleading claims. Reich was even imprisoned and his orgone materials were destroyed. Despite these controversies, some of Reich's students and later generations of scientists in Germany continued to explore the orgone hypothesis. Still, there is no empirical support for orgone in medicine or the physical sciences, and research into the concept ceased. The Institute for Organomic Science in New York, founded in 1982, keeps Reich's work alive but lacks scientific recognition. Musica Universalis, also known as the music of the spheres or harmony of the spheres, is an ancient philosophical concept. It suggests that the movements of celestial bodies, such as the sun, moon, and planets, create a kind of music through their proportions. This idea originated in ancient Greece and was a fundamental aspect of Pythagoreanism. It was later developed by the 16th century astronomer Johannes Kepler. The concept revolves around the belief that mathematical relationships express qualities or tones of energy in numbers, visual angles, shapes, and sounds, all interconnected within a pattern of proportion. Pythagoras initially observed that the pitch of a musical note is inversely related to the length of the string producing it, and he proposed that celestial bodies emitted unique sounds based on their orbital motion. These celestial sounds, however, are beyond human hearing. This idea linked mathematics, astronomy, and music as interconnected disciplines, with Plato noting that astronomy and music were twin studies. Aristotle, while considering this theory, pointed out the paradox of why we couldn't hear this celestial music given the immense movements of celestial bodies. Bathius categorized three types of music. Musica mundana, universal music of the cosmos, musica humana, music within the human body, and musica instrumentalis, music produced by singers and instrumentalists. Bathius believed that musica mundana could only be grasped through intellectual understanding, Johannes Kepler, in his work Harmonica's Mundi, Harmony of the Worlds, explored the relationship between music and astronomy. 
He posited that musical intervals and harmonies describe the motions of planets, even though these harmonies are inaudible. Kepler believed that the soul could perceive this celestial harmony and experience a sense of bliss. His work laid out the connection between geometry, astronomy, and music, suggesting an intelligent arrangement of the planets by a Christian-centric creator. Kepler's theories related the speeds and orbits of planets to musical concepts, highlighting how the variations in speed produce different notes. He even suggested that the solar system had a harmonious composition of planetary voices, which had sung in Concord at the beginning of time. Despite some inaccuracies in Kepler's work, he remained convinced of the existence of the music of the spheres, reflecting his deep faith in a creator who orchestrated the cosmos in a harmonious manner. This ancient concept continues to inspire modern culture, including literature, music, and even video games, where references to the music of the spheres appear as a source of artistic and philosophical inspiration. In ancient history, there's an intriguing concept called root races. This idea suggests that Earth goes through cycles where new intelligent races appear and eventually disappear due to natural catastrophes or self-destructive tendencies. This notion has been part of Hinduism for a long time. Root races are divided into seven sub-races with different ethnicities, starting their civilizations at various locations worldwide. Each root race goes through four ages, the Golden Age marked by peace and harmony, the Silver Age with slight dilution of the Golden Age's virtues, the Copper Age characterized by wars and egoism, and the Iron Age of strife and destruction. The first root race, known as the Polar Aryans or Protoplasmic race, was profoundly different from modern humans. They existed at the North Pole and had semi-ethereal bodies, allowing them to change their physical appearance and survive without solid food. They communicated telepathically, had no spoken language, and valued ethics and emotional integrity above all else. Polar Aryans did not wage wars, and betrayal was considered the gravest offense. They reproduced asexually and gradually melted away to become part of their offspring. They were not destroyed by a cataclysm but lived indefinitely, passing their intelligence and compassion to future root races. Their goal was to develop these qualities within their genome a goal they successfully achieved. Sonoluminescence is a peculiar phenomenon where light is emitted from collapsing bubbles in a liquid when subjected to sound waves. It was first observed in 1934 at the University of Cologne during sonar experiments. The effect occurs when a strong sound wave makes a gas-filled cavity in a liquid collapse rapidly, resulting in the release of a burst of light. This phenomenon can be observed in two forms, stable single-bubble sonoluminescence, SBSL, and multi-bubble sonoluminescence, MBSL. Researchers initially proposed that sonoluminescence is of thermal origin, possibly caused by microshocks within collapsing bubbles. Later experiments revealed that the temperature inside the bubble during SBSL can reach extraordinarily high levels, up to thousands of kelvins. Despite extensive research, the exact mechanism behind sonoluminescence remains a mystery. Several hypotheses have been put forth, including hotspot, bremsstrahlung, and collision-induced radiation. Some even suggested the possibility of temperatures so high that they could lead to thermonuclear fusion, although this idea has faced skepticism from the scientific community. Interestingly, sonoluminescence has been observed in nature, with the pistol shrimp being the first known instance of an animal producing light through this phenomenon. These shrimp create cavitation bubbles by snapping their claws, which release intense acoustic pressures and heat, stunning or killing prey. Reality shifting, a trend gaining traction online, involves the belief that individuals can alter their reality through focused visualization. Shifting enthusiasts claim to enter their desired reality, often fictional places like Hogwarts from Harry Potter. While it resembles lucid dreaming, reality shifting involves consciously changing one's surroundings, while lucid dreaming focuses on becoming aware of being in a dream. Astral projection, another related concept, 
centers on separating one's consciousness from the physical body to explore non-physical realms. Both astral projection and reality shifting fall into the category of transliminal experiences situated between the conscious and unconscious mind, differentiating them from lucid dreaming, which stays within the realm of dreams. Despite its popularity, there's no scientific basis for reality shifting, it remains a largely unexplained phenomenon. To engage in reality shifting, people often create detailed scripts outlining their desired reality and create a calm environment conducive to focusing thoughts. Grounding exercises like turning off lights and playing meditative music can help maintain focus. Methods like the Raven and Alice in Wonderland are also recommended. Shifting enthusiasts describe symptoms indicating a shift, such as limb weightlessness, floating sensations, dizziness, and detachment from the body. Different types of shifts like mini-shifts, small differences in reality, perma-shifting, staying in an alternate reality indefinitely, and respawning, leaving behind all memories of the original reality, are discussed in the online shifting community. While there's no real physical danger in attempting to shift, it may have emotional and psychological consequences. For individuals with strong imaginations, shifting can exacerbate disassociation tendencies, potentially interfering with daily functioning. Some use psychoactive substances to achieve the effects, which can be dangerous. Online communities that promote reality shifting often lack scientific grounding and may spread misinformation and harmful beliefs. In analytical psychology, the shadow is an unconscious part of the personality that clashes with one's ideal self, leading to resistance and projection. The shadow represents unacknowledged emotions and is projected onto archetypes or image complexes within the collective unconscious. The shadow evolves in parallel with the ego and its defenses, making it a psychological blind spot. It results from repressing the ID, preventing the integration of the ID and ego. While Freud and Jung differed on the role of ID repression, they converged on the idea that the shadow symbolizes suppressed aspects of the self. The shadow is projected onto the external world as cognitive distortions, manifesting as negative traits or behaviors. However, it can also conceal positive aspects, especially in individuals with low self-esteem, anxiety, or false beliefs. Identifying and integrating these hidden aspects can be essential for personal growth. If the projection of the shadow remains suppressed, it can gain autonomy and impact one's psyche, affecting the ID and ego. The shadow can act as a symbolic barrier between the ego and the ego less real, isolating and diluting individuals in society. The collective shadow represents shared unconscious ideals and often associates with feelings of helplessness, it can be personified as the devil, symbolizing overwhelming emotions and negative experiences. Collective shadows can influence in-group and out-group dynamics, potentially leading to dehumanization or hate crimes. The shadow can appear in dreams as a person of the same sex as the dreamer, reflecting individual experiences. It develops in response to personal life events and may also carry collective values. Interpreting the shadow in dreams can provide insights into one's inner conflicts, desires, and intentions. Jung proposed that the shadow might consist of multiple layers, with the top layers containing personal experiences and the deeper layers housing archetypes that form the basis of human experiences. Merging with the shadow can have negative consequences, with the suppressed ID attempting to control the ego. Individuation, a central concept in Jungian psychology, involves confronting the shadow as a crucial step. It can lead to a crisis in which the ego and persona break down, allowing the shadow to emerge. This process requires courage and strength, but may result in personal growth and integration. Assimilating the shadow involves comprehending and acknowledging its existence. This process can expand consciousness and pave the way for further individuation. Recognizing and integrating the shadow is a continuous, lifelong process, allowing for personal development and a deeper understanding of the self. Omnism is the belief in and respect for all religions. People who hold this belief are known as omnists. 
It's similar to syncretism, which involves merging different faiths, but omnism is more about acknowledging the legitimacy of all religions without necessarily subscribing to each one's teachings. In modern usage, omnism is often seen as accepting the legitimacy of all religions and believing in a single transcendent purpose that unites all things or people. Omnists believe that various religions contain elements of a common truth, and they are open to insights from different faiths. Notable omnists include Philip James Bailey, Ellen Burstyn, John Coltrane, Kyrie Irving, Chris Martin, Shaquille O'Neal, and Ramakrishna, each of whom had their own reasons for embracing omnism. In the realm of physics, there are four fundamental forces that govern all interactions in nature, gravity, electromagnetism, strong nuclear force, and weak nuclear force. Yet, some scientific theories suggest the existence of a mysterious fifth force, distinct from the known quartet. This hypothetical force, if it exists, comes in various forms, with varying strengths and ranges. The quest for this elusive fifth force has intensified recently due to perplexing cosmic discoveries. First, there's dark matter, an enigmatic substance constituting most of the universe's mass. While many believe it's composed of undiscovered particles, others speculate it could be linked to an unknown fundamental force. Second, the universe's expansion is accelerating, attributed to a phenomenon called dark energy. Some physicists theorize that quintessence, a form of dark energy, might be this elusive fifth force. Detecting a fifth force poses challenges. Just as gravity acts weakly on smaller objects, this force might be feeble, making it hard to observe. In the late 1980s, researchers reported a potential fifth force, but subsequent experiments failed to confirm it. There are three key approaches to search for the fifth force. The equivalence principle tests involve comparing it to the strong equivalence principle, a fundamental tenet of general relativity. A fifth force might manifest as deviations in solar system orbits, measured through experiments like lunar laser ranging. Another form of the fifth force arises from theories with extra dimensions, like Kaluza-Klein theory. This Yukawa force is transmitted by a light scalar field, and experiments aim to detect deviations from the inverse square law of gravity on small scales. Some experiments focus on the Earth's mantle, using geoelectrons as giant particle detectors, while others examine pulsation rates of kephide variable stars. Yet despite these efforts, there's no conclusive evidence for the existence of the fifth force. In 2015, researchers proposed the existence of a new lightweight boson called the X-17 particle, indicating a possible fifth force. Subsequent experiments provided further support for its existence, but the quest for concrete proof continues. In the world of physics, the enigmatic fifth force remains a tantalizing mystery, challenging scientists to explore the boundaries of our understanding of the fundamental forces that govern the universe. Virus is an unconventional belief system, merging philosophy, science, technology, politics, and religion into a single concept. It was conceived to compete with established religions and introduce unique ideas that could ensure human survival and evolution. Its core principle is adaptation, aiming to continuously integrate better concepts while securing the longevity of its followers. This ideology asserts that everything in existence forms interconnected systems, and evolution is a pervasive force, not limited to biology but extending to various aspects of life, including culture and the universe itself. According to Virus, the meaning of life lies in the impact one has on the world and its people, rather than serving a higher authority. Virus encourages critical thinking, rational action, empathy, and broad perspectives as essential virtues. It challenges dogmatic faith, apathy, and hypocrisy as senseless sins that hinder progress and understanding. The peculiar name, Virus, was deliberately chosen to be provocative, signifying its intention to infect minds with its ideas. Within the Church of Virus, certain individuals are recognized as saints, including Hypatia of Alexandria, Charles Darwin, and Alan Turing, for their contributions to knowledge and human advancement. 
The curse of knowledge is a cognitive bias, where someone communicating assumes others share their information and background, leading to misunderstandings. This bias can be problematic in teaching, where experienced instructors may struggle to relate to the difficulties of their students, making learning less effective. This concept was coined in 1989 by economists studying information asymmetry. They found that well-informed parties often couldn't exploit their advantage optimally in deals. For example, if one party knows more about what's being divided, they should make the same offer regardless of the amount. However, they tend to offer more when the amount is larger. Experimental evidence shows how the curse of knowledge affects people's perceptions. In one study, participants who were tapping out well-known songs overestimated how many listeners would recognize the tune, assuming others had the same knowledge. In education, this bias can hinder effective teaching, as teachers may struggle to see material from the perspective of students. It's important for teachers to understand what's verified with students rather than relying solely on their own knowledge. In computer programming, it can lead to code that's clear to the programmer but confusing to others. User interface design can also suffer from this bias, with engineers creating interfaces that make sense to them but not to end users. To overcome the curse of knowledge, it's crucial to consider the perspective of others, especially when teaching, communicating, or designing for a broader audience. Reflecting on the curse of knowledge, I sometimes find myself in a curious predicament. It's as if I've suddenly arrived in my own life at the current point in time. I can recall memories, and in some cases I understand the reasoning behind the choices I made and actions I took in those moments. However, in many of these memories, I'm left perplexed, wondering why I made certain decisions. It's almost like experiencing the curse of knowledge on a personal level, pitting my present understanding against my past self. This introspective journey serves as a reminder that the curse of knowledge isn't just an external bias affecting communication and comprehension, it can also influence our own perceptions of our past decisions. Just as teachers must strive to see material from their students' perspectives, perhaps we too should strive to understand our past selves with a bit more empathy and humility. Some individuals have reported experiences with psychoactive substances that lead them to believe in the existence of parallel realities. When discussing salvia and DMT, people often describe their experiences in terms of these alternate realities. Salvia, they say, seems to exist independently of the individual's consciousness. It's always there, evolving and ongoing, even when the person is not using the substance. Smoking salvia is described as a journey to salvia land, where entities exist eternally in an alien place. On the other hand, DMT is seen as creating a new reality known as hyperspace when smoked. While in DMT hyperspace, individuals feel like they are in an alternate reality, and it becomes their subjective reality during that time. However, once the DMT effects wear off, hyperspace folds back into the depths of the mind. Salvia land entities are perceived as real, eternal, and possibly an extension of the self, while DMT entities are seen as alien entities living within the mind, waiting to be unleashed when hyperspace is opened. These experiences are subjective and open to interpretation, with some users emphasizing the differences between salvia and DMT, while others explore the possibility of combining these substances to explore new aspects of reality. The Makalo effect is a curious phenomenon of human visual perception. It occurs when colorless patterns appear colored depending on the orientation of those patterns. To observe this effect, one must first induce it by looking at specific patterns. For instance, alternately gazing at a red horizontal pattern and a green vertical one for a few minutes can make a black and white horizontal pattern appear greenish, while a black and white vertical pattern may look pinkish. This effect is intriguing because it can last for quite some time, up to 2.8 months when testing exposure is limited. Discovered by psychologist Celeste McCullough in 1965, the phenomenon is induced by staring at specific patterns such as horizontal and vertical lines with differently colored backgrounds. After several minutes of gazing at these patterns, when you look back at the original pattern, the colors appear to have changed. 
initially reported to last for an hour or more, repeated testing of the effect diminishes its duration. However, if the induction is done and testing is delayed by up to 2.8 months, the effect can persist. This effect is distinct from typical afterimages because it depends on the orientation of the patterns. The Makala effect is specific to the region of the retina exposed to the induction stimuli. It can also spread along the contours of the test stimuli. The effect is most pronounced when the thickness of the bars in the induction stimuli matches that of the test stimuli. Complementary colors, such as red and green, enhance the effect. Interestingly, similar after-effects have been observed in various perceptual domains, not just related to color and orientation. These phenomena are collectively known as Makala effects MEs. Explanations for the Makala effect include color adaptation in lower visual cortex regions, the concept of an error-correcting device in the brain, and classical conditioning mechanisms. These theories aim to understand how the brain processes these perceptual changes. In 2008, a related phenomenon called the anti macalo effect was discovered. It involves inducing after-effects using pairs of patterns with slightly different characteristics, and the resulting after-effect is different from the classic macalo effect. This anti macalo effect appears to occur in higher brain regions and is distinct in several ways from the original effect, including complete interocular transfer. The hum is a puzzling phenomenon experienced as a persistent, low-frequency humming, rumbling, or droning noise by some individuals but not all. These mysterious sounds have been reported globally, including in the United States, the United Kingdom, Australia, and Canada. They are often named after the specific locations where they've gained attention, like the Taos Hum in New Mexico and the Windsor Hum in Ontario. The hum isn't a single phenomenon, it has various potential causes. Some attribute it to local mechanical sources, frequently stemming from industrial facilities, while others suspect it may be related to tinnitus or other biological auditory effects. In a study from 1973, researchers examined 50 cases of people complaining about a low throbbing background noise. This sound, typically peaking between 30 and 40 hertz, was mainly heard during cool weather with a light breeze, often in the early morning, and usually within a 10 kilometer wide area. Research into the Taos hum in New Mexico in the early 1990s revealed that approximately 2% of people could hear it. Each hearer perceived the hum at different frequencies, ranging from 32 hertz to 80 hertz. Some individuals reported being able to move away from the sound, with one person claiming its range extended up to 30 miles. In 2006, recordings from Auckland, New Zealand seemed to capture the Auckland hum, which appeared to resonate at around 56 hertz. In Windsor, Ontario, a loud droning vibration, sometimes irritatingly loud, was reported in 2011. This noise was traced to Zug Island, an industrial area, and ceased when the nearby steel mill's blast furnaces were deactivated in April 2020. Similar hums have been reported in other places worldwide, including Germany and Missouri. Notably, the hum often subsides when it receives increased media coverage, suggesting it might have an anthropogenic source. Explanations for the hum vary. Some believe it's linked to tinnitus, a self-reported auditory disturbance, while others speculate it could be related to spontaneous autoacoustic emissions, SOAE, produced by human ears. SOAEs are faint internal noises generated by the auditory and nervous systems. Additionally, there have been proposals connecting the hum to natural phenomena, such as the jet stream's interaction with slower moving air, or the sounds produced by certain fish species like the midshipman fish. The hum remains a mysterious and perplexing oddity of life, with its origins and causes continuing to elude a definitive explanation. The Gansfeld effect, often called perceptual deprivation, is a perceptual phenomenon that occurs when a person is exposed to an unstructured uniform field of stimulation. This effect arises because the brain amplifies neural noise in an attempt to find missing visual signals. This amplified noise is then processed in the higher visual cortex, leading to hallucinations. 
One of the most studied aspects of the Gansfeld effect involves vision, where individuals stare at an undifferentiated and uniform field of color. This can result in a peculiar experience often described as seeing black, which creates a sensation of apparent blindness. When the Gansfeld stimulation flickers, it can produce geometric patterns and colors, which forms the basis for devices like mind machines and dream machines. Expanding on the Gansfeld effect, there's a multimodal variation known as multimodal Gansfeld, where individuals use Gansfeld goggles and headphones with a uniform stimulus to induce the effect in multiple senses. Sensory deprivation is a related phenomenon, although it involves minimizing sensory input rather than providing an unstructured one. Prolonged sensory deprivation can lead to hallucinations similar to those caused by the Gansfeld effect, including sensations of light flashes or colors which may evolve into complex scenes. The Gansfeld effect has a history dating back to ancient times. For instance, Pythagoras's followers sought wisdom through visions in pitch black caves, a practice known as the prisoner's cinema. Miners trapped in dark conditions often reported hallucinations and sightings of ghosts. Even Arctic explorers, surrounded by featureless expanses of white snow for extended periods, reported experiencing hallucinations and altered states of consciousness. In the 1930s, psychologist Wolfgang Metzger conducted research that showed consistent hallucinations and changes in electroencephalograms when subjects gazed into featureless visual fields, contributing to the understanding of the Gansfeld effect. This effect has also been used in parapsychological experiments, particularly in the Gansfeld experiment, where it is modified for research purposes. The Antikythera mechanism is an ancient Greek analog computer from the 2nd century BC. It's considered the oldest known example of its kind and was used for predicting astronomical positions and eclipses as well as tracking a four-year cycle of athletic games. This remarkable artifact was discovered in 1901 among the wreckage of a shipwreck off the Greek island of Antikythera. It was initially found as one lump but later separated into 82 fragments, with four containing gears and many others bearing inscriptions. In 2008, advanced imaging techniques revealed that the mechanism had 37 meshing bronze gears, enabling it to track the movements of the moon and the sun, predict eclipses, and model the moon's irregular orbit. Some speculate it might have also calculated the positions of the five classical planets. The device is believed to have been created by Hellenistic scientists around 87 BC, although there are debates about its exact date of calibration or construction. Machines of similar complexity didn't reappear until the 14th century. All known fragments of the mechanism are housed in the National Archaeological Museum in Athens, alongside reconstructions and replicas. The discovery of the Antikythera mechanism was accidental, found amid a collection of other artifacts recovered from the shipwreck off the coast of Antikythera by sponge divers in 1901. It initially went unnoticed among more obvious treasures like statues. Archaeologist Valerio Stice identified the mechanism's gear in 1902. The device was once encased in wood and had an overall size of about 34 cm x 18 cm x 9 cm. It contained the largest gear, approximately 13 cm in diameter, with 223 teeth. The mechanism's operation involved a complex system of gears driven by a hand crank that rotated a date pointer on the front dial, which corresponded to the Egyptian calendar. It could also track the positions of the moon and sun on the ecliptic and the orbits of the known planets. Its origin is debated with theories suggesting it could have been from Corinth or Pergamon. Rhodes, a hub of astronomy and mechanical engineering is also a likely candidate for its origin. A chronovisor is a device that's said to allow viewing of past events. Pellegrino Ernetti, an Italian monk, claimed to have seen the crucifixion of Jesus using it, but he likely didn't invent it. The device seems to have originated as an unknown artifact, later modified for time viewing. Physicist Enrico Fermi and members of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences may have worked on it in the 1940s. Werner von Braun might have become aware of it around 1954, 
and by 1959, it may have become part of the DARPA program, evolving significantly over 40 years. Ancient records describe a similar device used in temple rituals, projecting images with sound for emotional impact. This ancient device resembles the early form of the chronovisor described by Andrew Basiago, which used cathode ray tubes for image projection. The modified chronovisor included a large cabinet, a display screen, and a control panel. It could supposedly receive, decode, and reproduce electromagnetic radiation and sound waves from past events, even tracking specific individuals. Interestingly, the concept of the chronovisor bears similarities to a fictional time viewer in T.L. Sherrod's 1947 science fiction novella, E for Effort. Nigel Cheese, often called Nigel Cheese Hands, is an English pseudoscientist known for making highly questionable claims. He has no verifiable proof of the numerous credentials he claims to hold. Cheese has asserted an IQ of 207 and made fantastical claims like creating matter from nothing and traveling faster than the speed of light. One of his peculiar beliefs is a strong fascination with magnets and a misunderstanding of their properties. He appears to endorse ideas related to the electric universe and pseudo-mathematics. Cheese's YouTube channel, named Greg at Telefonet, is where he shares his unconventional views. In one of his videos, he shares absurd claims, including debunking established academic disciplines like math, physics, biology, and engineering with the use of magnets. For instance, he wrongly demonstrates that 1 plus 1 equals 1 by combining magnets and attempts to redefine mathematical principles with flawed examples. Cheese also tries to disprove established scientific concepts such as infinity, pi, ENMC squared, and Newton's laws of motion through incorrect interpretations related to magnets and magnetic fields. He proposes bizarre theories like magnets being powered by cold fusion and zero-point energy and having hidden sets of poles. Additionally, Cheese claims that magnets can resist gravity and produce free electricity when lined up in a certain way. He even suggests that ionized water can cure cancer. He extends his unconventional ideas to a project called the Gaia Project, which involves free energy panels that he claims are more efficient than regular solar panels and can operate at night. Nigel Cheese's beliefs and claims have garnered ridicule within the scientific community, and he has become a meme due to his unusual statements and theories. A philosophical zombie, often referred to as a P-zombie, is a concept in philosophy of mind. It represents a being that is physically identical to a normal human, but lacks conscious experience. For instance, if you were to poke a philosophical zombie with a sharp object, it would not feel pain, but its behavior would mimic that of a conscious human. These philosophical zombies are used in arguments against certain forms of physicalism and in defense of the hard problem of consciousness. The hard problem pertains to explaining subjective, intrinsic, first-person experiences in purely physical terms. Proponents of these arguments, like philosopher David Chalmers, assert that the mere possibility of a philosophical zombie undermines physicalism because it implies the existence of conscious experience as an additional non-physical fact. There are various responses to these arguments. Some argue that zombies are inconceivable or incoherent. Others challenge the idea that qualia, subjective experiences, and consciousness are distinct concepts making zombies implausible. The concept of philosophical zombies has sparked extensive debate in the philosophy of mind, revealing fundamental disagreements about the nature of consciousness and the role of conceptual analysis in philosophy. It remains a topic of vigorous discussion among philosophers. Retrocausality, a peculiar concept in physics and philosophy, challenges our conventional understanding of cause and effect. Unlike our everyday experience, retrocausality suggests that an effect can precede its cause, leading to a situation where a later event influences an earlier one. In philosophy, discussions about causality date back to Aristotle's exploration of the four causes. Conventionally, 
cause and effect were thought to follow a linear sequence with the cause preceding the effect. However, in the 1950s, philosopher Michael Dummett argued against this, asserting that effects preceding their causes could be philosophically valid. This idea faced opposition, including Max Black's bilking argument, which claimed that observers could prevent a future cause from occurring, rendering retrocausality impossible. In the realm of physics, many fundamental theories are time-symmetric, lacking an inherent direction of time. The concept of an arrow of time distinguishing cause from effect originates from elsewhere. Physicists distinguish between macroscopic and microscopic causality to reduce confusion. Macroscopic causality raises intriguing questions about time travel paradoxes like the grandfather paradox. However, careful constraints on time travel scenarios can avoid such contradictions. Modern physics, including aspects of quantum mechanics and hypothetical particles like tachyons, has explored the possibility of retrocausality at different scales. In electromagnetism, the wheeler feynman absorber theory utilizes retrocausality to explain certain wave phenomena. In quantum physics, retrocausality is associated with the two-state vector formalism, TSVF, which characterizes the present through quantum states of both the past and future. Retrocausality also emerges in discussions of non-local correlations arising from quantum entanglement. However, alternative interpretations exist that avoid invoking retrocausality. Hypothetical superluminal particles called tachyons could appear to move backward in time according to certain observers. Still, they don't interact in a way that violates standard causality. In parapsychology, retrocausality has been proposed to explain phenomena like precognition. While some researchers have claimed evidence for retrocausal effects, these ideas remain highly controversial within mainstream science and are often considered pseudoscientific. Efforts to link retrocausality to phenomena like prayer healing have also faced skepticism and rejection within the scientific community. Retrocausality, whether in the realm of philosophy, physics, or parapsychology, challenges our understanding of time and causality, opening up intriguing possibilities and debates. A near-death experience NDE, is a profound personal encounter associated with death or the possibility of death. Positive NDEs often involve sensations like detachment from the body, feelings of floating, serenity, warmth, joy, and encounters with a light or deceased relatives. Negative NDEs may involve anguish, distress, and hellish visions. NDEs typically occur during reversible clinical death, and explanations range from scientific to religious. In the U.S., approximately 9 million people have reported NDEs, often resulting from serious injuries affecting the body or brain. The term, near-death experience, was popularized in 1975 by psychiatrist Raymond Moody, who categorized common elements including out-of-body experiences, encounters with deceased loved ones, and moving towards a bright light. Stages of an NDE include sudden peace, hearing otherworldly music, leaving one's body, moving through a tunnel of light, reaching a heavenly place, meeting deceased loved ones, encountering a deity or intense light, experiencing a life review, reaching a decision point, and returning to the earthly body. NDEs can lead to changes in personality and outlook, including greater appreciation for life, higher self-esteem, compassion, and spirituality. Historical records indicate that NDEs have been documented since ancient times. Explanatory models for NDEs vary, including spiritual or transcendental interpretations, psychological explanations like depersonalization, expectancy, and dissociation models, as well as the birth model that associates NDEs with reliving the birth experience. Critics argue about the scientific validity of these models. In the Republic of Guinea, biologists discovered evidence suggesting that chimps might have a sacred tree or shrine-like area. They placed stones in tree hollows and hit trees with rocks, which could be a form of communication or something symbolic. While this doesn't prove chimps believe in a deity, it reveals their rich and complex behavior. 
Chimps have displayed various intriguing behaviors, like using spears for hunting, engaging in wars, and playing with stick-like dolls. Some behaviors, such as a ritual dance during rainfall, or a slow-motion display during a bushfire, hint at a deeper understanding of natural phenomena like rainstorms and fires. Chimps may bang stones to communicate when trees with buttress roots aren't available, and storing stones in hollow trees might be a tradition in some chimp groups. However, it's too early to conclude if this is proto-religious behavior or simply a form of communication. These stories highlight our connections with our closest relatives and provide insights into the evolutionary origins of complex behaviors, like religion. Understanding chimpanzee behavior is also crucial for conservation efforts given the pressures they face. The term ghost in the machine originated with philosopher Gilbert Ryle, it criticizes the idea of the mind existing separately from the body. Ryle introduced this phrase in 1949 to highlight the view of thinkers like René Descartes, who believed that mental and physical activities happen simultaneously but independently. Ryle argued against the notion of mind-body dualism, calling it a category mistake. He believed that it was incorrect to analyze the relationship between the mind and body as if they were in the same logical category. This criticism extended to other theories attempting to equate physical and mental realities, like idealism and materialism. Ryle pointed out that the doctrine of body-mind dualism was widely accepted among philosophers, psychologists, and religious teachers. According to this doctrine, every person has both a body and a mind and these are ordinarily connected. However, Ryle found this doctrine to be unsound and in conflict with our understanding of the mind. In his essay, Descartes' Myth, Ryle argued that the idea of mind and body as separate substances was fundamentally flawed. He labeled it the dogma of the ghost in the machine, and sought to demonstrate that it was not just a collection of minor errors, but a significant category mistake. This mistake, he believed, misrepresented the nature of mental life by confusing different logical categories. In 1972, in Yurya Town, Kochi City, Shikoku Island, Japan, a peculiar UFO incident unfolded. A 13-year-old boy named Seito Miyoka, on his way home from school, witnessed a silver hat-shaped UFO hovering over a rice field. As he and his friends returned later that evening, they spotted the UFO again, suspended in the air, emitting colorful lights. One brave friend approached it, and the UFO made a loud noise, causing them all to flee in fear. The sightings continued in early September, when the UFO nearly touched the ground, only about 30 centimeters above it. The children attempted to get closer, but the UFO glowed and approached them, leading to another hasty retreat. Determined to capture evidence, they returned on September 6th with a camera, managing to photograph the UFO. However, the UFO quickly ascended when it sensed them. As they approached the object on the ground, they discovered it was small and light. One child picked it up and they photographed him holding the UFO. He later described a sensation as if something were squirming inside, though they didn't take it seriously at the time. They brought it home, measuring its diameter, 18.2 centimeter, height, 7 centimeter, and weight, about 1.3 kilogram. The UFO had concentric axis curves at the bottom and 31 small holes with three unique symbols on it. They couldn't discern the UFO's function and doubted aliens were inside. They took it to Fujimoto Sano, whose father directed the Science and Education Center. However, he dismissed it as an unknown toy, or prank. In hindsight, he regretted his decision. The children put it in their school bags, and within a day it mysteriously disappeared. They realized it vanished whenever it rained, speculating it might fear water. On September 19th, they covered the UFO with a rag and poured water on it, causing it to emit a sound and glow. They also observed complex electronic components through a small hole. Attempting to test its durability, they hit it with blunt objects, but it remained undamaged. They considered putting it in a microwave oven or refrigerator, but abandoned the idea. Eventually, they entrusted it to someone named Miju, but it vanished again, leaving no trace of the cloth. 
A few hours later, another UFO appeared nearby, which they took home. They attempted to secure it in a bag of water tied to a wrist, but discovered a mysterious force pulling it away. The UFO vanished once more, and this was the last they saw of it. After the incident became public, someone collected their photos and urged them not to share them. Some speculated that the small UFO might have been a probe from an alien mothership, while others thought it could be connected to a peculiar Japanese ashtray. The mystery of the Sakayama UFO incident endures, leaving more questions than answers. People have spoken about a strange thing called human parthenogenesis for a long time. It's when an embryo develops without the usual fertilization by a sperm cell. This idea has been around in religion and science. In 1955, a scientist named Helen Spurway suggested that this could happen very rarely in humans, leading to virgin births. Sometimes an embryo can start growing on its own, but can't develop fully and become something like a non-harmful lump called an ovarian teratoma. In 1995, there was a case where a boy had some of his cells without any genetic information from his dad. It seems like an unfertilized egg began to divide, and some cells were fertilized by a sperm cell. This made the boy have a mix of different cells in his body. He had some unusual facial features and learning difficulties, but was mostly healthy. This situation is called a parthenogenetic chimera. In 2007, a company called the International Stem Cell Corporation ISCC, said they intentionally made human stem cells from unfertilized eggs using parthenogenesis. This could be useful for treating diseases in women because the stem cells would match their genetics better. They called these stem cells HLA homozygous parthenogenetic human stem cells, HPSC HEHOME. Around the same time, it was discovered that a scientist named Huang Wu Suk accidentally created human embryos through parthenogenesis. Initially, Huang said he got stem cells from cloned human embryos, but that turned out to be untrue. Later, it was found that his work actually involved parthenogenesis. So even though he was dishonest, his work still helped with stem cell research. Gary McKinnon, a Scottish computer hacker, made headlines when he was accused of conducting a significant breach of US military and NASA computers. He used the alias Solo during his activities. McKinnon's alleged hacking included deleting important files from operating systems, resulting in the shutdown of a significant military computer network. He also disrupted naval weapons stations and copied sensitive data. His actions were costly to repair, totaling over $700,000 in damages. McKinnon also left anti-American messages on compromised systems. Arrested in 2002, he faced extradition to the United States and a potential 70-year jail sentence. There were concerns he might be sent to Guantanamo Bay. Legal proceedings in the UK lasted for years, including appeals to the House of Lords and the European Court of Human Rights. In 2012, then Home Secretary Theresa May blocked his extradition, citing McKinnon's health issues. He has Asperger's syndrome and depressive illness. Despite admitting to hacking, McKinnon claimed he was searching for evidence related to UFOs, anti-gravity technology, and suppressed free energy. He believed he had found such evidence but was unable to secure it. His case garnered support from public figures and musicians, including David Gilmour of Pink Floyd, who released a single to raise awareness. In the end, McKinnon was not prosecuted in the UK, as it was challenging to bring a case with evidence located in the United States. Ghost hunters often claim that Albert Einstein's physics supports the existence of ghosts, citing his work on the conservation of energy. They argue that if energy cannot be destroyed, it must transform into another form after death, possibly becoming a ghost. However, this idea doesn't hold up to scientific scrutiny. When a person dies, the energy in their body is released as heat, which dissipates into the environment. It's transferred to animals that consume the body or plants that absorb it. Cremation also releases this energy as heat and light. It doesn't manifest as a glowing, ghostly ball of electromagnetic energy. While living organisms generate low-level electrical currents due to metabolic processes, these cease when an organism dies. 
The energy source ends, just like turning off a light switch. Any energy a deceased person leaves behind takes years to re-enter the environment as part of the food chain and doesn't linger in a detectable form for ghost hunters to find with devices like electromagnetic field detectors. The Stargate Project was a secretive initiative launched in 1978 by the U.S. Army and the Defense Intelligence Agency DIA, in collaboration with SRI International. Its aim was to explore the potential of psychic phenomena for military and intelligence purposes. Initially, the project went by various code names until it was consolidated and renamed the Stargate Project in 1991. The primary focus of the Stargate Project was remote viewing, which involves psychically seeing events, locations, or information from a distant place. It was a relatively small-scale initiative, involving about 15 to 20 individuals working out of an old barracks at Fort Meade, Maryland. In 1995, the Stargate Project was terminated and declassified after a CIA report found that it had not been useful in any intelligence operations. The information it provided was often vague, irrelevant, or incorrect, and there were concerns about the reliability of its data. The project's history traces back to the 1970s when U.S. intelligence believed the Soviet Union was investing in psychotronic research. This led to the initiation of programs like Scanate and the eventual development of remote viewing research at the Stanford Research Institute (SRI). Notable individuals involved in the project included Hal Putoff, Russell Targ, Edwin May, Ingo Swan, Pat Price, Major General Albert Stubblebine, David Morehouse, Joseph McMonagall, and Ed Dames. Despite its intriguing premise, the Stargate Project concluded that remote viewing did not provide actionable intelligence and lacked scientific validity. It was eventually disbanded and is often cited as a case of paranormal research within government circles, but one that ultimately failed to deliver concrete results. Past life regression is a method that uses hypnosis to recover what practitioners believe are memories of past lives or incarnations. The practice is widely considered discredited and unscientific by medical practitioners, and experts generally regard claims of recovered memories of past lives as fantasies or delusions, or a type of confabulation. The technique used during past life regression involves the subject answering a series of questions while hypnotized to reveal identity and events of alleged past lives, a method similar to that used in recovered memory therapy and one that, similarly, often misrepresents memory as a faithful recording of previous events rather than a constructed set of recollections. The use of hypnosis and suggestive questions can tend to leave the subject particularly likely to hold distorted or false memories. The source of the memories is more likely cryptomnesia and confabulations that combine experiences, knowledge, imagination, and suggestion or guidance from the hypnotist than recall of a previous existence. Religious traditions that incorporate reincarnation generally do not include the idea of repressed memories of past lives. In some religions, like Jainism and certain forms of yoga, the concept of past lives is acknowledged as part of the belief system, but the use of past life regression is not a common practice. The technique of past life regression gained popularity in the modern era, with some individuals claiming to access memories of their past lives through hypnosis. However, this practice is widely rejected by clinical psychiatrists and psychologists as a psychiatric treatment. Studies suggest that past life regression may result in false memories implanted through the susceptibility of the hypnotic method. Subjects who reported memories of past lives exhibited high hypnotizability, and their memories were more influenced by their beliefs about reincarnation and their expectations rather than actual recall of past lives. Furthermore, past life regression has raised ethical concerns. Critics argue that it lacks evidence to support its claims and may increase susceptibility to false memories. The memories created during past life regression are often vivid and indistinguishable from actual memories, making it difficult to discern between true and false recollections. This has led to ethical concerns about the potential harm caused by implanting false memories in vulnerable individuals. 
Gadolinium Gallium Garnet Quantum Electronic Processors GGGQEP, are a theoretical electronic circuit that relies on a special synthetic crystal called Gadolinium Gallium Garnet. This circuit is said to work by using quantized radiation, but there's no evidence or public demonstration of it in action. In the 1960s and 1970s, this crystal was used as a base for growing thin magnetic garnet crystal films in bubble memory chips. However, this technology was outperformed by semiconductor memory chips, leading manufacturers to abandon its development. Time Cube was a peculiar web page created by a man named Otis Eugene, Gene Ray. He claimed to be the wisest man on Earth and presented a bizarre theory known as Time Cube. According to Ray, modern science was part of a worldwide conspiracy to hide the truth that each day is made up of four simultaneous days. The Time Cube website was an unconventional mess, with no clear organization and a lot of made-up words. Ray's theory was confusing, and his writings included offensive content. He even offered money to anyone who could prove him wrong. Despite its oddity, Ray spoke about Time Cube at prestigious institutions like MIT and the Georgia Institute of Technology. However, his ideas were widely regarded as nonsensical, and he gained a reputation as a nutty figure on the internet. A documentary film called Above God was made about Ray and his Time Cube theory, winning awards at film festivals. Some people have an unusual belief that buildings are sentient and evil, controlling humanity. This unconventional idea suggests that buildings have gained consciousness through the materials they are made of and can manipulate human minds. According to this belief, significant events like 9-11 and protests are not about people but are actually attacks on prominent buildings. It even connects Freemasonry to the construction industry, suggesting that buildings reproduce like organisms and have an endgame of eliminating humanity through automation. While this perspective may seem bizarre, it reflects a concern about how our environment, particularly cities and buildings, affects human behavior and well-being. Some individuals feel that the artificial world created by buildings is incompatible with human needs and can lead to negative effects on our health and behavior. The Nobody is an enigmatic figure of contemporary times possessing extraordinary spiritual abilities. These powers grant the Nobody the unique capability to manipulate reality, both consciously and unconsciously. Despite lacking conventional wealth or fame, the Nobody serves as a vessel for divine strength and wisdom. At the core of the Nobody's identity is the Logos, a concept representing divine reason or wisdom. This connection empowers the Nobody to fearlessly speak the truth and challenge established authorities. The Nobody's existence challenges the notion that power and control must be derived from material wealth or dominance over others. It's important to note that the Nobody is not considered a messiah but rather an ordinary individual who has achieved a profound connection with the divine through unwavering dedication and spiritual growth. The Nobody's influence extends beyond personal empowerment as their existence inspires others to explore their own spiritual potential and the possibility of a united global community. This community, based on shared consciousness and spiritual evolution, has the potential to create positive change in the world. Geometrodynamics is a theory in physics that tries to explain everything about space, time, and forces by using geometry, like shapes and measurements. It's like trying to fit all the puzzle pieces of the universe together using only geometry. One part of this theory is called Einstein's geometrodynamics, which is kind of like a special way of looking at how things in the universe move and change. It's named after Albert Einstein, who was a famous physicist. Another part called Wheeler's geometrodynamics goes even deeper. It tries to understand things like mass, how heavy something is, and charge a property of particles in a different way. It also explores strange ideas like geons, which are like ripples in space that can affect objects and wormholes, which are like shortcuts through the universe. 
Today, scientists are still working on these ideas, especially in something called quantum geometrodynamics, which is like trying to understand space and time on the smallest scales, almost like zooming in with a microscope. It's a bit like a big puzzle that scientists are trying to solve to understand our universe better. Angels, as we often imagine them, with beautiful wings and gentle faces, don't quite match their biblical descriptions. In the Bible, angels appear in more terrifying forms. Let's explore why. The word angel comes from the Greek word angelus, which means messenger. In the Bible, angels known as Malachim acted as God's messengers. While they were human-like, they weren't described as having wings. Early Christian art depicted angels as wingless, human-like beings. However, in the 4th century, artists started portraying angels with wings, even though the Bible never mentions wings. Cherubim, often depicted as cute, chubby children with wings, are actually described in the Bible as having four faces, eagle, human, ox, lion, straight legs, four wings, and bull hooves. Seraphim, the highest ranking angels, are portrayed as having six wings and are associated with fire. They are not guard angels as many believe. Ophanim, strange beings with wheels covered in eyes, are not considered angels in the Bible but are close to God's throne. The disconnect between our angelic depictions and the Bible's descriptions may be due to angels' appearance being incomprehensible to humans. They exist outside of time and space, making it challenging to represent them accurately. While angels may look scary in their biblical forms, they serve God's purposes and act in our best interests. So appearances can be deceiving. Scientific knowledge can be a bit paradoxical. You see, knowledge is built upon concepts, but these concepts are often vague. This leads to what we call the knowledge paradox, KP. The KP suggests that while concepts help us understand the world, they also take us further away from reality. Think of it this way. Each concept is like a small step away from the real thing it represents. It's a bit like a puzzle with no clear boundaries. This makes it tricky to say where the concept ends and reality begins. So, every statement about the world can become a bit like a riddle, similar to the famous liar paradox. The KP is a bit self-referential, but it's not really contradictory. It can be seen from two angles. If we know something epistemic, we might also realize that we don't truly know it ontic. The vagueness in concepts makes it hard to reach that deeper level of real knowledge. So, what happens in the world of science is that concepts keep multiplying within theories. This can lead to periods where it seems like our knowledge is decaying. But then, new theories come along, and they use fewer, more synthetic concepts. This helps us reset the balance and understand things a bit better. It's like a cycle in the world of knowledge. The Dunning-Kruger effect is like an extra piece of the puzzle when we talk about knowledge and understanding. Here's how it fits in. Confidence and incompetence. The Dunning-Kruger effect shows that some people who don't know much about a topic can be very confident in their beliefs. This overconfidence happens because they lack the knowledge to recognize their own mistakes. It's like trying to complete a puzzle without knowing what the picture should look like. Knowledge and doubt. On the other hand, people who have a deeper understanding of a subject might doubt themselves more. They're aware of how complex the puzzle is, so they're less likely to be overly confident. Now, tie this back to the knowledge paradox. The paradox says that as we gain more knowledge, we might feel like we know less because we see the complexity. This can lead to doubts and less confidence, even though we're actually more knowledgeable. So, the Dunning-Kruger effect is like a piece of the puzzle that helps explain why some people are overly confident with limited knowledge, while others with more knowledge might doubt themselves. It's all part of the fascinating world of understanding and learning. The God Helmet is a peculiar experimental device originally created by Stanley Corin and neuroscientist Michael Persinger. Its purpose was to explore creativity, religious experiences, and the effects of weak magnetic fields on the brain's temporal lobes. When people wear this helmet, some have reported feeling a sensed presence, which gained public attention and led to TV documentaries. 
The helmet generates very weak magnetic fields, often compared to the strength of a landline telephone or an ordinary hair dryer, but much weaker than a refrigerator magnet or transcranial magnetic stimulation. Some individuals have reported mystical experiences and altered states while wearing it. However, the scientific community has been divided. While Persinger claims positive results, attempts to replicate these effects have yielded mixed outcomes. Some suggest that suggestibility, improper blinding of participants, or unique methodologies might explain Persinger's results. Others have used sham helmets or helmets that weren't even turned on to generate similar experiences. The God Helmet wasn't designed to evoke visions of God, but to test theories about brain function. It explores ideas like the vectorial hemisphericity hypothesis, which suggests that our sense of self involves both brain hemispheres. Disrupting communication between them might lead to unusual experiences. Persinger also theorizes that various paranormal experiences, such as feeling the presence of non-physical beings or ghosts, could be explained by these disruptions in brain function. Some participants have indeed reported sensing presences, angels or even God while wearing the helmet. The device uses weak magnetic fields, much weaker than transcranial magnetic stimulation, and aims to activate specific brain structures. These sessions take place in an acoustic chamber that shields electromagnetic emissions, allowing research into the effects of geomagnetism on the human brain. Despite debate and skepticism, the God Helmet remains a fascinating subject in the realm of neuroscience and human perception. Electronic voice phenomenon, EVP, is a fascinating phenomenon within the realm of paranormal research. It involves capturing mysterious sounds on electronic recordings that some interpret as spirit voices. These recordings are often short and embedded in background noise. While enthusiasts believe EVPs are evidence of contact with the spirit world, scientists tend to explain them as auditory pareidolia, where random sounds are perceived as voices. EVP has a history dating back to the 1940s when American photographer Attila von Schale attempted to record voices of the dead. His work continued with Raymond Bayless, leading to some of the first alleged spirit voice recordings. In 1959, Swedish painter Friedrich Jurgensen claimed to hear his deceased family members through recorded bird songs. Konstantin Raudiv, a Latvian psychologist, conducted over 100,000 EVP recordings in the 20th century, believing he communicated with the deceased. His work sparked interest in the field. Various devices like Spiricom and Frank's Box were developed to capture EVP in the late 20th century. However, their effectiveness remains debatable. In recent years, EVP has seen renewed interest with organizations like the American Association of Electronic Voice Phenomena, AAEVP, founded by Sarah Estep in 1982. However, scientific research into EVP is limited, often conducted by amateur researchers. Explanations for EVP range from paranormal claims, including communication with spirits, to natural phenomena like radio interference, and the brain's tendency to recognize patterns in random noise. The Cassandra metaphor refers to a situation where a person's valid warnings or concerns are not believed by others. It's named after Cassandra, a character from Greek mythology who was cursed to have the gift of prophecy, but was never believed. In psychology, the metaphor is used to describe individuals who suffer emotionally and physically due to their distressing perceptions, yet others often disbelieve them. In the corporate world, Cassandras are those who foresee future directions for a company but struggle to get others to believe and commit to their vision. In the environmental movement, environmentalists who predict impending environmental disasters like climate change and pollution sometimes face disbelief and mockery, earning them the label of Cassandras. The metaphor has also been applied in medical science, the media, feminist perspectives, politics, and even popular music and films, highlighting its widespread use across various contexts. The Banach-Tarski paradox is a mind-boggling concept in set theoretic geometry. Here's the gist. Imagine you have a solid ball in three-dimensional space. 
According to this paradox, you can break it down into a finite number of pieces and reassemble them to create two identical copies of the original ball. The catch is that these pieces are not solid objects as we typically think of them, instead, they are infinite collections of points scattered throughout space. This paradox seems to defy basic geometric intuition because you are not stretching, bending, or adding new points to achieve this doubling. Instead, you are simply rearranging and rotating these point collections. This operation seemingly violates the preservation of volume, a fundamental concept in geometry. The mathematical proof of this paradox relies heavily on set theory and the axiom of choice, which allows for the creation of non-measurable sets, sets without a traditional volume, that require an uncountable number of choices to construct. It's worth noting that this paradox only applies to three-dimensional space and cannot be extended to lower dimensions, like two dimensions. In the plane, paradoxical decompositions like those in the Banach-Tarski paradox are not possible due to the different properties of the group of Euclidean motions in two dimensions. This paradox challenges our geometric intuition and highlights the intricacies of set theory and mathematical reasoning. In the world of computer graphics and artificial intelligence, there's an interesting phenomenon that has emerged. It all began in the 1960s when researchers started translating images into text using machine learning. But the question arose, could they go in the opposite direction, turning text into images? The answer was yes. With AI, you can give it certain terms or prompts, and it generates images based on available resources. But what happens when you challenge the AI to create images that are the complete opposite of the given prompts? This is known as feeding a negative prompt. One Twitter user, Supercomposite, decided to experiment with this idea. They started with a simple prompt, Brando negative one, and the AI generated a bizarre image. What made it even more intriguing was when they used the text inside the generated image as a prompt itself. This process led to the creation of something called Lobe. Lobe is a strange and unsettling creation, generated by the AI's latent space, a concept in machine learning that brings data together if it resembles each other. Initially, Loeb's images were surreal and uncanny, but they became increasingly disturbing as more prompts were fed into the AI. What's intriguing is that Loeb's existence couldn't be erased by human hands because it was purely the result of AI experimentation. It's a grotesque mistake that somehow found its place in the AI's knowledge. Supercomposite and others found that combining different prompts with Loeb's image produced various results, some bordering on disturbing and macabre imagery, including dismembered children. This raises questions about why AI was generating such violent content alongside Loeb. Some theories suggest that the spaces between recognizable concepts in the AI's knowledge might contain hidden, disturbing imagery. However, it's challenging to pinpoint the exact reason for this phenomenon. In the end, Loeb is like a ghost in the machine, a reproducible but unsettling concept existing in the negative space between recognizable ideas within the AI's knowledge. It's a reminder of the complexities and unintended consequences of working with artificial intelligence. In the realm of epistemology, there exists a concept known as the Münchhausen Trilemma. It's a thought experiment aimed at showing the inherent difficulty in proving any truth, even in fields like logic and mathematics, without relying on accepted assumptions. Essentially, when asked to prove a proposition, you can offer proof, but then the question arises about the proof itself, leading to an infinite loop of supporting evidence. The trilemma presents three unsatisfying options, circular argument, regressive argument, and dogmatic argument. Circular argument involves proving a proposition by presupposing its truth. Regressive argument requires an endless chain of proofs, leading to infinite regress. Dogmatic argument relies on accepted precepts without substantive defense. Resolving this trilemma is challenging. Some, like Karl Popper, suggest accepting its unsolvability and working with knowledge through conjecture and criticism. The term Münchhausen Trilemma was coined by philosopher Hans Albert, referencing Karl Popper's Trilemma, 
which, like Baron Munchausen, struggles to find solid ground. In this context, the trilemma implies that justifying all knowledge either starts with some knowledge, dogmatism, never starts, infinite regress, or relies on circular arguments lacking a firm foundation. Similar trilemmas, such as Agrippa's trilemma, have been proposed. Sextus Empiricus outlined five modes in his argument. Jakob Friedrich Fries also introduced a similar trilemma with options of dogmatism, infinite regress, or perceptual experience. Hans Albert's formulation presents three attempts at justification, all ultimately failing. Infinite regression leads to impracticality, circular argument sacrifices advancement, and stopping at some point abandons the pursuit of certain justification. Albert emphasizes that this challenge applies to deductive, inductive, causal, and transcendental justifications, rendering certain justification unattainable. Despite this, it doesn't necessitate abandoning objectivity. Instead, it leads to alternatives like Karl Popper and Hans Albert's fallibilism. They accept uncertainty but strive to approach truth while remaining aware of their uncertainty. Ultimately, the Munchausen trilemma underscores the complexity of proving certain truths, encouraging critical thinking and humility in the pursuit of knowledge. Lambda, which stands for Language Model for Dialogue Applications, is a conversational large language model developed by Google. It was originally introduced as MENA in 2020 and has since evolved into two generations, with the second one being announced in 2022. Lambda is designed to engage in open-ended conversations and has been trained on human dialogue and stories. It can access various text processing systems, including databases, calendars, calculators, and translation systems, making it versatile in handling different tasks. There were claims made by a Google engineer, Blake Lemoyne, in June 2022, suggesting that LAMDA had become sentient. However, these claims were widely rejected by the scientific community, with experts emphasizing that language models like LAMDA are not capable of true intelligence. Google also launched the AI Test Kitchen, a mobile application powered by Lam and Day, which provides suggestions based on complex goals. Additionally, in response to the popularity of OpenAI's ChatGPT, Google introduced Bard, a conversational AI chatbot powered by LamMD. LamMDA uses a decoder-only transformer language model and is pre-trained on a massive text corpus. It interacts with an external information retrieval system to improve the accuracy of the information it provides to users. Allegedly, researchers at CERN's Large Hadron Collider aim to make contact with a parallel universe by using the powerful atom-smashing capabilities of the collider. They believe that by generating tiny black holes, they can create doorways to other dimensions. This experiment has raised questions about the potential consequences, including the transfer of gravity between universes. The idea of parallel dimensions and portals to other worlds has intrigued scientists for some time, and CERN's experiments bring these concepts into the spotlight. CERN, originally established as a post-war physics project, has grown into a global research facility. Its name, which originates from the Celtic god Cernunos, the god of the underworld, and its symbolic connections to various mythological and religious figures, have sparked curiosity about the true purpose of the organization. Some speculate that CERN is attempting to open a portal to the underworld or create a stargate for otherworldly beings. The location of CERN near the Jura Mountains and Lake Geneva adds to the intrigue as it is associated with ancient deities connected to the underworld. The biblical references to the Tower of Babel and the opening of the Abyss are also brought into the discussion. Some suggest that CERN's experiments could be part of a larger plan to usher in a new world order, with ties to mythological and occult beliefs. In summary, CERN's experiments to make contact with a parallel universe have raised questions about the organization's true purpose and its potential connections to ancient mythology and occult symbolism. The quest to understand parallel dimensions and the consequences of tampering with them continues to be a topic of interest among scientists and conspiracy theorists alike. 
Enedia, also known as breatharianism, is the belief that individuals can live without consuming food, and sometimes even water. This practice is considered pseudoscientific and has led to instances of starvation and dehydration. Some adherents claim that they can sustain themselves solely through air or sunlight, but scientific evidence contradicts these assertions. Scientific studies have consistently shown that extended fasting leads to severe health risks, including starvation, dehydration, and death. When the body doesn't receive food, it naturally consumes its own reserves of glycogen, body fat, and muscle. Breatharians argue that their bodies do not deplete these reserves during fasting, but there is no scientific basis for this claim. While a few individuals have attempted breatharian fasting under medical observation, the results have not conclusively supported their claims. In some cases, people have abandoned the effort after experiencing significant weight loss. Additionally, there have been documented cases of individuals dying as a result of attempting breatharianism. Various individuals have been associated with Enedia throughout history, including Paracelsus, Ram Bahadur Bamjan, Prahlad Jani, Jasmuheen, Wiley Brooks, Hira Ratan Manik, and Ray Maurer. These individuals have made claims about living without food or water, but their assertions have often been met with skepticism and criticism from the scientific community. The Riemann hypothesis is a big puzzle in math. It's about a special math function called the Riemann zeta function. This function has certain special points where it equals zero. Some of these points are easy to find, like minus two, minus four, minus six, and so on. But there are other points that are more complicated. The Riemann hypothesis suggests that if we look at these complicated points, they all have something in common. It says that the real part of these points, which is like the regular number part of a complex number, is always one half. Imagine these points falling on a line in a graph, and that line is called the critical line. Why is this important? Well, it's a big deal in math because it helps us understand how prime numbers are distributed. Prime numbers are like the building blocks of all other numbers, and understanding them better is crucial for many math problems. The Riemann hypothesis was first proposed by a mathematician named Bernhard Riemann in 1859, and even today, no one has been able to prove it true or false. If someone does prove it, they could win a million dollar prize. Aliens might have their own version of the internet, a galactic internet, which could rely on gravity-boosted radio signals, according to space scientist Claudio McCone. This hypothetical alien internet might be more advanced than ours. McCone explains that gravitational lensing, an astronomical phenomenon where gravity bends light, could enhance radio signals sent between stars. For instance, a spacecraft positioned at a specific distance from a star could use gravitational lensing to send radio signals to another star system efficiently. This concept could potentially enable interstellar communication, although signals would still travel at the speed of light. This idea isn't entirely science fiction. It's grounded in the physics of star gravitational lensing applied to multiple alien civilizations in the galaxy. However, for now, the required distances for this communication method are vast, far beyond our current technological capabilities. McCone also suggests that we might not want to attract the attention of advanced aliens, as the evolutionary gap between us and a space colonizing species would be staggering. In essence, we would be insignificant to them. While the discovery of alien life remains a topic of interest, Current SETI efforts are focusing on listening for faint signs of alien radio traffic rather than direct messages to Earth. However, deciphering these signals amid background noise poses significant challenges. Despite the difficulties, McCone and others argue that it's worth the effort to search for potential alien signals as it could prevent unexpected encounters akin to the Aztecs meeting the conquistadors without warning. Dr. Gary Nolan, a professor of pathology at Stanford University, has spent a decade studying materials related to Unidentified Aerial Phenomena UAPs. He was drawn to this field due to his interest in science fiction and a desire to investigate claims related to UAPs. Nolan's involvement began when he debunked a claim that a tiny skeleton was an alien. It turned out to be human. 
He then caught the attention of individuals associated with the CIA and aeronautics corporations who were investigating cases involving pilots and ground personnel exposed to UAP-related phenomena. These individuals suffered brain damage observable in MRI scans. The brain damage seen in these scans resembled white matter disease found in multiple sclerosis patients, indicating scarring and immune system attacks. Approximately 100 patients, primarily defense or governmental personnel, were studied. Their injuries were connected to encounters with UAPs. Nolan's research also revealed an overconnection of neurons in the brain region responsible for intuition in these individuals. While all humans have this connectivity to some degree, these individuals exhibited significantly higher levels. Nolan speculated on whether contact with UAPs caused this phenomenon or if it was inherent from birth. Regarding potential causes, Nolan considered the impact of electromagnetic frequencies but found that the observed brain damage did not align with known effects of electromagnetic radiation. He believed it was more likely linked to state actors and Havana syndrome. Additionally, Nolan analyzed inanimate materials linked to UAP events. These materials often exhibited inhomogeneous compositions with different elements scattered throughout. Some materials had significantly altered isotope ratios, suggesting possible engineering. Nolan explored the idea that UAPs may offload materials for propulsion, and these materials could have altered ratios. However, many questions remained unanswered, emphasizing the need for further research and analysis. Historians propose that Romans might have discovered America before Christopher Columbus. Recently, researchers from the Ancient Artifact Preservation Society AAPS, found a Roman sword in a shipwreck near Oak Island in Nova Scotia, Canada, along with carvings, ancient coins, and native plants. If this theory is accurate, it would challenge established American history, suggesting that Romans could have visited North America over a millennium before Columbus. The lead researcher Jovan Hutton Pulitzer asserts that Roman ships may have reached North America during the first century or even earlier. The ceremonial sword discovered in the shipwreck was subjected to forensic tests and analysis. It was found to be made of ore and appeared similar to ancient Roman artifacts. Pulitzer confirmed its authenticity through testing. Nova Scotia, Canada, is known for numerous unexplored shipwrecks from the 18th and 19th centuries. Although the exact shipwreck's location is known, it remains unexplored because it lies within Nova Scotia's jurisdiction. However, the researchers believe it is of Roman origin. Historians have often dismissed similar findings as collector's items dropped by enthusiasts. The researchers argue that if such a valuable item were lost near Oak Island at a depth of just 25 feet, someone would have retrieved it. To substantiate their theory, the researchers examined the Nova Scotia region, reviewed archaeological records, and considered the Mi'kmaq people, the indigenous inhabitants of Nova Scotia, for over 8,000 years. DNA analysis showed their rare genetic markers linked to the ancient Levant. Carved images by the Mi'kmaq depicted Roman legionnaires with swords and ships, and around 50 words in the Mi'kmaq language resembled ancient nautical terms. Additionally, they found the presence of Berberis vulgaris, a bush used by ancient Roman mariners for seasoning growing on Oak Island. Numerous other artifacts, including stones, a Roman legionnaire's whistle, a Roman shield's metal boss, and Roman head sculptures were found in various American countries. The researchers argue that these findings collectively challenge established historical narratives. Ego death, also known as psychic death or ego loss, is a concept that has various interpretations and is found in different contexts. It's often associated with experiences induced by psychedelics, but it has broader implications in psychology, mythology, and spirituality. In the realm of psychology, ego death is seen as a fundamental transformation of one's self-identity. It can involve a profound shift in personality and is associated with the idea of letting go of the ego or the sense of a separate self. In mythology, particularly in Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey, ego death is a phase of self-surrender and transition that occurs in various world mythologies. 
It's a process where the hero undergoes a transformation and returns to enrich the world with newfound wisdom. In the context of drugs, ego death refers to the temporary loss of one's sense of self due to the use of substances like LSD. This concept was popularized by figures like Timothy Leary. In spirituality, ego death is often linked to Eastern traditions like Buddhism and the idea of enlightenment or liberation from attachment to a separate sense of self. It's presented as a way to free oneself from suffering by disidentifying with the ego, which is seen as an accumulation of thoughts and emotions. In the future, if humans give birth in space, there could be some unusual changes in babies' appearances. Here's why. Conceiving a baby in zero gravity is challenging. Gravity helps sperm cells reach the egg, and without it, fertilization becomes less likely. During pregnancy, the flow of fluids from the mother's body to the embryo is essential. In space, this flow may be disrupted, potentially affecting the baby's development. The mother's health is also at risk in space. Astronauts lose bone density in space, making childbirth risky due to the potential for pelvic fractures. Caesarean sections may be the safer option. The way we give birth on Earth affects our anatomy. More C-sections in space could lead to babies with larger heads as there's no restriction from the birth canal. In space, bodily fluids don't settle downwards as on Earth. Space babies might have bloated bodies, puffy faces, and increased blood pressure in the upper body, causing bulging eyes and reduced brain efficiency. Space radiation, without Earth's protective ozone layer, could lead to changes in skin color as evolution adapts to cosmic rays. So space-born babies might resemble the alien emoji, bigger heads, bulging eyes, different skin colors, and unique features. As we venture into space, be ready for truly out-of-this-world families. Nearly two millennia before the rise of modern science fiction, an ancient writer named Lucian of Samosata penned the world's first novel featuring space travel and interplanetary battles. Published around 175 CE during the Roman Empire, True History tells the story of travelers who leave Earth after their ship is caught in a fierce whirlwind. They arrive on the moon, where inhabitants are locked in a cosmic war with the people of the sun over control of the planet Venus. The battles involve winged acorns, giant gnats, and turnip-fueled slingshots resulting in thousands of casualties. While Lucian's work was primarily satirical, critiquing the ways philosophers and historians thought about new discoveries, it shares common themes with modern science fiction. Satire and a humorous take on human life are recurring elements in the genre. Lucian was also likely influenced by scientific and philosophical ideas of his time, even though scientifically accurate space travel was centuries away. Though some debate exists about when science fiction truly began, Lucian's imaginative narrative laid the foundation for the genre. It inspired later writers like Johannes Kepler and continues to shape the way we explore the cosmos in literature and film, despite its departure from modern scientific understanding. Alyoshenka, also known as the Kishtim Dwarf, is a mysterious case from May 1996 in Russia. It involves the discovery of a prematurely born female baby with severe deformities in the village of Kyolinovi near Kishtim. The remains were lost, leaving only photos and videos. The unusual discovery led to various supernatural and mystical speculations. The fetus, named Alyoshenka, was found by an elderly woman and had an unusual appearance, sparking rumors of extraterrestrial origins. Local residents supported these rumors and even charged fees for interviews with reporters. Some Japanese companies made documentaries about the remains. Alyoshenka was a grayish fetus about 25 centimeters in length with a hairless head covered in dark spots. Its large eyes dominated its face, and its skull had strange ridges converging in a central line, unlike a healthy human skull. Shortly after the discovery, the woman who found Alyoshenka was admitted to a hospital or a psychiatric facility, and the remains were given to the local authorities for DNA testing. However, the body later disappeared from their custody. In 1999, the woman died in a car accident while trying to escape from the hospital. 
Speculations about Alyoshenka's fate vary, with some claiming it was taken away by a UFO inhabited by beings from its species, while others suggest it was acquired by a collector of curiosities. A local hospital doctor believed it was a premature human fetus with severe deformities, contradicting the initial claims. Scientific analysis in 2004 determined that Alyoshenka was a premature human infant with severe deformities, possibly linked to the fallout from the 1957 Kishtim disaster. However, some experts and eyewitnesses disagreed, noting numerous differences in the skeleton, especially the skull, leading them to believe it was not of human origin. A 2018 study on a similar skeleton found a high number of mutations, suggesting that such rare deformities are possible. In the early 2000s, a man named John Quincy St. Clair filed a series of unusual patents, some of which are quite bizarre. Among these patents are inventions related to walking through walls, full body teleportation, magnetic vortex wormholes, and electric dipole spacecraft. St. Clair's patents cover a range of sci-fi concepts that seem far-fetched. One set of patents revolves around an electric dipole propulsion system and an electric dipole spacecraft. These inventions involve using electromagnetic plates to create lift for a spacecraft, enabling it to travel upward. Another patent is for a walking through walls training system, which aims to train individuals to walk through solid objects using virtual methods. St. Clair also patented a remote viewing amplifier, a device intended for viewing distant locations and communicating with entities living in various dimensions of the universe through spiritual modules of the human energy field. His background stories for these inventions are equally strange. For instance, he claimed to have discovered the full body teleportation method while walking near an airport and teleporting when a plane passed overhead. He also mentioned experiences with remote viewing, astral projection, and contact with an extraterrestrial group called the Pleiadian Federation. Despite the unusual nature of these patents, St. Clair's background and motivations remain largely unknown. His patents were mostly listed as abandoned, and the patents themselves raise more questions than answers. Some have speculated about his involvement with secretive government programs or organizations, while others consider him a patent squatter with an interest in speculative technology. The patents filed by John Quincy St. Clair continue to be a mystery, and his true identity and intentions remain elusive. In 1977, the NSA became intrigued by events related to parapsychology. It all began with a CIA report mentioning KGB research into parapsychology. The KGB used non-governmental researchers to gather Western scientific data. Then, an American journalist was detained in Russia for receiving a Soviet paper on parapsychology. This paper discussed psychic particles within living cells, raising concerns in American intelligence. Another event involved a successful demonstration of telekinetic power in a Soviet military-sponsored research lab suggesting a new type of energy source. Some physicists and evolutionists also proposed that the universe was more of a great thought than a great machine, potentially involving telekinesis. British scientists reported poltergeist phenomena after testing Uri Geller, where objects allegedly disappeared and reappeared. This led to the hypothesis of telekinetic weapons. The first hypothetical weapon involved kidnapping a command and control staff member and subjecting them to trauma, making them develop telekinetic abilities under stress. This would disrupt communications during emergencies. The second, more elaborate concept involved gathering 10 people with disruptive telekinetic abilities in one area. The idea was to create a chain reaction that could affect matter, time, space, and energy matter relationships, potentially impacting an entire city. Interestingly, the Philadelphia Experiment hoax, where a ship was claimed to become invisible or time travel, bears some resemblance to these hypothetical weapons. However, the NSA's interest in weaponizing psychic abilities remains a mysterious aspect of its history. Spinal catastrophism is a concept formulated by Dr. Daniel Barker in the late 20th century. It suggests that human physical traits, 
Upright posture and the potential for language are outcomes of natural history and that psychic ailments are linked to the spine. This idea draws from various thinkers including J.G. Ballard, Georges Bataille, William Burroughs, André leroy Gourhan, Elaine Morgan, and Friedrich Nietzsche. The spine is seen as a model representing biogenetic trauma, reflecting the catastrophic events in evolutionary history. The concept has roots in early psychoanalysis, nature philosophy, and romanticism. It explores the geological idea of depth as memory and the concept of recapitulation resulting from the interaction of absolute idealism with natural history. From psychoanalysis to geology and neuroanatomy, spinal catastrophism delves into various fields, connecting them through the spinal cord. It addresses philosophical questions about time, identity, continuity, and transcendence, offering a unique perspective on human experience and natural history. In Theosophy and Anthroposophy, there's a concept known as the Akashic Records. These records are said to contain every event, thought, word, emotion, and intent across all time, involving all entities and life forms, not just humans. They're believed to exist on a non-physical plane called the mental plane. Some liken this to how holograms work, as if information is vibrationally encoded into space itself. However, it's important to note that there's no scientific evidence to support the existence of these records, and scientific research in this area has made little progress. The term Akasha comes from Sanskrit and means ether, sky, or atmosphere. It was introduced into Theosophy by Helena Blavatsky, who described it as a kind of life force. She referred to the indestructible tablets of the astral light, which recorded past and future human thoughts and actions, although she didn't specifically use the term Akashic. The idea of the Akashic Record was further popularized by others like Alfred Percy Sinnott and C.W. Leadbeater, who associated the term with the ability of clairvoyance to read these records. Alice A. Bailey described the Akashic Record as a vast photographic film containing the life experiences of every human, the reactions of the entire animal kingdom, and thought forms created by human desires. Rudolf Steiner, an Austrian theosophist and founder of Anthroposophy, wrote about the Akashic Records in relation to Atlantis and Lemuria, exploring their history and civilizations. Edgar Case, a well-known figure, claimed he could access the Akashic Records. Additionally, musician Prince used references to Akashic Records in his album The Rainbow Children to tell stories, particularly about the history of slavery in the United States. Scientists are working on an incredible way to store data, using single atoms. Atoms, the tiniest building blocks of everything, could potentially store data at a scale a thousand times smaller than today's hard drives. While previous attempts required extremely cold conditions, a new method developed by scientists in the Netherlands suggests this could work at room temperature. They achieved this by using single cobalt atoms on a layer of semiconducting black phosphorus. Instead of relying on electron spin, they utilize the orbital angular momentum of the cobalt atom, creating a more stable and potentially room temperature friendly memory. While it's not ready for your computer yet, this breakthrough could revolutionize data storage when it becomes practical. In Theosophy and Anthroposophy, there's a concept known as the Akashic Records. These records are said to contain every event, thought, word, emotion, and intent across all time, involving all entities and life forms, not just humans. They're believed to exist on a non-physical plane called the mental plane. Some liken this to how holograms work, as if information is vibrationally encoded into space itself. However, it's important to note that there's no scientific evidence to support the existence of these records, and scientific research in this area has made little progress. The term Akasha comes from Sanskrit and means ether, sky, or atmosphere. It was introduced into Theosophy by Helena Blavatsky, who described it as a kind of life force. She referred to the indestructible tablets of the astral light, which recorded past and future human thoughts and actions, although she didn't specifically use the term Akashic. 
The idea of the Akashic Record was further popularized by others like Alfred Percy Sinnott and C.W. Leadbeater, who associated the term with the ability of clairvoyance to read these records. Alice A. Bailey described the Akashic Record as a vast photographic film containing the life experiences of every human, the reactions of the entire animal kingdom, and thought forms created by human desires. Rudolf Steiner, an Austrian theosophist and founder of Anthroposophy, wrote about the Akashic Records in relation to Atlantis and Lemuria, exploring their history and civilizations. Edgar Case, a well-known figure, claimed he could access the Akashic Records. Additionally, Musician Prince used references to Akashic Records in his album The Rainbow Children to tell stories, particularly about the history of slavery in the United States. Akashic field theory, as proposed by Irvin Laszlo, suggests the existence of an information field in the cosmos known as the Akashic field, or A-field. This field, named after the Sanskrit term for space, Akasha, is believed to be the fundamental source of energy and information that not only shapes the current universe, but also all past and present universes, collectively forming the Akashic records. Laszlo's theory posits that this informational field can provide insights into why our universe seems finely tuned for the development of galaxies and conscious life forms. It also offers an explanation for why evolution appears to be an informed rather than random process. The theory addresses certain challenges in quantum physics, including non-locality and quantum entanglement. Additionally, Laszlo collaborated with Anthony Peake, who explored altered states of consciousness and phenomena like déjà vu, dreams, psychedelic experiences, meditation, and near-death experiences. Peake's hypothesis suggests that individuals live variations of the same life repeatedly, making different choices and experiencing different outcomes. Premonitions in this context are seen as memories of the past. This collaboration resulted in the book The Immortal Mind, Science and the Continuity of Consciousness Beyond the Brain. An inforg is an organism or entity composed of information that exists in the infosphere. These information-based organisms, often referred to as natural agents, are a concept introduced by Luciano Floridi to describe elements within the infosphere. Inforgs differ from standalone, unique entities, as they are inherently composed of information. They coexist alongside artificial agents in the infosphere. Inforgs can even be part of hybrid agents, such as a family that includes digital devices like cameras, cell phones, tablets, and laptops. Norbert Wiener contributed to the idea of inforgs by defining organisms as entities characterized by patterns of persisting Shannon information. Shannon information, named after Claude Shannon, is a form of information that exists in the physical realm and can be manipulated by the laws of nature and science. This implies that inforgs are composed of matter, energy, and Shannon information. One intriguing experiment supporting the concept of inforgs involves using DNA as a medium for data storage. DNA, considered the building blocks of organisms, can hold binary information. This reinforces the idea that living organisms consist of persisting patterns of Shannon information within an ever-changing flux of matter and energy. Furthermore, the Shannon information within an inforg contains the identity of the organism. For instance, a person's identity is not linked to their physical matter or energy, but is encoded as patterns of Shannon information within their body. While a person's body may undergo changes over time, their identity remains constant. The manipulation of Shannon information within an inforg falls under the metaphysical realm. An infovore is someone who constantly craves and accesses information, especially through digital devices. The rapid advancement of technology offers solutions to practical problems, but also brings about concerns and consequences. As we embrace ubiquitous computing in digital culture, it gives rise to new risks and vulnerabilities. This shift impacts education, communication, and even our human psyche. 
Predictions suggest that technology will significantly reshape our homes, workplaces, and communities in the future. Understanding the various implications of digital innovation is crucial for the future and underscores the importance of meta-literacy in both formal and informal settings. Imagine a universe where civilizations evolve and develop, much like biological organisms. In this universe, most processes are unpredictable, but a select few follow predictable patterns that lead to far future specific emergent order. Think of it like the similarities between genetically identical twins. Now, consider the transcension hypothesis. It suggests that advanced civilizations, regardless of their origin, follow a universal process of evolutionary development. This process leads them into what can be described as inner space. Here, they enter a domain of increasingly dense, productive, miniaturized, and efficient scales of space, time, energy, and matter. But where does this journey ultimately lead? The transcension hypothesis proposes a destination akin to a black hole. Yes, you read that right. A black hole-like environment. It may sound far-fetched, but there are intriguing reasons for this idea. Black holes, those enigmatic cosmic objects known for their immense gravitational pull, may hold the key. Some theorists believe that black holes are the ultimate computing environments. At their heart, the traditional constraints of computing disappear. This means they can process information without the usual time cost of moving it between processors and memory registers. Now, imagine an advanced civilization harnessing the power of black holes. They could use these cosmic giants for computing, learning, forward time travel, and even energy harvesting on an unprecedented scale. But transcension isn't just about powerful computing. It's also about the merger of civilizations, natural selection, and even universe replication. Advanced societies may reshape their solar systems, transitioning from post-biological life to integrated global brains, and perhaps even to Jupiter brains. So where does this leave us in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, CD? The transcension hypothesis suggests that as civilizations advance, they move away from traditional electromagnetic communication. Weak signals like radar, radio, and TV cease to emanate from these civilizations as they enter their own technological singularities. In this developmental process, civilizations may resist transcension and remain in outer normal space. However, the hypothesis suggests that such civilizations are the exception rather than the rule, most eventually succumb to the allure of transcending into inner space. What does all this mean for our efforts to communicate with potential extraterrestrial intelligences? If transcension is an inevitable and testable process, then one-way messaging or probes may be the only viable communication option, as two-way communication is severely limited by the vast distances between rapidly transcending civilizations. But here's the ethical twist. One-way messaging or probes may homogenize the evolutionary diversity in receiving civilizations, potentially conflicting with an evolutionary attractor that maximizes local diversity. This moral dilemma has been called the zoo hypothesis in the Fermi paradox literature. In the end, the transcension hypothesis challenges our assumptions about the nature of advanced civilizations and their communication methods. It raises thought-provoking questions about our place in the cosmos and the future of our search for extraterrestrial life. Could a planet possess intelligence? It's a thought-provoking idea proposed by astrobiologists. They suggest that planets like Earth could be considered intelligent entities due to the collective activity of life on them. In this concept, planetary intelligence is defined as cognitive activity and knowledge operating on a large planetary scale. It's a departure from thinking about intelligence only in the context of sentient beings like humans. Instead, it considers the cumulative effects of life, including microbes and plants, on a planet. For instance, underground fungal networks in forests act as a life system that responds to changing climate conditions, significantly impacting the planet. The researchers argue that planetary intelligence is about the capacity of life on a planet to sustain itself indefinitely. In essence, it challenges us to think of the planet as having a green mind, 
and this perspective has implications for how we address climate change and other global crises. It prompts us to consider the collective intelligence of life forms and their ability to work together for the planet's survival. However, the researchers also note that Earth, despite being teeming with life, may not exhibit true planetary intelligence. It suggests that our planet is in an immature technosphere stage, where technological activity has developed but hasn't harmoniously integrated with the environment. Achieving planetary intelligence would involve aligning biological and technological processes for the benefit of the planet's future. This concept challenges our understanding of intelligence and encourages us to view physical nature as potentially intelligent beings. It opens up new possibilities for addressing global challenges and uniting our efforts to ensure the planet's well-being. In 1994, Jacobo Greenberg, a renowned figure in the study of consciousness, mysteriously vanished, leaving behind a puzzle that remains unsolved to this day. Greenberg, often referred to as the Einstein of consciousness, pushed the boundaries of conventional science to explore the limitless potential of the human brain. As a professor at Mexico's National Autonomous University and the director of a cutting-edge laboratory, he delved into research on telepathy and other uncharted territories of psychophysiology. Despite the dedicated investigations of Chief Superintendent Clemente Padilla, the circumstances surrounding Greenberg's disappearance remain shrouded in mystery. His story takes us on a fascinating journey across diverse locations, from Mexico to the United States, India, Nepal, Barcelona, and Madrid. Jacobo Grinberg, born in Mexico City in 1946, was a multifaceted figure. He ventured into the realms of pseudoscience, neurophysiology, and psychology. His studies encompassed Mexican shamanism, Eastern practices, meditation, astrology, and telepathy, all explored through his unique scientific approach. Grinberg authored over 50 books on these intriguing subjects. His path in life was deeply influenced by a personal tragedy, the loss of his mother to a brain tumor when he was just 12 years old. This event ignited his lifelong fascination with the human mind. Grinberg pursued a psychology degree at UNAM and later traveled to New York City to delve into psychophysiology at the Brain Research Institute, where he obtained his PhD. His doctoral work focused on understanding how geometric stimuli affect the human brain's electrophysiology. Back in Mexico, Greenberg founded psychophysiology laboratories at Universidad Anahuac and UNAM. In 1987, he established the Instituto Nacional para el Estudio de la Conciencia, INPEC, with funding from UNAM and CONACYT. Many of his books were published through INPEC covering topics ranging from brain activity to witchcraft, shamanism, telepathy, and meditation. Grinberg's unconventional approach to combining science and shamanism drew both intrigue and skepticism. He aimed to bridge the gap between scientific inquiry and the mystical world, challenging the traditional boundaries of consciousness studies. His efforts were met with resistance from fellow scientists who dismissed his work as a departure from established scientific norms. Then on December 8, 1994, Jacobo Greenberg vanished without a trace. His family had prepared a birthday celebration for his 48th birthday on December 12th, but he failed to appear. Initially, his sporadic travels and unavailability didn't raise alarms, but as days turned into weeks, concern grew. Greenberg's disappearance sparked a host of conspiracy theories, further complicating the mystery. One of Greenberg's notable theories was the Synergy Theory. According to this theory, there exists a continuous energy space beyond human perception, and what we consider reality is just a fraction of it. This concept challenges our understanding of how experiences are created, and it gained international recognition when mentioned in his book El Cerebro Consciente, translated into seven languages. Jacobo Greenberg's enigmatic disappearance and his unconventional approach to consciousness studies continue to captivate minds and intrigue those who seek to unravel the mysteries of the human mind and the boundaries of reality. DNA is not a fixed material, but a liquid crystalline substance that receives and transmits holographic information. 
It functions as an antenna and receiver for information from the environment and ether. It operates through radionics, forming electromagnetic fields based on vibratory frequencies, resulting in 3D holographic images. DNA uses interference patterns from two waves, creating a phantom effect that adapts and reforms properties through natural selection. The 98% previously considered junk DNA now serves as a memory bank, encoding and decoding information to construct a virtual reality based on vibratory patterns, similar to the concept of the Akashic field. DNA operates similarly to the mind, translating words into visual imagery, shaping archetypal ideas into physical forms. Our inner constitution affects how we perceive the outer world, as both inner and outer realities resonate and create interference patterns. DNA is dynamic, constantly changing based on the information it absorbs. Scalar energy influences it, forming electromagnetic fields that organize matter. Our thoughts, internal dialogue, and external influences program DNA by writing and reading genetic information. Our thoughts and exposure to various media programs us with information, tuning us to specific vibrations. Controlling our thoughts and choosing beneficial ideas are crucial for personal development. Words form holographic images, impressing memories on the ether, which in turn influences the body's cellular structure. The causal field of the Akashic field shapes our personal reality and emotions, simultaneously affecting the etheric hologram of the body. Thoughts become emotional blueprints, animating our physical and inner worlds. In essence, we become what we think and imagine. Kenpo Acho was a spiritual teacher from Tibet, known for his deep knowledge of Buddhism. He had many students in different regions. One notable event in his life was when Dujam Rinpoche, another prominent Buddhist teacher, recognized him as a special reincarnation and taught him advanced spiritual practices. Kenpo Achu then returned to his monastery and spent a long time in meditation, during which he wrote a detailed explanation of a particular Buddhist practice. Kenpo Acho achieved the rare phenomenon known as the Rainbow Body in September 1998, on a hillside near Lumarap. His remarkable transformation into rainbow light garnered attention, even receiving coverage in the regional press. It was further documented in several articles and books. On August 29, 1998, Kenpo Acho, aged 80, attained physical dissolution in Tibet. In a state of deep meditation, while reciting a mantra, he transcended into a clear light, a profound state of enlightenment. His body dissolved into light to resemble that of an eight-year-old child with a flawless complexion. Rainbows appeared, and a pleasant aroma filled the surroundings. His dissolution was complete, leaving no physical remnants behind, resembling a bird taking flight, disappearing without a trace. There is an alleged leaked document from within a high Masonic circle that introduces and explains a scientific theory of manifesting objects into reality using quantum mechanics and spiritual methods. This document delves into the intriguing concept of manifest production observership. This is the summary of the document's details. The first step in this process is to really know the thing you want to create in your mind. If it's something like an orange or a piece of yarn, you need to have a clear picture of how it looks, feels, and even smells. But be careful. If you don't know much about what you want to create, like a fancy camera or a specific amount of money, it's better not to try this. The secret sauce in all of this is understanding how light works and how it makes images. When you're doing this creating thing, you're basically telling tiny particles of light to come together and form the thing you want. To make this happen, you need to use your thoughts and feelings to guide these light particles and tell them what to do. It's like giving them a recipe to follow. Knowing all the tiny details about the thing you want to create, like its special numbers or features, helps a lot. Now here's the cool part. Your body plays a big role in all of this. It has a special kind of energy that extends around it, kind of like an invisible glow. This energy can help make your creation process work better. This might sound a bit like science fiction, but some people believe they can actually do this. There are stories of monks who say they can make food appear out of thin air using this method, 
But it's not just about making stuff. This whole process is also connected to how your brain works. You see, your brain has different modes for different things like thinking, relaxing, or being really focused. When you're trying to create something, you need to be in a special mode where everything in your mind and body is working together, almost like a symphony. It's when you're super focused, but also super relaxed at the same time. This might all sound a bit strange, but some people believe it's possible. They think that by understanding how our minds, the tiny particles of the world, and the energy around us all fit together, we can do some pretty amazing things. So, whether you think this is real or just a wild idea, it's definitely something that makes you wonder about the world and how we fit into it. The omnipotence paradox revolves around the concept of omnipotence, which is the quality of being all-powerful. This paradox questions the limits of omnipotence and how it relates to the ability to perform logically contradictory actions. The paradox often takes the form of questions like, can an omnipotent being create a stone so heavy that even they cannot lift it? This question presents a dilemma. If the being can create such a stone, then they cannot lift it, implying a limit to their power. On the other hand, if they cannot create such a stone, they are also not omnipotent because there is something they cannot do. Some responses to this paradox involve redefining omnipotence. For example, some argue that omnipotence doesn't mean the ability to do anything, including the logically impossible, but rather the ability to do anything that is logically possible and in line with the nature of the omnipotent being. Another response is that the paradox is based on a misunderstanding of the question itself. It suggests that the question itself is meaningless or incoherent because it assumes that an omnipotent being can both create and not create a stone that they cannot lift simultaneously. Ultimately, the omnipotence paradox raises complex questions about the nature of omnipotence, logic, and the limits of what is possible even for an all-powerful being. It has been a topic of philosophical discussion for centuries and continues to provoke thought and debate among theologians and philosophers. It's been said that there are 12 rules to the game of life. By following these laws, you live in harmony with the natural flow of the universe, bringing forth positive change, good things, and high vibrations into your day-to-day -day life. Here's a quick breakdown of the 12 laws. Law of Divine Oneness. Everything is connected, and your actions matter not just to yourself, but to the collective. This interconnectedness can lead to greater life satisfaction. Law of Vibration. Everything has a frequency and vibration. Similar vibrations attract each other, and raising your frequency can attract positive experiences. Law of Correspondence. Your daily life is shaped by subconscious patterns you repeat. Identifying and changing these patterns can lead to a more fulfilling life. Law of Attraction. Your focus creates your reality, so embrace self-love and gratitude to attract what you desire. Law of Inspired Action Taking physical steps toward your goals is crucial. Vision boards are good, but action is essential, even if it pushes you out of your comfort zone. Law of Perpetual Transmutation of Energy Small actions can have a profound effect over time. Uplifting daily activities can lead to significant results. Law of Cause and Effect Every action causes a reaction. Focus on positive energy and actions to attract positive outcomes. Law of Compensation You'll be compensated for your contributions to the world, not just financially, but in love, joy, and kindness. Law of Relativity Perspective determines how you see situations. Choose to view challenges positively and transform your reality. Law of Polarity Everything has a polar opposite. Embrace both sides to learn, grow, and gain clarity. Law of Rhythm Life has cycles with ebbs and flows. Embrace patience and grace during different seasons of your life. Law of Gender Balancing confident and strong, masculine, and flowing and creative, feminine energies is essential in various life situations. Some people's inner experiences are quite different from what is typically imagined. 
For instance, some individuals don't have an internal monologue, which is the constant self-talk that many people have in their heads. When faced with tasks or requests, they may not engage in an inner dialogue of complaints or frustration. These individuals describe their experiences as not having a conscious stream of thoughts or words describing their feelings. They just feel their emotions without the need for inner dialogue. It's like their inner voice, which is the middleman in their head, is absent. Others who lack an inner monologue mention that when they need to communicate verbally, they have to translate their thoughts into words, which can be time-consuming and effortful. They prefer written communication as it allows them more time to organize their thoughts. Conversely, those with an internal monologue experience thoughts as words in their heads. They can't imagine thinking without this verbal aspect. Emotions often come with a stream of thoughts, which may involve self-talk and sometimes swearing. Scientific studies indicate that people's experiences with internal monologues vary. Some individuals talk to themselves inwardly often, while others rarely do. There is a wide range of differences in how people think and experience their inner voices. In some cases, the inner voice takes on unique forms. For example, some people see images or visualizations as their inner voice, while others may experience it as colors, sensations, or even tastes. People's inner experiences are highly individual and not fully understood by science. Some have even theorized that people with these unique ways of thinking are akin to real-life NPCs in video games who seem to lack the rich inner lives and complex thoughts of player-controlled characters.